Cameron had always been a little small for his age. He was no dwarf, but any of his father's dreams of raising a star quarterback were futile. As a child, this had only been an inconvenience, but now, in his third year of high school, he was still scrawny, and it was screwing up his love life. Or at least his attempts at one. Neither. Maybe there were girls who would have gone out with him, but he couldn't stay in his own league. He'd asked out Holly Light, the head cheerleader. Her eyes got big with surprise, and politely explained that she was already going out with Randall Scott. He, naturally, was the star quarterback, and he'd tried to see a movie with Jessica Redstone, the lacrosse babe, and she said yes, but he could tell she was just being nice. She gave him a total friend zone peck on the cheek after the movie, and that had been that. Recently, Cameron had been after Beth Silver, trying to arrange a time when they could see a play together, but for one reason or another, Beth would always be busy or have something else planned. Cameron wished for once someone would just tell him no to his face. He thought he had seen some of Beth's friends giggling when they saw him approaching her the last time. Maybe he should have dated someone more in his range, but that would have meant going for one of the band geeks or one of the goths. They were all right to hang out with. In fact, he used to be friends with them in middle school. But he wanted to date girls he wanted to bang and Cameron wanted to bang babes. Images from today's encounter with Beth were in his mind as he walked home from school. The cool April air nipped at him with little bites. Her friends turning away a little as he got near, like they didn't want to look at him. Her look of steely resolve, as if she had planned the conversation already and just wanted to get through the script. If only I was more muscular, he thought. That was never going to happen. Guys like Cameron didn't go to the gym. His dad had signed him up for a local gym at the beginning of the school year, but he just couldn't stand spending an hour every other day in a stinky place lifting things up and down. What a waste of time. Cameron was so lost in his own misery he didn't even see where he was going. Oof, said a fat man as Cameron ran flat into him. Watch it shrimp. You watch it wide load, he spat back. Cameron bent down to pick up his math book. As he recomposed himself, he looked around as if seeing the street for the first time. He had walked home this way a hundred times, but he had never noticed that there was a doorway between two storefronts that led to a store on the second floor. He always wondered what retailer would buy space on anything but the first floor of a building. After all, how many stores does anyone go to that are on the second floor? Magic within reach, read the stenciled letters on the window. Below the words was an 812x11 sheet of bright green paper with words hastily written in Sharpie reading. Want to get ready for summer but don't have time for the gym? Come see us. Weight loss or exercise products half off. At first, Cameron didn't think that the paper sign went with the magic store. After all, a store named Magic Within Reach was probably a hangout for LARPers and 12-year-olds wanting boxes of tricks, and weight loss products were usually found in GNC nutrition centres. But there was no other tenant listed on the door. A sudden gust of wind sliced at him, and without thinking Cameron stepped in the door. It was warm, an old steam radiator clanging cheerfully at the bottom of the staircase. He looked up the stairs, then looked outside. It had started to rain, well, he did want to get in shape for the summer, but what could a store with a name like that offer? Taking one last look at the steady rain outside, Cameron turned back around and climbed up the stairs. The door in the hallway at the top of the stairs was wooden, dark and heavy looking. It didn't seem to match the vinyl tiles and greenish fluorescent light of the hallway at all. An ornate etched sign on the door repeated the name of the store from below. Magic within reach. Cameron leaned toward the handle and pushed. It weighed a ton. He opened the door enough to allow him and his backpack in, then let it slam shut. The interior of the store matched the door much better than the hallway had. It was lined all in dark, splintery wood, except for the floor, which was worn smooth with age. The place was full of clutter, with shelves and cases everywhere holding knick-knacks of all sorts. Some shelves were stuffed with heavy leather-bound books, Others were packed with variously sized unlabeled bottles filled with strange liquids. Here and there were small brass instruments, little iron sculptures with no discernible purpose, and even a case of jewellery. Despite the clutter, there was very little dust anywhere. 
Although some of the bottles were cloudy with age, the air was clear, if a bit stuffy. Ah, hello, young man, came a voice from somewhere out of sight beyond a bookshelf to the left. An old man in an apron and carrying a feather duster appeared. He had a large nose and little tufts of white hair. He wore a number of pendants and rings which jangled sweetly. A small pair of pince-nez glasses perched comfortably on the nose without fear of falling off. He gave Cameron a brief but cagey once over. Here for the half-off special, I presume? He asked encouragingly. Seeing Cameron's hurt look, he put up his hands in defence. No offence meant, of course, I just assumed between the nasty spill I saw you take outside and your, ah, difficulty with the door, perhaps you saw my new sign. Oh, screw you, Grandpa. I might be in here for, I don't know, a game of D&D &D or something for all you know. D and... Well, I apologise, I meant nothing by it. My mother always said I should learn to keep my mouth shut. As you can see, I still have a ways to go on that one. You know what? I knew this was a waste of time. And he turned to leave. But Cameron, I think I can help you. Cameron stopped and turned cautiously. I didn't tell you my name. No. But this is a shop that specialises in magic and among other things we sell this small pendant of identification for only $59.95. It's a very good deal. The old man was holding up a small hunk of amber on a chain. You're joking. No joke. Here, try it on. Free sample. The old man took the chain off his neck and held it out to Cameron. He took it gingerly. This is a lower-end model. It simply gives you names. But for just another hundred dollars, we have one that will also get you anyone's address and phone number. Great for a night on the town. Know what I mean? The old man smiled brightly. Cameron, in a trance-like state, put his math book down on a nearby shelf and put the pendant on his neck. The man's name was Benedict Fudgepacker. Fudgepacker? The old man grinned from ear to ear. Ah, no, of course not. But what would a spell be without a counterspell? I'm wearing our ruby ring of disidentification. Only seventy-four ninety-five. Perfect when you wish to remain unknown amongst those you dislike. But please call me Ben. He kept smiling. Cameron clumsily removed the pendant and handed it back to Ben, still in shock. It had worked. He wouldn't have believed it. But the name had simply popped into his head and he hadn't even said the first name which, Ben, he now knew, had offered to him. It couldn't be a trick. Cameron's backpack started feeling heavy and he was feeling queasy. Now, young man, I think I can help you, but I need to know exactly what you want. Well, er, uh, Cameron stammered. I can assure you we here at Magic Within Reach keep our customers in strictest confidence. We couldn't do such good repeat business if we didn't. My highest desire is to make your desires reality. There was a twinkle in Ben's eye now. Cameron had a feeling Ben knew exactly what Cameron wanted, that he could peer into his head with one of his many magical pendants and rings. This didn't make him afraid, however. If Ben knew what he was thinking, he had nothing to hide now. Better to just tell him. I'd like to be larger, more muscular. He said it quickly, giving voice to thoughts he had never uttered aloud more attractive to women. Old Ben smiled. And who wouldn't? Which is why I'm here. I think I have just the thing. He shuffled off, the sound of jingling getting softer. Cameron stared at the floor. He put down his heavy backpack. How could this work? It was getting dark. He needed to get home and get working on his history paper. A shuffling and jingling sound brought him back to reality. Yeah, the heather. I think you'll find that this will have the effect you're looking for, said Ben, and he held up an orange prescription bottle full of blue pills. You! What is that? Your Viagra stash? Cameron's face screwed up in disgust. He knew this was a bad idea. Young Mr Cameron, you really have an attitude problem, you know. One day you'll discover that your first instinct is not necessarily correct. Now I could have given you this spell in the form of a potion, but I don't think a musty bottle of liquid would blend in well with the belongings of a young man such as yourself, hmm? Old Ben narrowed his eyes shrewdly. He had a point. Take one of these per day and take it for the number of days equal to how much heavier you wish to be. 
You won't just gain weight, you'll add muscle and height in proportion. Furthermore, you will find the ladies more interested in you than normal, even aside from the simple change in physique. The people around you will not be surprised by the sudden change, however, but will believe you've been working out for a while. Cameron looked at the bottle. What if I take them all at once? Ben frowned slightly. It's not advisable. You'll grow twice as fast, but the part of the spell keeping others believing the growth is normal won't keep up. You'll be answering a lot of ugly questions and getting kicked out of sports programmes, I imagine. Now Cameron frowned too. It sounded like taking them once a day wouldn't be so bad. If he took the pills for two months, that would be enough to get as large as he wanted to be. How much? he asked. Old Ben looked at him closely. Six hundred dollars. So with half off that's three hundred dollar? The old man grimaced. That is the sale price. Six hundred dollars? Cameron nearly yelled. I'm in high school, I don't have that kind of money. How is that within reach? Yes, well I'm sorry Mr Cameron, but this is very special stuff. It's safe. It's effective. Your people's prescription drugs have been known to cost ten times that. Cameron was getting desperate. Here was his ticket out of his crappy social life being dangled in front of him, and the old bat was snatching it away. I just can't get that kind of money. Can't I get half the pills for $250? That's all I have saved up? Old Ben remained firm. I'm sorry, young man, but the number of pills does not drive the cost. If you like, I have a slightly different formula. He reached in one of his pockets. Cameron rolled his eyes. He should have seen this bait and switch coming. Ben held out another prescription bottle. These are fast acting, but short lived. You take one pill for every ten pounds you wish to gain, and you'll achieve that in five minutes. The attraction effect is also magnified. It will only last for four hours, however. Cameron considered this. That might be okay before every date. But Ben shook his head. These are going to be too expensive and too dangerous for long-term use. But if you can show someone a good time once, you may find they will be willing to put up with your regular size on other occasions. Ben smiled as he saw Cameron grimace. Oh, cheer up. You young people always think you're uglier than you are. Now, these are typically $300 for the bottle, but I'm willing to give them to you for the $250 you say you have. I'm so confident you'll like them. I'll even give you four of them for free right now as a sort of trial run. Ben opened the top of the bottle and shook out four small orange pills into his hand. This might be worth it, he thought. If the pills really did what the old man said, he could take one before he asked Beth out, and then three on the actual date. That might be enough to get her to hook up with him more often. Deal, he said. But I can't buy the full bottle until next week. Old Ben smiled widely, showing yellowing teeth. Excellent. I do have to warn you these pills are more unstable than the others. Do be careful. He took the four pills and dropped them into a third bottle and handed it to Cameron. Sure, said Cameron, and he took the bottle and shoved it in his pocket. His mind racing, he almost forgot to grab his math book and bag on his way out. It was dark out now, but the rain had stopped. He pulled hard on the door and left. Ben smiled as Cameron left, furrowing his brow as the door slammed shut. He was glad he was able to come up with that story about the disidentification ring. He'd have to look at the identification pendant and figure out why it was broadcasting silly last names. Magic could be so troublesome at times. Cameron lay in bed, staring at the ceiling. If he hadn't had the bottle of four pills on his desk, right there, he would have written off his experience that afternoon as a fever dream. But every time the logical part of his mind tried to argue that magic was impossible, he remembered the experience with the pendant. There was no other explanation for how he had suddenly known the old fart's name, like he had known him for years. He had fastened the chain, and pop, he knew. If the pills were as real as the pendant, Cameron knew he should use them wisely. Any number of things could go wrong, so if he took them all at once there'd be a chance he couldn't make use of them. It was going to cost a lot of money to get the next batch, so each pill had to be used carefully. A plan began to take shape in his mind. He would take one pill toward the end of the school day, and then ask Jessica out again. 
she had recently given him a pity date, and if the pills truly made him more attractive, then she would probably give him another chance. Then, right before their date, he would take the rest, inflicting himself with the maximum effect he could afford right now. He would dig into his savings for a motel if it came to that. There'd still be enough for the full bottle next week. It was a long time before he fell asleep, and all too soon before his alarm woke him up again. Morning classes were torture. Cameron kept the bottle of pills in his pocket and couldn't stop touching it, rolling it in his hand. If they worked, it meant the end of 17 long years of waiting and anticipation. He was going to take the first pill during lunchtime, but the clock was moving so slowly, the minute hand lurching forward reluctantly. He had half a mind to just take a bathroom break and take the pill, but he knew he shouldn't. He wanted to make sure the change worked and that nobody noticed it. Because the worst thing would be if he came back to class and everyone started asking questions. More than anything, he wanted to avoid a one-way trip to a medical lab or suspicions of steroid use. No, he'd wait until lunchtime, scarf something down quickly, and then go to the bathroom on the basement floor. People rarely used that bathroom. It was out of the way and was a single toilet with a locking door, providing plenty of privacy. Then, depending on whether things went well or not, he could take the back stairs outside and go home until the effect wore off, or he could go back upstairs and catch Jessica before she got to her next class. Finally, the bell rang, and it was time. Cameron gathered up his things, hands shaking, and started toward the cafeteria. He didn't make it far. Hey, Cam! said a voice behind him. He turned around to find Chelsea, one of his friends from middle school. She was nice and all, but since she had gotten to high school, she'd turned goth and started hanging out with the stage crew guys. She had also started calling herself Raven, explaining that Chelsea was a boring name. Today she had Egyptian-style eyeliner on her powdered skin. I was wondering if, uh... She hesitated. Hi, Chels. Sorry I can't chat. I'm, uh, going to lunch. Cameron didn't have time for this. He started to turn back, but saw that Chelsea looked like she was about to cry. What? No time to spend with your old friends from middle school anymore. Got better things to do and prettier girls to hit on, she said, suddenly defensive. Cameron was livid. He needed to eat his lunch so he'd have time to take the pill and this chick was costing him time. Had she just stopped him in the hall to yell at him? What's your deal, Chelsea? I'm just busy now, maybe we can catch up later, I'm sorry. That's what you said last time, there's never later. What are you, my girlfriend? Cameron was trying to keep from making a scene, but Chelsea was starting to piss him off. I don't have time for this shit right now. Go hang out with your stage crew nerds and have a good time. I gotta go. He turned and started walking away. Well, fuck you very much, asshole, she yelled, causing some heads to turn. Tears were in her eyes now, and the eyeliner was starting to run. She dabbed at it with her hand. Now I have to reapply this goddamn makeup. She stormed off, and Cameron continued on down the hall. What was her problem? It's not that he was avoiding her. They were just older now, and she wasn't really his type. Too flat. He started down the stairwell, but instead of getting off at the first floor for the cafeteria, his feet kept going down to the basement level. It was better not to risk any more interruptions. Fuck it, let's do this thing, he thought to himself. I'm not hungry anyway. His mouth was dry and he was breathing fast. He reached the bathroom and went in, locking the door. It was dark the only light coming from a single overhead fixture that buzzed and flickered. The floor was damp, but thankfully there was no bad smell. He put his backpack in the corner and then took the bottle out of his pocket and put it by the sink. I should probably strip, right? He thought. See what's happening. But despite the locked door he couldn't bring himself to, he was only going to gain ten pounds, so he wouldn't be bursting out of his jeans or anything. Besides, it was still a school bathroom he was in. It wasn't the most hygienic environment. He opened the bottle and shook one pill into his hand. He checked his watch. The old bat said five minutes. Banzai. 
he mumbled to himself. He put it in his mouth and swallowed. At first, nothing. But of course there's nothing right away. Then, a tight feeling in his gut, spreading slowly up and down. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit! He was having trouble keeping his balance. He was getting lightheaded and the room was starting to spin. He was getting thirsty. The tightness was spreading to his arms and legs. He looked at his hands, his arms, but couldn't see any difference. He glanced at his watch. Only two minutes had gone by. The tightening got worse, coming close to real pain. His limbs were hot, like they were sunburned. His mouth was bone dry. He was losing control of his muscles as they spasmed and seized. He staggered around the room, crashing into the wall. He hoped no one was around to hear. He struggled to keep his mouth closed to not cry out in pain. He needed water badly, but he couldn't control his legs well enough to get himself over to the sink. Only one more minute, only one more minute, Cameron reassured himself. The burning was getting worse. It was like touching a hot burner, but he couldn't pull away. He squatted against the tiled wall, not trusting his legs to hold him up, twitching as... something happened to him. Was this right? Was this how it was supposed to happen? If it wasn't over very soon, he was going to pass out. The pain increased more, and Cameron thought he was going to lose it. And then it drifted away, the burning subsiding, his limbs loosening, his muscles calming. Cameron was gasping for air. He ran over to the sink and dunked his head under the faucet, drinking the tepid water. If that was one pill, he said, sputtering. After catching his breath, he looked at his watch again. Five more minutes had passed since the pills finished. As he looked at his watch, though, he noticed the arm it was on. It looked good. Cameron moved his arm away to get a better look. It wasn't bulging through the long sleeve shirt he had on, but there was definitely a muscle there. Definition. His breathing slowed. Cameron flexed his arm. Then he flexed his other arm. He had actual biceps, not just thin spaghetti arms. He lifted up his shirt. He gasped. Abs. Not a chiselled six-pack or anything, after all he had only taken one pill. But there once again was unmistakable definition of muscles. He took the whole shirt off and looked at himself in the dingy mirror. He posed in front of the mirror, seeing what showed off his new form the best. Looking down, he noticed his pants were noticeably short. He must be taller by at least an inch or two. From what he could see of his calves, his legs were much more solid too. I've got to see, he thought, and loosened his belt. He dropped his pants and began to admire himself. It didn't take him long to notice the bulge in his underwear, and it wasn't long before he knew the bulge was getting bigger. He listened for a moment, just in case, and then dropped his underpants. His cock was definitely longer and thicker, and was now throbbing its way to full hardness. Well, why the fuck not, he reasoned, and started stroking it, losing himself in the pleasant sensation. He watched himself in the mirror as he did, gazing at the athletic body in the mirror as it jacked itself off, seeing the muscles flex and move as he worked his cock. Pretty soon he came and blasted a thick jet of cum into the sink. He sighed and quickly came back to reality. He needed to get moving if he wanted to see Jessica in the hallway. He threw his clothes back on, cleaned off the sink with a paper towel, put the pill bottle in his backpack and turned to face the door. Old Ben had said that people wouldn't question his new look, but would they really? The pills had worked so far, but just in case, he'd have to stay near an exit in case he had to make a getaway. He took a deep breath and unlocked the door. Cameron spent a while loitering in the stairwell, trying to see if anyone noticed him, but no one stopped or said a word. They all just passed by him. Cautiously, he climbed the stairs and stepped into the crowd. Being in the hallways was a strange experience. Nobody pointed at him and said, What the fuck happened to you? But people were treating him differently somehow. Freshmen moved to give him room. He even caught a couple girls checking him out. At first he had thought that they were treating him different because he had changed, but pretty soon 
he realised they were treating him different because he was smoking hot, and he liked it. Cameron began positively strutting up and down the hall, just soaking in the positive attention. Soon he spied a particular gaggle of girls with cleats and knee-high socks, and he knew he had found Jessica. She was facing away from him, her straight blonde hair shining. Hey Jessica, what's up? he asked. She heard his voice and her shoulders slumped. She started turning to face him. Hey, Cam, she began, and then she saw him. Uh, hi. Not much, you? She looked up and down at him, shamelessly checking him out. It was as if she wanted to remark on his appearance, but then her face changed. It looked like she remembered she always knew he looked like that. How could she forget what a stud Cameron was? Ah, uh, nothing. Just worried about the bio test next week. Hey, I've got reservations for two at that new Japanese place, but my other date skipped out. You want to come? Jessica looked shocked that anyone would consider cancelling a date with this hunk. Imagine. Her friends giggled, but it was a different giggle than Cameron was used to. It was a titillated giggle, embarrassed for themselves. Ah, uh, sure, of course. What, uh, time? He had never seen her so disarmed. Seven o'clock. I'll pick you up again. Yeah. See you then. Bye, girls. And he turned to leave. Jessica seemed to find her voice. Owen Cam, she said unsteadily. She paused as he looked over his shoulder. About that bio test next week, I was worried about it too. Maybe we can study for it together. At this, her girlfriends nearly had a fit. Cameron smiled and went on to his next class. This was how girls were supposed to act when getting asked out. The rest of the day flew past and Cameron felt on top of the world. Everywhere he went, he felt eyes on him, but instead of feeling threatening or belittling, it felt good. He thought that the physical changes alone couldn't account for everyone's change in attitude. He looked better, but he was still not the biggest or strongest kid in school. A lot of the difference had to be due to the magic in the pill. Magic pills. It was getting a whole lot easier to believe in magic, and Cameron thought of the many books and potions he had seen in the shop. Was there a potion to pass tough exams? A spell for playing the guitar? He was going to have to get a job so he could buy more magical items. He thought he understood now why the old man had had so much jewellery on him. Maybe he was a hundred years old, and those chains were all that kept him alive. Cameron sat in his last class, bio, thinking of all the spells he should ask Ben for. Slowly, he felt a change come over him. He was feeling loose, stretched. Sure enough, it had been four hours since he'd taken the first pill, and it was beginning to wear off. He started getting worried, and glanced around the classroom. Why hadn't he thought to take a bathroom break? What if he started moaning and spasming all over the place? but he didn't. He just felt his muscles loosen and become less dense, as the previously well-sculpted shapes became flabby and formless. Soon he was back to his normal stature. He also thought he detected a slight change in the atmosphere of the room, and it was as if everyone in the room had been thinking about him, aware of him, and now they were not. He was, once again, the invisible shrimp. In the hallways after class, it was back to normal. He had to push and shove to get through the crowds, and no one paid him a second thought. His frustration buzzed. Why did the long-lasting pills have to be so expensive? If only he could just win the lottery, he could buy a lifetime supply. Later at home, his mother Janie noticed him looking dressed up for the evening. Going somewhere tonight? She asked, peering down at him from the staircase. Uh, yeah, he said. Mom's. Getting dinner with someone from school tonight. Someone? Well, that's great, Cam. She beamed. Is she hot? Janie was always trying to be the cool mum. It was painful. Cameron rolled his eyes. It's no big deal, just dinner. Of course, hun. Just be back by eleven. I know how boys can lose track of time. Mum, please, Cameron said, exasperated. Mum, please, she said, heading upstairs. And really, that shirt is too big for you. 
I know your Aunt Susan got it for you, but you don't have to wear it. Girls notice these things. Cameron smiled inwardly. I guess you're right. I'll change it before I go. He had no intention of changing his shirt. His body, however. He left the house at six, taking his old beater of a car. He had to stop somewhere private to take the last three pills. The only place he could think of was that basement bathroom at school. Nighttime community classes were held at the school all the time, so the doors would be open. Sure enough, he got inside with no trouble and back into the dingy, flickering bathroom. He locked the door again. This time he was better prepared. He'd brought a large bottle of water for one. He opened it and placed it by the sink. Then he took a breath and stripped off his clothes. With the school nearly empty, he wasn't worried about being bothered. He also put his watch by the sink. He looked in the mirror, grimacing. His short dowy reflection grimaced back. He opened the bottle of pills, put them in his mouth, and swallowed them with some water. He quickly placed the bottle on the floor in the corner. The change came on much quicker this time. He felt the tightness build in his gut and shoot up and down his limbs. His mouth was immediately dry. His limbs were burning and he was already starting to shake. Cameron lurched over to the sink and struggled with all his might to reach for the water to drink. He gulped, downing half the water. This calmed the burning somewhat, but the shaking remained. Without his clothing, he could see what was happening to his body. His flesh was bubbling, as if a hundred snakes were slithering madly beneath the skin. Everywhere his muscles were growing, moving, stretching him in every direction. Underneath he could feel his bones growing to accommodate his new height and weight. Oh God, oh God, he grunted. The burning was back, and he drained the bottle of water. He would need more water next time. He still had two minutes to go. His legs were going mad now, forcing him to his knees in the dank corner of the bathroom. He looked down and saw his cock between his legs gyrating in all directions like a loose fire hose as his body was racked with spasms. Cameron's attention was diverted again by a sudden pain in his lower back, like an extra muscle growing suddenly, and he bent double. Gah! He moaned. It didn't feel three times worse as last time. It was five times worse, ten times worse. The burning became pain, and he thought he might explode into a million pieces. And then the bubbling stopped. His limbs calmed and finally his breath slowed down. He ran back to the sink again and stuck his head under the faucet, drinking at least another litre of water. The burning finally subsided and he felt calm again. He reached over to his watch and pressed a button on the side. A three and a half hour timer started counting down. Every minute was precious so he had to move quickly. First though, he wanted to see how he looked. He took a step back from the mirror and took himself in. He was a god. From the mirror stared a football player, no, a bodybuilder. Great round pecs topped a perfect set of abs. He was past six pack, he could definitely see eight chiselled abs. His arms looked to be as big as his legs usually were, and the muscles he could see when he relaxed looked bigger than he had ever hoped for when flexing. His thighs were gigantic, but he was most happy with the cock between them. It was long and thickly veined, already pulsing slowly. No time for that this time, he mumbled. The deep voice that came from his throat surprised him. Hello, Jessica, he said, testing it. It boomed in the small bathroom. Want to have a good time? He chuckled. He pulled on his clothes, noting that even though he had picked out his largest relative given items, they were still a tight fit. The shirt was difficult to button, and it almost looked like he had chosen it to show off his pecs. He fit the watch on his wrist, struggling to make use of the biggest notch on the band. He gathered up his things and headed back up the stairs to the exit. Hey, good looking, a voice called from behind him in the hallway. A plump, forty-ish woman was in the hall, apparently on a break from one of the night classes. Ooh, babe, if you're looking for a good time you can just let me know. Mmm! Cameron ignored her and walked faster. How could she see him so well? The hallways were nearly dark at night, just a few lights on here or there. Yet she had come onto him from 30 feet away. 
He wondered just how strong the attractive force was. He made it out to the car and drove off toward Jessica's place. The extra driving had cost him time. He only had three hours left. Jessica's house revealed itself as he turned the corner, an old Victorian house with a large porch and a covered driveway. He noticed there were no cars in the driveway. He pulled up to the curb and stopped. He was getting short of breath again, but it had nothing to do with physical effort. There's no time for wimps tonight, he thought to himself. He wanted to sit there and agonise, but he had under three hours remaining, and if he wanted any chance with Jess, he needed to get out of dinner in under an hour and a half. He forced himself to get out of the car and walked up to the front door. He pushed the doorbell. Jessica Redstone was upstairs in her room, studying. Her parents had gone out to a movie this evening and the big house was quiet. She was an only child, and being an only child in such a big house could be lonely sometimes. Her parents had let her put her bedroom at the top of the house on the third floor, where the rooms were fewer and smaller. It was almost like her own mini-house on top of her parents' house. In one corner of her room where her room was her lacrosse gear, pads, sticks, cleats. Her bed, covered with stuffed animals, was under one of the eaves, the ceiling meeting the right-hand side. Posters of young hunks lined the walls. She was already dressed in her pink nightclothes despite the early hour, which could be why she wasn't getting anything done. They were making her think of sleep, and that was making her tired and unmotivated. All evening, Jess had felt like she was forgetting something, as if she was supposed to be doing something. She couldn't, for the life of her, remember what it was. The doorbell rang and she looked out the window, confused. From her desk she could see the street, and in front of her house was Cameron Barnes's junky old car. Then it hit her. Oh shit! She gasped. Somehow he had convinced her to make a date tonight, and she had totally forgotten. She had promised herself to stop stringing him along, that it was a bad idea for both of them, but there she went again being too nice. He was cute and all, but he was just so embarrassing. How he asked girls out like that without any subtlety. Why had she said yes? She could barely remember the encounter now. It was somehow fuzzy and indistinct. She remembered saying yes, but her friends should have been on her for giving in. They had told her nearly as many times as she told herself how bad it was to encourage Cam too much. But instead they seemed pleased, even now that she thought back. Jealous. She shook her head. That made no sense. The doorbell rang a second time. She sighed. Well, he's here, I might as well go through with it. She looked around the room and located her discarded clothes from that day on the floor. There was no time now to dress properly, and maybe he'd see how scrubby she was and get the hint. Downstairs, Cameron was getting anxious. Precious time was passing, and she was upstairs fussing or something. Why couldn't girls just throw something simple on and be done with it? He rang the doorbell again. The house looked awfully dark. Maybe she'd skipped out. Maybe when the spell wore off and she realised how ugly and stupid he was, she went off with some friends to avoid him. That would be rich. But no. A light came on inside, and he heard footsteps approach the door. It opened. Cameron looked at Jessica as she gasped, freezing on the spot. Oddly, she was dressed in her clothes from school, and one of her cute knee-high socks was inside out. She clearly hadn't been fussing, but her jeans showed off her great legs just fine. Hello, Jessica, he began, but suddenly he was being pulled by the wrist. Cameron barely noticed the pull despite her athlete's strength, but he decided it might be best to let himself be pulled. By the time he realised Jessica was pulling him into the house, they were already through the entry hall. She was walking fast, yanking his arm. He couldn't see her face in the dim light, but there was a frightening determination in her stride. My parents are out all night. You are coming to my room right now, she said, still looking ahead. What? he stammered. You're coming to my bedroom and you're going to fuck me. Still that determination. She knew what she wanted. The pills were gold. They didn't make it to the bedroom. They got as far as the living room, and suddenly Jessica turned around and pulled hard. His newly unfamiliar inertia 
pulled him off balance and he fell onto a white leather couch. In moments she was on him, pawing at his shirt, fumbling with the buttons. Her toned us started grinding against him. The restaurant was quickly forgotten. Jess, are you... He started, but she shut him up with her lips. She mashed them against his, pressing and testing, and almost immediately her tongue began invading his still-surprised mouth. He had never French kissed before, but she didn't seem to mind his technique. He opened his mouth and her tongue stabbed inward, swirling around. Meanwhile, her hands were busy with his buttons. Slowly, he reached one hand toward where he thought her chest was. His first tit. Cameron wondered briefly if it was too soon to start feeling her, but given her behaviour so far, he thought he might not be able to move quickly enough. He found her side, which was moving back and forth rhythmically, as she continued grinding against him. He moved his hand toward the front, and found her soft, round breast covered with her shirt and bra, and enclosed it in his hand. Mmm, she said softly. She was done with his buttons now, and she sat up and arched her back, forcing her breast harder into his hand. He grabbed harder, waiting for her to protest, but she didn't. He moved to her other tit and began to squeeze that one too. She made even more pleasant noises. He looked up to see her eyes closed, her butt still working. His cock was rock hard now, and she was grinding the crotch of her jeans against it. If she kept this up, he was going to come before he even got her clothes off. Ah! She reached down with her hand and started tracing the contours of his new muscles, gliding a fingernail along the outline of his pecs, his abs. He continued exploring her tits, now moving to the hem of her shirt, pushing his hand up underneath it. Soon his hand found her bra and he reached under that too. Her smile got bigger. He wanted to find her nipple, but before he got very far she pushed his hand back down out of her shirt. He frowned momentarily, but in a flash she had stripped off her shirt and now she was reaching around behind her back, working the clasp of her bra. Keeping his eyes on her body, he took the chance to finish removing his own shirt. She reached up and removed the bra, her tits were high and proud on her chest, small nipples capping smallish teenage mounds. The picky, no-good part of Cameron's brain briefly wondered if there was a cheap potion to give a girl huge tits, but the rest of his brain quickly told him to shut up and enjoy. Her athlete's torso was slim and fit, her stomach toned and tight. He sat up quickly, his own powerful abs effortlessly forcing Jessica down onto the couch under him. He reached down and roughly grabbed one of her tits, eliciting yet another pleasant moan from her. He lightly pinched her nipple and she moaned louder. Oh yeah, Cam! Oh yeah! She gasped. Pinch it hard! Oh my god, it feels so good! Cameron pinched harder and elicited a louder moan. He thought girls would need to be treated more delicately, but it seemed there was no need to hold back. He bent over and began licking her nipple. Ah! Ah! she cried. He continued licking, but she pushed him weakly with one arm. Come on and fuck me. I need it so bad. He looked up at her, and her face was tight with frustration. He got up from the couch and removed his belt and undid his pants. He looked over, and Jessica Redstone, lacrosse babe, was writhing on the couch, topless, covered in sweat, with her hands buried in her crotch. Her arms were squeezing her tits together pleasantly, and she was obviously stuffing two or three fingers into her snatch, grunting. Cameron almost started thinking the pills had overdone it a little. She opened her eyes briefly and drank him in. He was covered in a thin sheen of sweat which glistened off of his wonderful new muscles. Cameron thought he must be over six feet tall now, his broad shoulders casting a wide shadow on the couch. His dick was straining against his underpants, bulging rudely and beginning to escape from its confines. He stripped off the last of his clothing and let his cock swing free. Jessica, hand still buried in her pussy, moaned appreciatively. She seemed to regain control long enough to undo the button on her jeans and push them down her strong thighs. She pushed her panties off with them, a wet stain clearly visible on them. Cameron moved back to the couch and knelt on the floor, his throbbing dick level with the couch. Jessica scrambled closer, her lightly tufted pussy open and dripping, waiting for him. 
Cameron held his cock steady with one hand and tried to keep Jessica's arse steady with the other. She must have thought he was taking too long because she reached over, grabbed his dick, and tried to force it into her. In her haste she missed and his dick rubbed against her pussy. She moaned. He came. Thick jets of semen squirted all over her cunt and stomach, dripping down her inner thighs. It had happened so suddenly, he barely knew what was going on until it stopped. Jessica looked at him pleadingly. Give it to me, come on, she moaned in desperation. Cameron was about to apologise, but then he realised he was still hard, maybe even harder still. He repositioned himself at the entrance to her cunt and pushed in. His cock was long and thick, but Jessica was so wet he had no trouble forcing her pussy to stretch around him. He felt her inner folds and contours as he pushed in, the thick veins on his cock rubbing against her. She watched as she was slowly filled up and idly played with the cum splashed on her chest. He continued pushing into her with one long stroke, and eventually he reached bottom, the base of his cock completely inside her. Jessica moaned at a higher pitch than before, her face contorted. She was babbling now. Oh my God! Fuck! Oh my God! Fuck, it's big! Cameron slowly withdrew his long cock, then pushed it back in. He pulled out again and started thrusting against her, savouring the sight of her cunt stretched around his dick, her clit protruding from under its hood to rub against him. Pretty soon he was pounding against her, slamming his dick into her. Her legs spread wider as he fucked, her eyes screwing tighter shut. Even with all the effort, his new body had no trouble keeping up its thrusting. He soon realised his position kneeling on the floor wasn't that convenient for fucking, so keeping his dick firmly in her tunnel, he put his arms underneath her body and lifted, planning to push himself onto the couch. When he realised how light she felt, though, he just stood up, his giant leg muscles supporting her weight easily. Now his large arms could lift her up and down on his cock, and he slammed her body against him. Jessica's reaction was dramatic. She moaned louder and louder until she nearly screamed, her voice echoing off of walls of the large room. Her eyes were still squeezed tight and she hugged her arms and legs tightly against him, constricting with surprising force. She was coming, spasms racking her body as he bounced her up and down on his huge dick. Cameron kept a tight grip on her lithe form as she shook, fucking her all the way through her orgasm. As she came down from her high, she motioned blindly with one hand. The couch, oh my God, she panted. She started to become limp, and Cameron realised that she might need to rest for a moment. Keeping his cock buried to the hilt, he walked her back to the couch. She gave a little gasp with each step as the force went from his foot, up his leg, through his cock, and into her clit. He laid her down as gently as he could. He lay on top of her as she continued to pant heavily, admiring her breasts as they heaved with every breath. They were not large, and while Cameron would have been happier if they had been three times that size, he couldn't bring himself to care. This was the first girl he had fucked, and as far as he was concerned, her tits were perfect. His cock seemingly got harder again. Oh! She gasped. She opened her eyes, finally. At the sight of him, her whole body seemed to shudder, and her limpness was gone. She pushed at him gently, and Cameron reluctantly withdrew his cock from her pussy, missing the feeling almost instantly. The head of his cock was purple and bulging, the veins along its length pulsing in anticipation. He needed to come. You lie down now, commanded Jessica. Cameron didn't need to be asked twice. He lay on his back and she crawled toward him, up his body, fingers feeling the ridges and details of his muscles. She knelt above him and grasped his dick with her hand, trying to position it at her entrance. Even kneeling, she actually wasn't high up enough, and she had to lift a leg in order to get her cunt onto the head of his cock inside her. Soon the head of his cock has disappeared in her folds and she relaxed her legs. Once again Cameron felt the wonderful sensation of her stretching pussy and of his veins rubbing deep inside her. Jessica let out another long sigh of delight. Cameron tried to start thrusting, but a hand pushed back. No, said Jessica. 
I'm gonna fuck that big dick of yours. You stay still and watch. And so he did, as Jessica pushed herself up with her tight athlete's legs. Cameron saw as her cunt seemed to grow where his cock was thick and shrink where he was narrower. She was totally wet inside and out, and excess juice was leaking out of her pussy and onto his stomach. It was everything he could do not to thrust back. Jessica kept her eyes fixed on Cameron as she began to pump up and down on him, the wonderful warm sensations returning quickly to his whole body. He looked into her eyes and noticed that they weren't looking into his, but instead roving over his chest. Her pace increased, and Cameron realised she was getting off on his new body. He tried flexing some muscles and was rewarded with groans of appreciation and ever-increasing speed. Soon the pleasure was too intense to concentrate on anything else, and Cameron closed his eyes and revelled in the sensations pounding into his cock, as Jessica slammed into him over and over again. She grunted with the effort, building towards another orgasm for herself. Cameron couldn't help himself any more and began to thrust, but apparently Jessica didn't mind any more. Her grunts became cries of pleasure, and that familiar warm feeling began to spread over his whole body. He thrust only a few times more and then it hit him. Gah! He gave a long, drawn-out groan of pleasure, a growl-like noise that came from deep inside his chest. He was coming, shooting jets of semen deep within her. His hands reached up and grabbed her at the waist as he continued to come. He lifted her body up and down on his dick, using her like a giant fuck toy. This triggered Jessica's own orgasm again, and she let out another scream, and the living room was filled with the noise of the two of them, him groaning deeply, her screaming, for what seemed like hours. They lay on the couch a while, half asleep, enjoying the glow of a good fuck. But it was getting late, and soon Cameron felt a slight loosening sensation in his arms. The spell must be wearing off. I have to go, he said suddenly and got to his feet. His voice seemed somehow loud after the silence, even after Jessica's screams of passion not so long ago. Jessica blinked a couple times and looked at the clock herself. Yeah, she began. But then she turned to look back at him again. And again she seemed to give a little shudder and then perked up. She sat up on the couch. No, please don't go. My parents won't be back for another hour and you haven't fucked my ass yet. What? No, I don't want to do that. Cameron stared at her in disbelief. He needed to get out soon, before the spell wore off and who knows what happened. He didn't want to be around if Jessica suddenly remembered he was an unlikable dweeb. Oh, don't be such a prude. I've never tried it, but it's supposed to be awesome for the guy. I know where my parents keep the lube. Ew, no, Jessica, really. I have to go now, I have my own curfew. Gord, such a mama's boy, don't you want more of this? And she opened her legs and stuck out her chest lewdly. One of her fingers pinched a nipple, while the other traced from her pussy down to her anus. Cameron was running out of time. He could feel his muscles loosening, the chest shrinking, his gut expanding. He need to get out somehow without leaving the girl in tears. No, Jessica, come on, let's call it a night and, uh make a date for next weekend. Yeah, I'll fuck your ass then. This seemed to be enough. Well, uh, she said dramatically. Okay, but I'm gonna want that cock sooner than that. Cameron pulled on his clothes as fast as he could, noticing they were starting to get a little big. Great, it's a date then. I've had a wonderful time, yeah, see ya. He nearly ran for the door. The clothes were getting bigger by the minute. He opened the door and started outside. Wait just a second! Cameron froze. Was he too late? Had she realised what had happened? What happened when the man she had just fucked changed into a wimpy kid again? Be a gentleman and give me a kiss goodnight. Jessica stood in the doorway, nude, exposed to the world. Cameron hastily turned around and pecked her on the cheek. She retreated behind the door a bit and watched as he started walking back to his car, his pant legs dragging comically on the ground now. 
Jessica Redstone found herself watching Cameron Barnes walk back down her front walk back to his car. Her head felt fuzzy. He remembered him coming to the door. But what had he wanted? She realised with a start that she was naked. When had she taken off her clothes? Had she answered the door this way? But no, that would be silly, she thought. She must have just peeked her head around the door and told him to leave or something. Yes, that must be it. Jessica's head was pounding now, and she felt confused. She wandered back up to her room, wondering when she had spilled hair product on herself and why she felt so damn sore down there. The next day was Friday, and Cameron felt mostly great. On the plus side there was fucking Jessica Redstone, and nothing more needed to be said about that. Given the way she had thrown herself at him, he didn't think he'd have any trouble going after any of his other crushes. But there were a couple big points on the minus side. One was that after being the chiselled god last night, finding himself in his real skin was a rude awakening of weak flabbiness. Second, he was worried that the attractiveness effect was a little too powerful. He'd almost been jumped by that woman at the school and he didn't want too much unwanted attention. Third, Jessica might have seen him changing back to his regular self and he didn't know what that might mean for today. If what Ben said was right, she'd have had enough fun last night that she would still be interested in him without the pills. Or even if she wasn't interested, he could always use the pills on someone else. There were a lot of hot girls in school. Next time, he thought, I should pick a girl with bigger tits. Maybe Holly. Mmm, Holly. Cameron had enjoyed many a pep rally watching Holly's tits as they strained against her cheerleader's uniform. But why stop at girls at school? His horizons seemed limitless, and for a while he stayed in bed, entertaining fantasies of showing up at the Playboy mansion ripped and ready to go. After he reawoke to the sound of his mother calling, Cameron realised he was going to be late for school and hurried up. He spent most of the morning looking for Jessica, but it was she who found him first. Oh hi Cameron, can I talk to you for a sec? She asked, pulling him aside by some lockers and away from anyone who might overhear. She looked anxious and was talking quietly. Cameron decided to follow her lead, not sure what she had seen yesterday. Sure, what's up? Did you get what you wanted last night? This was an odd way to put it, but this seemed like a school-friendly way to ask if he'd been pleased with her performance. Cameron smiled wide. He didn't see a need to be school-friendly. Oh hell yes, you were awesome. We should hook up again. Jessica blanched. Excuse me? Are you out of your mind? I only went out with you once to be nice, we've never hooked up. Didn't you enjoy it? You must have come at least four times. Cameron didn't understand why she was in denial. She wasn't claiming the sex was bad, after all. How could she honestly do so? Instead, she was acting like it had never happened. Cameron, if I hear that you've been spreading lies about me at school, I swear to God you will regret it. I'm not some slut who fucks on the first date. Jessica looked livid, but her eyes were also very wide. She looked almost afraid. Then what happened last night? What do you call that? 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 You came by to get your, your bio notes or whatever. God, how could you lie like this? This conversation is over. If I have to listen to any more of this, I'm going to start crying. See you later, asshole. And Jessica... The girl he had fucked last night, and had tried to drag him back in for more, stormed off. Cameron was left standing there, trying to figure out what was going on. She didn't seem like she was pretending at all. As she left, he could see real tears forming in her eyes. She must actually not remember a thing, only him coming to the door and then leaving again. Ben was wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Not only was Jessica not going to want to go out on a date with him, she didn't even know about the good time he had shown her. What good were the pills if the girls didn't remember anything? He'd go broke in a month if he needed pills every time he wanted to fuck. Cameron and Ben would need to have a little talk. Later that afternoon, Cameron found himself again at the heavy ornate door of magic within reach. He pushed and let himself in the cramped store. He saw old Ben behind a bookshelf, diligently dusting the tomes on the lower shelves. Good afternoon, Mr Cameron, he said without looking up. 
did you enjoy your free sample? I got some complaints, old man. Your crappy product doesn't work as advertised. Oh. Ben stopped dusting and came around to the front. He wore the same faded apron, but not as much jewellery as their last meeting. Cameron wondered momentarily which of the baubles he wore gave him that annoying ability to know who was at the door. You said if I showed a lady a good time, she would remember, but I hooked up with a chick as muscle man and today she totally has no idea it happened. All she knows is that I showed up at her place to drop off some notes. Ben's brow furrowed and he looked around. Fascinating. Must be some sort of interaction. Fascinating. Cameron couldn't believe Ben could be this casual about a major product effect. If that went wrong, what else could have gone wrong? It could have killed me. Well, yes, Mr Cameron, it might have killed you, but it didn't. My spells aren't exactly evaluated by the Federal Drug Administration after all. Magic is a very complex art with many intricate interactions. And sometimes getting the balance of properties correct is a bit of a process. While he talked, Ben made his way behind his sales counter and rummaged behind it. He eventually pulled out a ratty-looking notebook, filled with many loose pages. Maybe you're just bad at it. Ben slowed down and his face became grave. Tell me, Mr Cameron. Tell me what worked and what didn't. If you are detailed and specific, I can refine the recipe to the point at which it may finally please you. Number one, the chick don't remember shit. Yes, yes, of course, Ben said dismissively, paging through the notebook. It was annotated everywhere with cryptic bits of writing that Cameron couldn't make out. He seemed to find the appropriate page. Number two, the moment I take the pills, everyone wants to jump my bones. Ben looked up from his notebook and over his glasses. You did say, of course, that you wanted to be more attractive. Sure, but it's way too strong. I have girls a block away trying to get at me when all I really want is to impress the chicks I want. Ben nodded. Ah, yes, that's a good point. Anything else? Anything wrong with the actual transformation? He continued to look at his notes and made small marks with a pen. Cameron thought a moment. No, I guess. That was good. Funny, said Ben with a grin. How the most complex part of the process worked just fine. Yes. He paused for a while. Well, can you get it right? You know sometimes, Mr Cameron. I wonder why I bother at all if you're going to be so ungrateful. I can correct the recipe and the next supply of pills should be more amenable to you. Do you have the funds we discussed? Oh no, you don't. Cameron shook his head vigorously. I'm not paying a cent until you give me a sample that works as we promised. How do I know the next bunch won't cause me to fart uncontrollably? I think you owe me another sample pack. Ten this time. And if I'm satisfied, then I'll promise to buy two batches. Old Ben's look of outrage seemed put upon to Cameron. Ten? For free? Surely you jest. I have a business to run, and I won't be running it much longer with a policy to give every snide, good-for-nothing customer free spells, as long as they claim they are unsatisfied. He paused. I'll give you the same four. No more. Seven. Ben grimaced. And you'll buy two subsequent supplies for $250 each. Cameron knew he had won. Yes. Done. Ben gave him a mean look and headed toward the back of the shop. His voice drifted from behind the shelves. Just give me a few minutes to whip up the new mixture. A few minutes later, Ben returned holding another prescription bottle and clutching something else in his other hand. He gave the bottle to Cameron. Remember, these pills are very strong and you should not take too many at once. I think anything above four at a time may be dangerous. Maybe. There's no way of knowing for sure, but if you take too many pills, the consequences could be devastating. Or maybe there might be no consequences at all. Ben sighed. Yes, that is a possibility. However, I would strongly urge you to follow the dosage guidelines and limit yourself to four in a 24-hour period. And will my girlfriends remember me? Ben held up his clenched hand. That's where this comes in. He opened his hand, revealing a red gem pendant. It was almost two inches long 
and somewhat roughly cut. A tarnished gold cap was affixed to it top, and a thin gold chain was threaded through a small loop in the cap. It was quite tacky. The previous pills incorporated a spell to cause others around you not to notice your change in physique. However, this also caused them not to remember what you had done while transformed. I have removed this spell from the pill so that people who are around you will remember everything. To ensure that others perceive you as normal, I have endowed this pendant with a charm that will reveal your new shape to only those you touch. Only... Cameron interrupted. That's pretty ugly. Couldn't you have charmed something cooler? Ben shot him a nasty look. No? Ahem. Only those you make skin-to-skin -skin contact with will see your new physique and react to it. Everyone else will perceive the usual you. And despite its gaudiness, no one will notice the pendant. I guess that will work. Cameron reached out to take the pendant. Ben snatched it away. Because I am now giving you a second sample and a magical pendant, I really must insist that you pledge a small token of intent, so that I know you aren't just going to keep extracting free services from me. Oh, I see how this works. How much did you want? Sixty dollars. And Cameron? He spoke before Cameron could start to haggle. You have been very rude today. If you aren't willing to pay my price, then I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave. Cameron tried to stare him down, but there was a look in the old man's eye that made it clear he was serious. Fine. Soon he was headed downstairs, a new bottle of pills in his pocket and an ugly ass pendant around his neck and stuffed down his shirt. He was kicking himself for not trying to haggle just a bit on the price of the pendant. Seeing as he had never seen any other customers in the store, Old Ben was probably desperate for business. He probably would have cracked. And yet Cameron could now see someone coming through the door from the street. It was Chelsea. She had black tears painted on her face today. How original. What was she doing there? Although, now that Cameron thought about it, a goth would like a place called Magic Within Reach. It seemed right up her alley. If it was possible, she turned even whiter than normal when she saw him. Oh, hey Cam, what are you doing here? He decided to play dumb. Uh, hey Chelsea, how you doing? I must have the wrong address or something, I thought this was going to be the new taco place. Taco? He kept moving, not wanting to get stuck in conversation. Yeah, oh now I see, it's across the street. Sorry about yesterday, I was just really busy and all. And without thinking, he added, I'd love to hang out sometime. He bit his lip. Why did he have to say that? She turned around. Oh, if that's okay, sorry I was such a bitch. Cameron pushed out the door, his mouth still moving without him wanting it to. Yeah, no problem. Maybe we can get some tacos next week. Tacos on the brain. Okay, see ya. And he made sure his legs carried him away before he could do any more damage. Cameron kept himself distracted that weekend playing Xbox Live with his friend Alex, but his eyes kept drifting back to where the pill bottle was hidden on his shelf and couldn't stop thinking about the next step. He tried wearing the pendant over his shirt and sure enough neither his mum or dad noticed, or at least they didn't say anything. On Sunday he actually did his laundry to try to pass the time and realised in the process that he needed to get more large clothes if he was going to be spending more time as Hunk Cameron. He couldn't keep wearing Aunt Susan's shirt to every date, he spent an hour at the mall trying on various shirts and pants, never quite sure if they were going to fit. There was no way he was going to waste a pill on his shopping trip. He would just have to guess. The sales chick with the stupid earpiece and tight-fitting top was pretty confused, cracking her chewing gum while ringing him up. Are you sure these are going to fit? Crack, crack, crack. They're kind of bug. Nah, that's okay, Cameron said, reciting line he had prepared. They're for my brother. He's coming back from deployment this week. He put on his best puppy dog face. The sarcastic look on the sales chick melted. Oh, that is so sweet. And she forgot to ring up one of his pairs of pants. Cameron smiled in thanks. He left the store thinking of the sales chick. She was kind of cute, actually, if he had any extra pills lying around. But first things first. Monday came, 
with its slow, minute hand in its reluctant orbit, and then lunch. Still, no one had commented on the chain around his neck. Cameron wolfed down his lunch, made sure his water bottle was full, and made his way back to the dingy bathroom. He planned to ask out Jessica again. She had been a great lay, and he really did like her. There was the whole part about her being extremely angry at him, but he figured the pills would mitigate that. Today he was wearing slightly baggy clothes, enough for one pill's worth of growth, he figured. He downed a pill and drank most of the water before it kicked in. The familiar tightening sensation began, and he drank the rest of the water. That made him feel better, and helped him relax as his muscles grew denser and stronger. He was calm enough now that he could watch his arms in the dim light as the muscles twitched and grew, like a time-lapse of a growing plant. Sooner than he expected, the feeling subsided. After taking three last Friday, taking one wasn't bad at all. He turned to the dirty mirror and the hunk looked back at him. It was nothing compared to the three pill stud, but it was a definite improvement. Full of confidence, Cameron tidied himself up and headed back up the stairs to the main hallway to look for Jessica. He opened the door onto the hallway and promptly ran into some upperclassman who was running for the door. The guy lost his balance and fell over. Hey, watch where you're going, twerp, he yelled from the floor. Cameron, who hadn't been nudged an inch thanks to his increased mass, was speechless for a moment. Twerp? Who was he calling twerp? But as he helped the senior up from the floor, the other guy's face changed from anger to fear. Oh, uh, didn't see you there. And he took off. Cameron chuckled to himself. He would have to remember that other people wouldn't see his new form, and he'd be treated like his regular scrawny self until he touched them. Making his way through the crowd today was even odder than the first time he had tried it. Unlike the last time after taking a pill, the other kids didn't keep a respectful distance and make way for him. He had to push his way through the crowd like he was used to doing, but if he did bump into anybody, they quickly backed away, often mumbling an apology. Then Cameron realised what was so odd. Ben had said that in order for others to see his new appearance, he would have to make skin-to-skin -skin contact with him. Instead, it was clear that a good bump was all that was needed to make this connection. He also noticed that the pendant on his neck was getting warm against his chest. It was almost hot. Couldn't the old goat get anything right? He spotted Jessica standing with a couple of her friends in the usual place. He had to be careful, because if she saw him before he had a chance to touch her in some way, she would probably vanish before he could get close. He had to somehow get around behind her, make contact with her somehow, and then reintroduce himself. It would also be a good idea to apply the effect to her two friends as well. He debated several options for how to get this done, and decided on the direct approach. With them facing the other direction, he walked up behind them with his arms outstretched. Hey girls, how's it going? He threw his arms around all of their shoulders, making sure to keep his contact friendly and casual. He felt them stiffen in surprise and then relax. He turned his head to look at Jessica. Oh, hi Cameron, said Jessica, turning to meet his gaze. She looked a little nervous, and her eyes darted around, taking in his face. Was she remembering the other night, or steaming from their confrontation? Or were all these memories being trampled by desire? Cameron felt like he could see some commotion in her brain, various conflicting feelings struggling together. He took his arms off the girls and took a step back. Friendly, non-threatening. Hey Jess, and... He glanced at her friends. Jessica, given something to take her mind of her own thoughts, introduced them. This is Sarah without an H, and Sarah with an H. Sarah's, this is Cameron. The pleasure is all mine, he said, making a flourishing bow. Sarah no H was cute, with a little button nose and long brown hair that framed her big tits. She had one of those fuzzy sweaters that didn't help at all in hiding her shape and made her chest look like a most luxurious pillow. As for Sarah with an H, the H must stand for heavy, he thought, which was too bad. Why did hot chicks always have to have one ugly friend to hang out with? Did they need a constant reminder of their own hotness? 
Or maybe Jessica was just taking pity on her. At the moment, she was texting on a ridiculous pink cell phone bejeweled with rhinestones. No. With the introductions over, Jessica was starting to look confused again. She could probably remember being angry at Cameron, but she probably had a lot of trouble figuring out why. Still, she wasn't exactly looking turned on, so Cameron guessed that not only did she probably not remember the other night, but that the pills were indeed less strong. He would have to start over again. So, Cam, she said. What's up? Well, I've got reservations at the new Japanese place, but my date can't make it. You interested? Sure, it was the same line, but it's not like she'd remember it from the first time. Uh, well, I'd love to, but I have lacrosse practice tonight and it goes really late. Sorry. Cameron for once didn't know what to say. Maybe Ben made the pills a little weak this time. But, she continued, maybe Sarah would be interested. She started looking over to Sarah with an H, but Cameron saw his opportunity. He looked at Sarah no H instead. What do you say, Sarah? He looked at her, hopefully. Jessica was too embarrassed to point out the mistake. Sarah, who didn't have the conflicting storm of half-remembered interactions with Cameron, seemed to be responding to the magical effect much better than Jessica. Her little nose turned bright red. Ah, uh, sure. What time? She squeaked. The other Sarah looked up from her phone, disappointed, but not at all surprised. Oh, around seven. I'll pick you up. You'll have to send me your address, though. They traded cell phone numbers and she texted him her address. Cameron went on to his classes, bursting with anticipation of the night to come. As the day went on, he did notice the pendant getting warm again, but only when there were a lot of people around, and only when he was pumped up. After the pill wore off, it was cool again. It was only when he got home that Cameron realised he needed to actually make reservations at the Japanese restaurant again, although he secretly hoped they'd never make it there. Then again, as much as he liked Jessica's aggression on Thursday, he really wanted to take it a bit slower this time. The pills did seem to be weaker, but he wanted to draw out the experience as long as possible, or at least so they could make it through dinner with his date leaping across the table at him. Not that that would be a bad thing, but it would probably get them arrested. He decided he'd cut one of the pills in half and take that first, just to get started. Then he'd crush a pill and a half and dissolve it in his water glass and drink it slowly over the course of the dinner. That should allow him to slowly bulk up as the evening progressed and watch her reaction. You could do that with pills, right? Ne he put the crushed pills with the mortar and pestle his mum used to grind spices and downed the half pill on the way to her house. He had a feeling in the back of his head that he was forgetting something, but he couldn't think of what it was and tried to brush it away. The house was in one of the newer subdivisions and he parked on the street and walked up the driveway which curved elegantly around a clump of trees. He walked up to the door and rang the bell, and a stocky, middle-aged man with heavy lines on his face opened it. Cameron now remembered what he had forgotten. Sarah's parents. Where could they fool around, with both of their parents home? Are you the boy who wants to take my daughter out tonight? Said the man, whose face showed no signs of awareness of his cliché. Best to play it safe, thought Cameron. He straightened his posture, raising himself to his full half-pill height. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, sir. He didn't even know Sarah's last name. Keep talking. When do you expect her home by, sir? She will be back no later than 22.30, boy. Military time. What a ham. Cameron resisted the temptation to salute. Instead, he held out his hand. Cameron Barnes, sir. The man positively sneered at his hand, but took it anyway. Instantly, his features softened, and he shook Cameron's hand vigorously. Dale Myers, Cameron, good to meet you, son. Cameron was confused for a moment, then realised that Mr Myers was seeing a much taller, stronger kid now. Myers was probably a bully in high school like all the others. Still is, pretty much. Cameron would have to get in the habit of shaking hands now that the pills worked differently. A high voice called from inside. Daddy, don't chase him away. Hi Cameron, I'll just be a minute. Daddy let him come inside. 
Ne Cameron and Myers sat in the living room for what seemed like much longer than a minute while Sarah got ready. While he waited, Cameron had his ear talked off about the real estate market which Myers had gotten into after he had retired from the military. Cameron nodded and grunted in assent every so often, while he kept his eye on the clock and stewed about how much time Sarah was wasting upstairs. No doubt she looked fine half an hour ago. When she finally came down the stairs, though, all his negative thoughts vanished. Her outfit seemed designed to push her father's boundaries as far as she could without him refusing to let her out of the house. And unfortunately, those boundaries were clearly very strict. Looking up at her, Cameron saw she had on a pair of extremely tight-fitting jeans, although the view of her butt was concealed by an extremely form-fitting leather jacket, which did more than hint at the size of her chest. Her hair framed her face perfectly, and her lips had a deft touch of purple lipstick on them. Even Maya's boundaries were no match for his daughter's charms. Cameron stood up and offered his hand gentlemanly. This pleased Myers. Hi! squeaked Sarah. Her nose was red again. You look ravishing, he said, and started walking her toward the door. Mr Myers had an involuntary grin on his face. The proud father couldn't help himself. Cameron figured now was the time to push his luck. So, said Cameron, 10.30. Uh, well, said Myers, his resolve crumbling. Since Sarah took her sweet time upstairs, I suppose I could look the other way until, oh, 11. See you before then, said Cameron, and walked Sarah out the door. They walked down the hill of the driveway to the street. You know, he said, trying to make conversation. Your neighbourhood is pretty dark. There's barely any lights on anywhere. Daddy says a bunch of the places are foreclosed now, said Sarah. Sometimes they just pack up the kids and go in the middle of the night because they can't afford to pay any more. Cameron looked around, and indeed some of the front doors had big orange notices on the front doors, or several newspapers piled up out front. Daddy says they're scum. The moment they were out of sight of the house, Sarah unzipped her leather jacket despite the chilly air and removed it in one smooth motion. Cameron almost stumbled. Sarah knew how to do more than just push her father's boundaries. She knew how to blow them away completely. Hidden underneath her jacket was a midriff bearing tank top that looked entirely too thin and was held away from her body by the thrust of her breasts. On the front, it said porn star, with a big rainbow erupting from the A which was a star. Do I still look ravishing? She asked with a gleam in her eye. You look fucking hot, said Cameron, now checking out her ass, previously hidden by the jacket. So Oof. do you put out on the first date? Damn straight, she Probably said. not the best line to try, but Cameron was feeling lucky. He'd really wanted to go out with Jessica again, but even with the influence of the pills, she'd said she couldn't make it. Instead, he'd ended up on a date with Sarah, Jessica's friend with the fantastic tits and no fear of showing them off. The hostess at the Japanese place had seated them in a booth somewhat out of the way. Maybe she thought Sarah was less than adequately dressed and didn't want the other patrons distracted. This meant more privacy for him and more opportunities to have fun. Humph, bad boy, she squeaked again and slapped him. It was light enough to still be playful. He was starting to dislike that noise though. Well, with a shirt that has porn star written on it, I thought it was worth asking, he said, making it clear he was just fooling around. This is just for teasing you with, silly, and pissing off teachers. Cameron was actually pleased that she wasn't ready to jump his bones at one half pill level. He was closer to his regular scrawny self than the body he was starting to get used to, so it would follow that the effect would be enough for her to at least tolerate him. The crushed pill and a half had dissolved quickly in the water, while Sarah was looking at the menu, and he started to sip it as he decided what to eat. He left the rest of the pills next to his seat, afraid the bottle would get crushed in his pocket. He thought it was funny, drugging himself. Your typical jerk usually tried to find ways to slip pills in his date's drink, not his own. Cameron didn't really know what to expect from the dissolved pills but he assumed that if he drank slowly enough, the changes would come equally slowly. His shirt and pants, new from the mall, 
had enough room for him to grow a few sizes. Cameron didn't even like Japanese food and the restaurant was pricey for his budget, but it impressed girls when he asked them to go someplace that wasn't Arby's, was where most of his classmates took their dates. Soon the waitress came over to take their order and Cameron thought he recognised her. She was Asian and about his age and looked totally unhappy to be there. She asked for their order without even looking up from her pad. Oh, hi, Chu, said Sarah brightly. The girl looked up. Oh, hey, Sarah, right? History? The girl's face relaxed. Uh-huh, sweet gig working here, yeah? My dad owns the restaurant. He has me cover some nights. It sucks. Luckily, I'm only on till nine. Cameron decided to butt in since they were ignoring him. I'm Cameron. Hi. So can I interest you guys in some appetisers? Um. When the food came, he had drunk enough of the water that he could definitely feel the effects of the pills. He felt his muscles twitch a little, like he was high on adrenaline, and he thought he was a little higher in his seat. He looked down at the sushi he had ordered and realised that, on top of not really liking Japanese food, he didn't know how to use chopsticks. He looked up at Sara and grinned a little stupidly. Heh. I hope they have a knife and fork. No, silly, use the chopsticks, she said. She seemed to be an old pro with hers, snaring a roll and delicately putting it in her mouth. I don't think I've ever actually used them, uh, actually. Never use chopsticks? How? But she didn't press him, and instead starting making moon eyes at him, and broke into a smile that nearly melted him into a puddle. Cameron tried to use the chopsticks, but with his muscles twitching he couldn't really control them at all, and kept dropping the rolls. Sarah smiled again, and gently grabbed the roll he was chasing and guided it to his mouth. Nope! He still didn't like sushi. <laughs> when they had finished their appetisers, he had drunk a third of the glass, and had started to feel his legs and his arms thicken. The pendant was also starting to warm up. He thought maybe it got hotter, as it had to work harder to maintain the appearance of normalcy for everyone else around. He also noticed that Sarah was starting to show more effect. She was shifting around in her seat a little, and more than once adjusted the strap of her bra at her shoulders. This caused vibrations that cascaded from her shoulders to her porn star covered tits, causing them to jiggle back and forth softly. The vibrations carried down to the thin fabric of the tank top, which waved above her belly button. She was trying to hide her discomfort, but wasn't doing a great job. Feeling okay? asked Cameron. He was curious if she would deflect the question, or if the pills were strong enough yet to take over her conscious mind. It's, ah, kinda hot in here. Actually, her voice dropped to a whisper, this bra is being really itchy but the tank is too thin without it. Oh, that sucks, he said, and almost knocked over his glass in his haste to drink more water. Soon the glass was half gone and Sarah looked more uncomfortable than ever. Her nose was also bright red. She excused herself and left for the ladies' room. Cameron, at this point struggling to maintain his muscle control, allowed his twitches to grow momentarily. He was getting very thirsty, but knew better than to drink the rest of his glass so he reached across the table and downed Sarah's glass in two gulps. Chu came over soon afterward. More water? Ah, no thanks, he said. He hadn't touched her in any way, so she probably didn't see his tremors. More for the lady, though. She refilled the other glass. He drank half of it, and his twitching died down and became manageable. Sarah reappeared and sat down. The pendant got suddenly warmer, and Cameron looked up. He nearly choked on his California roll. Sarah had removed her bra in the restroom, and the small dark circles of her nipples were plainly visible underneath the O and the star. She looked at Cameron and smiled again, not looking the least embarrassed. She breathed deeply, causing him to be transfixed at the sight of her large tits appearing to grow and shrink gently. His cock stirred and he struggled to regain his composure. I thought the tank top was too thin, he asked. I just don't know what's wrong with that bra, it was just too itchy. I had to throw it out, she said matter-of-factly, although somewhat breathless. Besides, do you really want me to put it back on? No, no, of course not, he said. 
She could have put her hair down over her chest to cover up, but hadn't. I'm just hoping the tank top gets itchy too. Now that you mention it, she said, but trailed off, staring at him. Then she burst out laughing, which would have made Cameron feel bad if not for the effect it had on her chest. She shook her head and absent-mindedly smoothed the fabric of her shirt. All that accomplished was rubbing her nipples lightly, and they quickly formed hard points under the material. Cameron forgot to eat as he watched, then quickly recovered and drank more water. There was barely a quarter of the glass left. The feeling of snakes on his inside started up again, and he felt his arms and legs filling out his clothes now. He revelled in the feeling of barely constrained power, and felt his huge dick straining against his pants. Sarah was starting to forget to eat too, and did little more than push her food around. The redness of her nose had started to spread to her face, and she was giving him a dead sexy look, one that said that she might jump across the table at any moment. Chu came by and he asked for the check. Then Cameron felt something stirring below the table, and a foot touched his leg. Sarah was grinning more widely now. The foot travelled up to his thigh and didn't stop. It finally came to rest at his crotch, the sole of her foot pressed against his hard dick. The pendant became warmer still, nearly hot. Even from their corner of the restaurant there were other customers in view of their hanky-panky, and it was working hard to maintain some illusion of normalcy. Now that Cameron was bigger and stronger, his skin seemed thicker too. The heat didn't bother him much. Mmm, Sarah said, nearly moaning. Feels pretty big, but... And she sighed dramatically. It could be better. Better? exclaimed Cameron. He continued in a softer voice. Babe, if we weren't in a crowded restaurant, I would show you better. He drank the rest of the glass. Who cares about them? What's stopping you? She asked with a devilish grin. That gave Cameron pause for a moment. Then he leaned forward, reached across the table, and grabbed her left tit roughly through her tank top, brushing the nipple with his thumb. Her tit filled his large hand nicely, and was soft but firm. He would never get tired of that feeling. The pendant was definitely hot now. Oh, she squeaked, but he had released her as quickly as he'd attacked. Cameron looked around. Not eight feet away was a middle-legged couple eating dinner and they hadn't blinked. He liked the idea of other people watching even if they didn't see a thing. How far would the pendant let them go? As hot as he could stand. Soon Chu came by with the check, smiling innocently, and Cameron gave her some cash. She left without so much as a glance. Sarah started pressing her foot rhythmically against his cock, and Cameron noticed that her left hand was below the table somewhere. Was she playing with herself? Cameron decided he could stand quite a bit of heat. With one swift motion, he stood up and swiped all the dishes off the table, crashing them to the floor. The pendant nearly singed his chest hair, but the only reaction from anyone else in the restaurant was to glance at the dishes briefly. A normal occurrence in a restaurant. He was getting a damp spot on his shirt where his cock was leaking fluid. His clothes, if anything, felt a little small. His muscles were tight against the fabric and he felt like he could pop a button if he flexed the right way. He reached over and grabbed Sara by the armpits, hoisting her up and onto the table. A busboy came by and quietly cleaned up the spilled food. Ooh! She squealed. What's going on here? She said in mock protest, looking up at him dreamily from the table. She pushed herself up with her arms, which served to squeeze her boobs between them, nipples poking greedily through the fabric. You parents are home and so are mine, said Cameron. So I'm going to fuck you right here. He reached down to the collar of her tank top and tore the flimsy material in half, spilling her tits out for all the world to see. Only the pendant burned so that they wouldn't. She turned over on her back, humming with delight. She undid her pants and pulled the zipper part way down to give herself better access. She reached one hand down her jeans and frigged herself in earnest. Cameron undid his pants too and removed them and his underpants, revealing his large cock, glistening with pre-cum and sweat from his growth spurt. He stroked himself, trying to get used to the burning sensation at his chest. He decided he could stand it better with another pill. That would mean three total, 
which would be the same as last time with Jessica. While Sarah busied herself, Cameron fumbled with the pill bottle and downed one. He tensed as the twitching hit him. Mmm, said Sarah below him, looking up at his dick. That's not so big. I bet I can fit the whole thing in my mouth. She reached up, head hanging off the table and grabbed his throbbing erection, guiding it to her upside down mouth. It was obviously too big to fit and Cameron was having trouble holding still. One particularly large contraction caused his dick to whip out of her hand, but she grabbed it again. Once her mouth reached the tip, however, something strange happened. Cameron couldn't see his cock shrink or her mouth grow, but somehow his cock fit barely. And it felt awesome. Her teeth scraped his dick a little, but only slightly. Her tongue was on the top of his dick, and with her head off the table, he was able to keep pushing past the back of her mouth and deep into her throat. It was different than Jessica's pussy, that was for sure, more alive and full of movement. He removed his dick, afraid of choking her. She sucked off the saliva loudly, smiling. Told ya, she grinned up at him. Not so big. Girl, you are asking for it, he said, a little annoyed. He pushed his cock to her mouth again until his balls were in her face. He removed his shirt and reached over and grabbed one of her big tits gyrating on the table, pinching the nipple. She moaned and pat his hip with her hand. He withdrew, long ropes of saliva still connecting them. It was then, with his dick dripping saliva back into Sarah's mouth, his hand on her naked tit and her hand buried in her pants, that Cameron felt a tap on his shoulder. You're... Chang It was Chu, holding some bills and coins. There was a moment, Cameron saw, between when Chu saw the scene for what it was and when the rest of the spell took over and it no longer mattered. She looked at him slack-jawed. I hope you're off your shift, said Cameron. He had stopped thrusting, but Sarah's tongue was still working on his shaft. Chu nodded weakly, staring at Sarah's mouth which was back around his cock. Then suck my balls. She nodded again and knelt down on the floor, tongue probing daintily at his balls while she started undoing her waitress uniform. Cameron resumed fucking Sarah's face, pulling out from time to time so she could cough and catch her breath. He held on to both her tits, every so often tweaking the nipples, enjoying the spasms this caused in the lower half of her body. It also caused her to moan, which vibrated his entire cock from tip to root. Chu gained confidence and her mouth engulfed his balls one after the other. He closed his eyes, enjoying the sensations, until he came, squirting down Sarah's throat. She gave an appreciative moan in return which was almost too much for him to stand. He knew this was no end but he pulled his dick out of her throat anyway, coated with spit and cum. Chu looked at the dripping meat looming above her apprehensively but Cameron didn't insist she lick it clean. He'd need the lubrication. Chu got up and joined Sarah on the table. She was naked now, her small tits little more than points. She still looked a little nervous, though, and looked at Sarah for direction. Sarah giggled again. See? Not so big, Chu. Cameron didn't understand why she kept saying these things. Was there something wrong with the spell? He grunted and spun Sarah around, causing Chu to have to dodge her legs. Sarah whooped, having a great time. He pulled off her pants and underpants, revealing her dripping wet pussy. The nice older couple at the next table ordered dessert and complained about how noisy the restaurant was. Cameron stroked his wet dick up and down on Sarah's slit, teasing her. She moaned in frustration. Chu was fascinated and put her hand on his muscled arm, while her other hand busied itself fingering her own cunt. Her eyes said that she wanted that cock but didn't think she could take it. She started grunting softly in time with her motions. You think this cock isn't big enough for you? Cameron said to Sarah. You want more? She only grinned and giggled. Then you can have more. And, and he reached over to the bottle and fished out another pill. He crunched it in his mouth and gulped it down. Almost immediately, he grew larger, growling with the strain, feeling the cock in his hand grow again. 
a thick pole laced with throbbing veins dripping with precum. His head was getting dangerously close to the lamp above their table now. If Chu noticed his arm muscles bulge and swell, she didn't show it. He positioned his cock at the opening of the cunt in front of him, gently spreading the glistening lips apart and pushed. As with her mouth, it shouldn't have fit at all, but the wonderful magic allowed him entrance. Sara's pussy stretched lewdly around him and he pushed. Chu gasped, fingering herself harder. He pushed past the point where his dick should practically be in her chest, and yet he still was able to bottom out completely with nothing more than a groan of approval from the big-titted girl beneath him. The pendant, now visible at his chest, was actually glowing as it burned his skin. He barely noticed. Sara gripped the table edge behind her, looking between her tits at Cameron between her thighs, and he began slowly to thrust, holding on to her hips. He looked at Chu, who was going mad with lust, her hand moving fiercely now. Have her lick your pussy and play with her tits. She nodded silently again and crawled across towards Sara, still looking hesitant to participate fully. Sara briefly whispered something in Chu's ear which made her smile and she moved faster to sit on her face. Sara grabbed Chu's ass and went to town, licking and sucking loudly. Chu tried to play with Sara's boobs, but was quickly too distracted to do so. Her own moans soon joined Sara's. Cameron started thrusting farther, his huge dick allowing for long, wet, lysurely thrusts that had Sara's voice doing scales as he pulled it out and push it in her hungry pussy. Not so small now, huh? He said, grinning, enjoying watching her tits bounce with each thrust. Sara took a break from eating Chew's pussy, earning a mule of disappointment from the petite girl. I guess, Ung, it's okay. Oomph, but I've had bigger. And she giggled again. Cameron had had just about enough of this, so he withdrew his giant cock from her snatch, depriving her. Well, if you don't want it, Maybe I'll give it to someone who might enjoy it. He looked up at Chu. She looked down at Sara, smiling, then spun around and presented her ass to Cameron, kneeling above Sara. Give me that big cock, she said, starting to get into it, reaching beneath her body to spread her lips apart. Her pussy was comically tiny compared to his dick, but Cameron knew he would still fit, just barely, if the spell was consistent. He rubbed his dick up and down on her lips, unable to feel where the hole even was. But he pushed, slowly, with one strong arm on her arse, the other gripping his cock to hold it straight. Chu gasped, bending over under the pressure. He pushed harder, felt a slight loosening sensation, and then his head was in. He put his other hand on her arse too, admiring the length of dick he was going to put inside the girl. Her pussy was wrapped tight around his head and her arsehole winked at him invitingly. Sarah leaned over and started whispering in Chu's ear again, and Chu nodded, relaxing a bit. She allowed herself to moan as Cameron pushed in. Um, oh my god, she said, eyes tightly shut. Play with my tits while he fucks you, Sarah said, playing with herself. Chu buried her face in Sarah's cleavage holding on to the girl's boobs for dear life. Cameron realised that she was so light for him now that he could easily lift her entirely off the table. And so he did, hoisting her upright, keeping a firm grip on her waist so he could control exactly how he fucked her. Ju had to stop playing with Sara's tits and started pulling her own nipples instead. Slowly, with small back and forth motions, he worked her onto his cock, leaning back against the booth to keep his balance. The mixed juices of his cum, Sara's mouth, and both their pussies made the work easier. Finally, she was completely impaled on him, cunt leaking juices onto his balls, and he realised that his cock could support her entire weight. He let go of her waist and reached up to play with her little tits, putting his hands over hers. This put Chu's full weight on his dick and her eyes snapped open at the surprise, and she moaned louder yet. Oh my god, so full. Oh God, she said, jaw open, disbelieving. Sarah was jamming one hand in and out of her pussy watching the sight and kneading her tit with the author 
regularly pinching and pulling at the nippler. Her cunt was creating a fairly large wet spot on the table. Cameron leaned down to whisper in Chu's ear while he bounced her a little on his massive rod. Big enough for you? he asked breathily. Cameron couldn't see Chu's face, so he didn't see the little wink she gave Sarah before she said, Oh, I've had bigger. Cameron didn't take it well. He practically roared with anger. How could they tease him like this? His cock wasn't just big, it was magically huge, so there was no way they could be telling the truth. They were just jerking him around like all the rest. Sarah was laughing now, and apparently coming at the same time. And although he couldn't see Chu's face, she was laughing too. But he could show them. He wrapped an arm around Chu, holding her on his cock, grinding her clit into him. She gave another yelp of pleasure and started rubbing her pussy. Nug, when are you going to start fucking me with that thing? She asked. Real soon, honey. He leaned over to the bench and grabbed the bottle of pills, two still in it. He popped off the top with his thumb, ripping through the child's safety seal. When I'm through, you won't be able to say you've ever had bigger than me. He popped the pills in his mouth. Sarah stopped jamming her fingers in her pussy long enough to say, Ultimum Cam, we're just teasing. Girls tease guys they like. You know that, right? But he had already swallowed, and this time Cameron actually did roar. Sarah knew in the back of her mind somewhere that she wasn't the kind of girl who wore her most slutty clothes on the first date, but it didn't seem to matter that much tonight. She also knew that she normally didn't remove her bra halfway through dinner, but that also didn't seem important. And she definitely knew that she didn't deep throat guys with dicks bigger than her forearm, and then get fucked silly on restaurant tables, but tonight seemed to be a night of exceptions. And Cameron, with his perfect abs and giant dick, was definitely exceptional. It was too bad he was taking her teasing so seriously, but come on, he had to know it was for fun. Now he was throwing a tantrum, yelling and twisting about with Chu, the girl from history class, still stuffed full of that big dick. That was something else she didn't do a lot. Threesomes. Especially spontaneous ones with girls she didn't really know. So weird. His motions didn't seem to phase Chu. In fact, it caused his dick to work around in her pussy, touching her in some good places from the looks of it. Sarah resumed thrusting her fingers inside her and pinching her nipples, looking over Cameron's body, wondering what it was about him that made her want to do such crazy things. Maybe it was his smooth, hairless skin, but actually Cameron was definitely hairy, almost getting hairier by the minute. And those yellow eyes of his... Had they always been yellow? That wasn't a particular turn-on for her. Maybe it was the claws, the claws that were leaving light red lines on Chu's waist and thighs as they scratched, trying to hold on to her. It finally dawned on Sara that Cameron was changing in front of her. He was turning into some sort of... creature. This wasn't something she had seen any of her other boyfriends do. His eyes were pale yellow and burned with an intense light. His mouth was wide open, with sharp teeth sprouting and growing suddenly. His jaw stretched forward to accommodate the new teeth, and his nose shrank and joined with it. Sarah was disappointed in her previous boyfriends. None of them had been able to turn into wolves. God, it made her wet. Eventually one of the creature's spasms threw Chew for Ward onto the table, its dick slipping out of her with a wet, sucking sound. Finally, the thing that used to be, Cameron stopped jerking violently and its change seemed to be complete. It stood there, head near the ceiling, chest heaving. Its fur was short and dark grey, almost black. It had grown a short tail which twitched slightly. Its bright pink cock had ridges and was pointed at the end, and it was leaking small amounts of fluid. The beast seemed confused and looked around, sniffing the air. Then it seemed to remember Chu who was so worn out she hadn't moved from her place on the table, her ass still presenting itself to the thing. Its cock seemed far too big to fit in the girl, but the beast grabbed her ass and forced its length into her in one smooth motion. She gasped, and it immediately started pounding her cunt, spreading her legs wide. Sarah watched as it slammed its cock into the girl over and over, Chew's juices spread liberally over its length. 
The thing's hips were a blur as it pistoned in and out with animal ferocity. It was using its tail as a counterbalance to keep it steady. The pendulous ball slammed into her with every stroke, a sound that rose above the sound of the other diners still oblivious. Suddenly the beast let out a deafening roar and jammed its dick in Chu's cunt as far as it would go, its whole body jerking in orgasm. Despite herself, Sara came at the same time, all four fingers buried in her snatch, cum soaking them wet. Suddenly there was a bright flash and a popping sound from the thing's direction, like a light bulb exploding, and it was like a veil being lifted. Sara gasped as she realised what was happening before her. She pushed herself off the table and backed away from the scene. There was a scream, and Sara looked around, realising she was totally nude in a public restaurant. She made motions to cover herself, but it didn't matter. The other patrons and the staff were running for the exits. Tables and chairs were knocked over and dozens of plates crashed to the floor. There were more screams and yells and frantic shouts to call 911, but nobody wanted to stick around. They needed to get away from the thing. The thing that looked like it was having its way with a young high school girl. The cacophony was tremendous, but it was soon over. Everyone was gone, and all who were left were Sara, the thing that was Cameron, and poor Chiu, who was starting to figure out what was going on. The wolf let go of Chu's ass and withdrew its ridged cock from her pussy, pushing her away. She rolled onto the floor, narrowly missing the remnants of a broken water glass. Sara rushed over and pulled Chu away, not taking her eyes off the beast. Its dick was starting to shrink slightly, and the creature was now panting deeply, looking at its clawed hands. If Sara didn't know better, she'd guess it was as shocked as she was. Slowly, the creature started to change again, its claws retreating and its hair shortening. Cameron seemed to realise what was happening and bolted toward the door, hurling one table out of the way, then unable to lift the next as he returned to a more normal size. He streaked out into the night as the sound of police sirens became audible in the distance. Sara sat on the floor in shock, clutching Chu, both girls nude and panting. Is it just me? said Chu softly, or was that kind of hot? Hours later, Sara sat in her father's darkened office, nursing a cold cup of coffee. It was well past midnight, but her father had insisted that she stay up while he made preparations. He had been on the phone for over an hour, making dozens of calls. About what? She couldn't be quite sure. She had only been in the room for a few minutes and he was just wrapping up a call. After the ruckus at the restaurant, emergency vehicles of all types had swarmed the premises. Based on Sara and Chu's state of undress, they were herded immediately to the nearest ambulance. They were asked all sorts of uncomfortable questions and pretty soon the paramedics started wanting to poke and prod them in ways that Sara was just not ready to deal with. She put up a fight, but pretty soon they had her strapped down, for her own good, as she screamed at them. Thank her lucky stars it didn't last long. Without warning, everything stopped and the paramedics all exited the ambulance, just leaving her tied down, staring at the bright lights in the ceiling. With all the commotion outside, she couldn't hear what was being said, but moments later, her mother was struggling to loosen the restraints and wrapping her in a poofy bathrobe. I came from work as soon as you could, you poor dear. This only made her cry more, but out of relief. After a big hug, they made their way undisturbed through the maze of trucks to her father's car. He walked over to them soon after, offering her a hot cup of coffee. On the Dale Myers scale of intimacy, this was epic. Sarah said thanks, he said nothing, and he drove them home. During the ride, her father asked quietly but persistently about what happened. Sarah knew better than to lie about what happened. The only thing worse than the crime is the cover-up, Daddy always said. Given that she'd been found naked in a destroyed restaurant, any lie would have been as ridiculous as the truth. So she told the truth while her father stared straight ahead at the road. She felt lame when she found herself tiptoeing over the sexual escapades with the phrase, had his way with me, and at this she saw her father's knuckles turn white on the steering wheel. But he said nothing more. As they pulled into the driveway, her father finally turned around and looked at her. What you've told me is mighty fantastic, but you're my daughter and you're old enough now to know not to lie to your father. Yes, sir, she said quietly. 
I need to know right now, he said, voice tense, if what you've told me is the truth. Because I'm about to go into my office and call in every favour anyone ever owed me, and if I find out you're spinning yarns... He didn't need to finish. She wiped a tear from her eye and nodded. I'm not angry with you, Punkin. I love you with all my heart. It's not your fault. You know that. But I need to know that I'm doing the right thing. He smiled, and it almost looked compassionate. It's all true, she said. He nodded, grimacing, and went inside. Sarah's mum drew her, took a hot bubble bath surrounded by scented candles, and Sarah took a good long soak while her father disappeared into his office to make his phone calls. The bath helped her relax and it also gave her the chance to make sure she was still in one piece. She felt sore and a little raw, but nothing hurt, and as far as she could tell there was no bruising or anything. After the bath, her mum wrapped her in an even poofier robe and informed Sarah that her father wanted to speak with her in his office. If getting a cup of coffee had been a surprise, this came as a shock. Dad's office was off-limits, so much so that Sarah didn't know what it even looked like inside. He disappeared into the office regularly, usually after watching the game. Sarah would hear him on the phony, but the one time she dared to listen through the door all she could, here was muffled noise. Sarah picked up the coffee from the stand by the tub and made her way to the office door. She stared at it without knocking, almost thinking it was a trick to get her to break the rules and disturb Daddy. The smell of cigar smoke leaked from the door as it often did. This was the only room in the house that Dale Myers was allowed to smoke, the only rule he had ever let his wife impose on him. Sarah finally knocked, and her father told her to come in. He was still on the phone and motioned for her to sit in the chair, a short cigar stub in his mouth. Two more were in the ashtray. She sat and realised her coffee was cold. She nursed the coffee anyway and looked around the room. It was a plain home office, with a set of shelves on one wall filled with binders, a stack of filing cabinets, and a bulletin board with some house and building information sheets neatly pinned on it. Propped up in the corner on one of the cabinets was the family's old TV, which Sarah hadn't seen since she was eight. She had assumed they'd thrown it out long ago. Seeing it in the corner, the bright purple spot in the upper right brought back memories Her dad's desk was in the middle of the room facing the folding chair Sarah was now seated in. It was spotless, with a computer off to one side, a phone and the ashtray. It was all so normal, Sarah wondered what the big deal had been about not coming in. Dale wrapped up his phone conversation and hung up. He puffed on his cigar. He looked at her squarely. I've taken care of everything. By this time next week, it will be as if none of this ever happened. He was speaking in clipped sentences, like he was addressing his men back in the day or something. Uh, Daddy, Sarah started, looking down at the coffee cup. Don't interrupt, he snapped. You underestimate your old man. You'll be out of school the rest of the week with a bad late-season flu. I'll have a doctor's note by 0700 tomorrow. She looked at him pleadingly. She'd just been violated by a giant monster and he thought she'd be back at school in a week, like nothing happened. I see you're worried about what your little oriental friend... Well, her family has been very cooperative, and they've agreed to aid us in our cover story. At this juncture, all you need to know is that a wild animal, probably a cougar, got into the restaurant and scared everyone away. It got up on the roof somehow and fell through the ceiling onto your table. This was wrong. All wrong. Her father had probably paid off Chu and her father, probably threatened them too. Her one possible ally in working through this and in figuring out exactly what happened, probably hated her now. Her hands trembled and she had to put the coffee on the floor. Yes, I know, the problem of your clothing. That troubled me as well. However, I've worked with Captain Jenkins. He was in charge at the scene, of course, and he's going to help the personnel at the scene remember that In fact, you were merely one of many restaurant-goers who fled the scene. That little detail will never see the light of day. He grinned at the plan he'd set in motion. He stabbed out the cigar. Just how many people had he threatened? Sarah knew her father had powerful friends in the military, but he was talking about silencing a dozen emergency personnel. 
Sarah started shaking, scared and angry at the same time. Then of course there's the matter of Mr Barnes. With regard to him, you're on a need-to-know basis and you don't need to know. But I will say that you won't have to worry about him again. Ever. Sarah couldn't keep it in anymore. What are you going to do, have him killed? Are you insane or something? She spluttered. Insane! Insane! He roared. You've been violated by this boy, you said so yourself. I'd tear him limb from limb personally if I had the chance. Instead, I'm doing the smart thing and taking care of this quietly, leaving your dignity and reputation intact. Reputation? People are going to notice, okay, if I hooked up with Cameron and then he never shows up again. People are going to find out. And if he turns up dead somewhere, they're going to find out it was you. My reputation is going to be the girl whose dad calls out hits on her boyfriends. Boyfriend? He roared again, standing up from the chair, knocking it over behind him. Then her father forced himself to relax, slowly, and lowered his eyes. He sat back in the chair. I can see that you're in shock and that you don't realise what has happened to you. He tried smiling and looked at her like she was five again. Why don't you go to bed, Punkin, and see how you feel about it tomorrow? I'm sure you'll realise I'm doing the right thing. Sarah left the office with a headache. It was after 1am and exhaustion was catching up with her. Her father did have a point. Why wasn't she more angry at Cameron? He had kind of raped her, hadn't he? Well... Not really, she thought. She certainly didn't resist or say no or anything. But there's no way she had been in control. Nobody acts like that. Sure, she could be a tease and she liked attention, but she would never do that. And yet, she knew that a part of her enjoyed it. Even now, the thought of Cameron throwing the dishes to the floor and taking her made her tingle. And after he transformed the creature he became was almost stunning in its masculinity, like a stallion. Too bad Chu had had that fun. But what was she thinking? Daddy was right. Sarah needed rest. Sarah let the robe fall to the floor of her bedroom and crawled under the covers. She fell asleep almost instantly. When Sarah's eyes drifted open the next morning, the sun was already pouring in the windows. She felt refreshed and sat up to grin at the sun. In the haze of waking, she wondered why she was waking up without an alarm on a school day. But then the memories of the previous night started to surge back to the top of her mind. Sarah groaned, clamping them down, refusing to think about the last night. Sarah's mum must have been monitoring her sleep because she came bustling in with a breakfast in bed tray loaded with French toast and eggs. Now you just stay in bed there and enjoy your breakfast. Mum, said Sarah, pulling the cover over her head. You know I don't eat breakfast and eggs with yolks. Ugh! You want me to be fat? Aren't you supposed to be at work? Don't you worry about that. I got the day off, of course. Come now, dear. You've been through a lot. You could use some comfort food. Sarah sighed dramatically. It looked like Mum wasn't going to be swayed. Fine, but leave me alone. I'm tired, she lied. Yes, yes, OK, dear, I love you. And she shuffled out the door. Sara stuck her tongue out at the breakfast, ate one bite of everything just to say she had eaten, and scraped the rest in the trash. She sat in bed, not sure what to do with the day. Most of all, she needed to think about anything other than what happened the night before. She needed a distraction. She saw her laptop charging on the bedstand and opened it up to Facebook like she did most mornings. Sara and just about everyone in her class added as a friend whether she knew them or not. This made the site kind of hard to browse, but with 462 friends and counting, she was solidly in the top 10 friended people at school. This let her keep up on all the gossip at school as relationships were announced, broken and repaired, often in the same day. Her classmates' status updates were exactly what she needed, mundane and boring. Rachel somebody got an A on a test. Jessica had had a tough lacrosse practice yesterday, etc. Sarah's denial was shattered, however, by a short update made late last night from a mobile phone. Chu, I am moving back to China tomorrow. I love you all. Sarah couldn't ignore it anymore. The memories surged forth and she saw images of the ruined restaurant interior, the emergency vehicles everywhere, the red lines on Chu's thighs. 
Chu, whom she had hoped to talk to sometime about what happened, was moving to China? Breath coming in gasps again, Sara quickly looked up Chu's number on her profile page and dialed, but it just rang and went to voicemail. The voicemail message was chipper and friendly and felt like it had been recorded long ago. Sara dialed again, but again the phone just rang. Sarah threw the phone onto her bed, yelling, Fuck! She resumed clamping down on the memories, trying to take control of herself. Once again, her mother responded awfully quickly. She must have been hovering very near the door. Are you all right, dear? Uh, yeah. I just stubbed my toe. Oh, okay, dear. You be careful. You're still in shock. You have to take it easy. Sarah looked back at Chu's profile page and noticed that she had her home address listed. Sarah's parents had always told her never to post her address online for fear of child predators, but apparently Chu's parents didn't watch network TV. She mapped it and saw that Chu's family lived a few developments over. Sarah poked her head out of her bedroom door. Hey mum. As she expected, her mum came around the corner out of the bathroom. Yes dear, are you okay? Yes, yes, fine, Mum. Is it okay if I go visit Chu today? Her mum's eyes widened. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. No. Your father thought it was most important that you get your rest. And it's not safe out there with that thing running around. I'll be okay, Mum. It's bright and sunny outside. It'll be fine. But her mum was shaking her head. No, 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 young lady. You're staying right here. Sarah and her mother locked eyes for a moment. She tried a different tack. If I stay in my room, I'll go crazy. I can't think about anything else. Chu and I need to talk, to share our feelings and get through this, together. She clasped her hands together and really turned on the puppy dog eyes now, but her mum was still looking sceptical. Chu's mum said it was okay. Finally, Sarah had pushed the right button. Well, it is very sunny out. Her mum never wanted to be the bad guy and if Chu's mum thought it was okay, then she was just being too harsh. Still, Sarah was worried what her dad would say. At this point, her mum would defer to her father. He always got the last word, but instead her mum just nodded. Where's dad? asked Sarah. Well, dear, he left early this morning. He said it was for business, of course. Sarah nodded. Daddy often left on business and the two women of the house knew that many times he went on these trips there was precious little business being done. When do you want to leave, honey? I'll give you a ride. Sarah showered and dressed, opting for her most comfortable jeans and a spaghetti strap top. Soon the two women were in the car, headed towards Chiu's house. Sarah had tried to talk her mother out of giving her a ride, but it was no use. She'd insisted, and now Sarah was petrified at what would happen when her mum found out that Chu's mum had no idea what she was talking about. She was saved, however, when her mum's phone rang. She answered it with her silly-looking headset. Yes. Yes. Oh, Candy, how are you? But she was apparently cut off. Oh, oh, that's too bad. No, I'm not busy. I can fill in no problem. Not busy. Sarah rolled her eyes. Her mum was a mum, of course, but when work called, everything else ceased to exist. Well, started her mum, but Sarah didn't listen to the rest. Her mum needed to go to work after all, just like always. She would have to drop Sarah off at Chu's, and Chu's mum would have to drive her home. Her mum waved her hands and made faces while she talked in a soundless effort to convince Sarah that she had no choice. Soon they arrived at the address an average-sized house in a cul-de-sac. Sarah's mum was too distracted by the phone to notice the large moving van she had to avoid. She didn't even get out of the car, although she did manage to remember to kiss Sarah Goodby. After no time at all, Sarah was on the front, walk of Chu's house, uninvited, with her mum speeding away around the corner. She found herself unable to move or approach the door, she knew once she saw Chu, the images would start flooding back into her head again, and as much as she wanted to talk it out, her brain wouldn't let her. As luck would have it, her brain didn't need to let her, because the front door burst open and three large black men emerged carrying a couch. 
They were shirtless and sweaty, and their muscles flexed as they manoeuvred the couch down the short flight of stairs. Sara stepped out of their way and couldn't help but watch as they passed. Sarah, what are you doing here? Sarah started and turned her head back to the door. It was Chu, in the doorway, apparently directing the moving guys. She looked out of breath and sweat beaded her forehead. Uh, hi, I saw your status update. I wanted to talk, but you didn't answer your phone. She felt dumb standing there. Yeah, okay, no problem. Come in. I'm just standing here packing so we can move to fucking China. The last two words were directed indoors, upstairs somewhere. Who cares if I've never lived there? Let's go to my room. Chu led Sara inside and up the stairs. The inside was a mess of full boxes, half-packed boxes and bubble wrap everywhere. Even so, it looked like the house was still more than half full of stuff. They'd be lucky to finish by the next day. They went to Chu's room, which was more bare. Sara could see where posters had been by the adhesive stains on the walls, and the entire left side was piled high with boxes. Her desk was still in the room, as was the bed, although it was only a bare mattress now. Chu closed the door and they tried to make themselves comfortable. So, what's going on? asked Sara. And well, my dad was in the kitchen when it all went down and I think he saw the end of it. You know, the part where I was getting fucked standing up by a seven-foot werewolf. Sara shuddered. She remembered that all right. Well, he had an aneurysm or something because the rest of the night he was babbling about evil demons and angry gods and decided that it was wrong to have dragged his wife to the USA. So he called movers and here we are. I'm putting all my shit in boxes and getting on a plane tonight to live in a country that I'm not a citizen of since I was born here and don't speak more than ten words of. God, it's going to be horrible. Yeah, I guess. But at least you'll be safe, right? Oh, please. That may not have been how I planned to lose my virginity, but damn, if it's always like that, I should have done it long ago. God, the guys in China are all probably hung like mice. So, you're not in shock or anything? You don't feel like he took advantage of you? Are you kidding? Last night was the high point of my year. I don't know if it was Axe body spray or what, but that guy made me horny as fuck and he delivered. And did he look like he was in control? He went as nuts as us. Okay, so it went a little crazy at the end, but... Don't look at me like you didn't have a good time yourself. You must have come five times and it was your idea to tease him. What a bitch. You can't say he forced you to do that. Yeah, but he did something. He took advantage of me somehow. And I've never, you know, eaten out a girl before. That's not normal. Chu looked at her with pity. Not that you did a bad job. Have your parents been brainwashing you, telling you you got raped? Think back to last night, really remember, and tell me you didn't love every second. Sarah screwed up her mouth and gently allowed the memories to come back. How handsome Cameron had looked across the table. How she had teased his dick with her foot. He had teased her back in a similar way, brushing her nipple. How she had egged him on. How he had done what she asked. He really hadn't had his way with her at all. She had been the one daring him to escalate. And he had. I guess. She trailed off, not ready to say it. When you woke up this morning, how did you feel? Refreshed? Energized? Look at me. I pack it my whole room. Now that she thought of it, she had felt refreshed when she first woke up, and she hadn't had trouble getting out of bed. I did get a good night's sleep. Sarah, you have the look of a well-fucked girl. Look at you. You're showing off your boobs in that top, and you were even checking out our movers. Sarah couldn't help but smile. I guess I was. You were. Say you were. Chu leaned forward, insisting. I was checking out your movers. You wanted their big black dicks. Chu grinned from ear to ear. Oh, you racist, Sara said jokingly, and hit Chu with a pillow. Chu hit her back. Say it! Sara put the pillow over her head and smiled wider. I wanted their big black cock stuffed in my tiny white holes. At this, 
the two girls bust out laughing and rolled over in stitches. It was a couple minutes before they calmed down again. Sarah, I think you are well on the road to recovery. It's my tiny Chinese ass that's fucked, and not in a good way. Sarah shook her head at Chu. Oh, Chu, where have you been all my life? I had no idea you were such a potty mouth. Chu just rolled her eyes and said, White people. Sarah and Chu yakked some more about school and friends while the sounds of Chu's mother yelling at the movers drifted up from downstairs. They had a good hug and cried about Chu's moving away. Finally, it was time to go and they went downstairs to the front door. Sarah turned to Chu. Thanks for talking, it really helped. She smiled. Chu eyed her. You don't look 100% convinced to me. If you ask me, she leaned in close and said in a whisper, Maybe you just need to stop worrying and get good and fucked again. The movers chose this movement to pass by, and Sara thought they'd heard what Chu said. Chu and Sara burst out laughing again, hugged one more time, and said goodbye for the fourth time. Finally, Chu closed the door and Sara headed down the front walk with a bit of a spring in her step. She didn't need a ride from Chu's mum. The day was young, the sun was shining, and she was well fucked. Sarah headed home by way of the main street in their town and thought more about what Chu said. Maybe she did just need to get fucked again. She had had sex a few times before, but it was so different. There was much more fumbling with buttons and fasteners, more worrying about getting caught, much shorter, less intense. The boys she'd been with were always asking if they were hurting her, if it was okay if they did that, could she please do this? Fucking Cameron had been nasty, instinctual, and fun. He didn't feel the need to ask permission, and she liked that. If she was going to get fucked again, she doubted it could be with one of the regular boys from school. It would just be more of the same awkwardness and, well, pussiness from their end. What did that leave her? Older men. Gross. Better to have a kid her age scared out of his wits than a drooling old guy who can't get it up. If only she could be sure she got what she wanted. But there are no guarantees in life, she supposed. Sarah, having been lost in thought, realised she had taken a wrong turn off the main street and turned around to head back. She ran smack into a fat guy who'd been behind her, knocking herself over. He, with his larger mass, barely changed direction. Don't you kids watch where you're going? And he grumbled as he shuffled on his way. Sarah gave him the finger behind his back got up, brushed herself off, and looked at the door she was in front of. Magic within reach, read the stenciled letters on the window. Below the words was an 812x11 sheet of bright yellow paper, with words hastily written in sharpie reading, You deserve to get what you want. Sarah wouldn't normally go into a store with a geeky name like that, but she was trying to stop worrying, and she liked the sentiment on the sign. What the hell, she thought. It's true, and what else do I have to do today? She thought about who she would give a love potion to if she had one. She rattled off the various sports captains in her head. Craig, the quarterback. Josh, the star pitcher. Hmm, maybe Alex, swim team. Yum. When she pushed open the heavy door at the top of the stairs, her fears were mostly confirmed. The store was total goth central full of worn-looking objects with skulls on them, tacky jewellery with huge gems and even some creepy-styled objects that would look great on some goth's computer desk at home. The place was probably run by some senile old perv. At the moment, though, there wasn't anyone in sight, no customers and no clerks. Sarah made her way up to the cash register and rang the small bell there. Sarah heard the springs of a couch squeak, and much to her surprise, a young black man emerged from the door behind the counter. He looked surprised to see a customer. Uh, may I help you? Oh, she said. I thought you were going to be some old wizard man or something. The man smiled. He looked college age and had soft features, not at all like the burly movers this morning. He wasn't as gothy as she'd feared. He had those strap-covered S&M pants, but that was it. He was pretty cute, actually. He's off today, actually. I'm the, uh, summer intern. I'm Wayne. He scratched his head. You get college credit for working in a joke shop. 
Sarah thought he had it pretty good. He laughed nervously. This isn't a joke shop, this is the real thing. I get credit for my old English class by studying those ancient tomes all day. Fascinating volumes they are. Sarah looked at him sideways. What a geek. So what? You sell wands and flying broomsticks here. And books, enchanted rings, potions, that sort of thing. Although you're, uh, my first customer, people don't really come in much. And I deserve to get what I want. If that's what the sign says, he said, grinning at his shoes, not making eye contact. All you have to do is ask. That's what Ben says. Ben? The wizard you mentioned. Sarah sighed. And what if what I want is a potion to get a guy to fuck me? Sarah had never seen a black person go pale with fear, but Wayne did. Sarah giggled in her squeaky way. Well, ahem, he said, clearing his throat. We have a strict privacy policy and, well, yes. He looked like he wanted to say more. But what? Sarah asked. Well, he scratched his head again. I was just thinking that... I wouldn't think you'd need one. Sara took the question seriously, as opposed to as flattery. True, I could probably get into the swim captain's pants, but I don't want another fumble session where the guy can't figure out how to get my bra off. Maybe you should be more specific, Wayne said, sitting down on a stool and taking out a pad of paper and a pen. Sara was surprised it wasn't a quill and parchment, but maybe a bic and legal pad was more practical. He was turning red now, but he was keeping the conversation professional. Just tell me what you want and we'll see what we can do. Sarah felt nervous putting it into words, but she forced herself to. I don't want him to baby me, to worry if I'm having a good time or if he's not pleasing me enough. No nervousness. He should take what he wants. Wayne was nodding, writing and not looking at her. So sort of a bodice-ripping thing. Well, yes, but, you know, he can't go too far. I mean, he has to do what I say. Wayne paused, then continued writing. So he should be a little dumb. Follow your lead, but not question that lead and take initiative when possible. Sure, right. So, said Wayne, looking up. Like a trained animal. That stopped Sarah cold. Cameron had been a werewolf. She hadn't even thought about that since the morning, like her mind was avoiding the issue. Suddenly, the image of the werewolf with its cock buried in Chew's pussy came to her mind, and it made her nervous. Or wet? Yes, she said, and continued staring into space. But not, like, literally. Wayne laughed a little too loudly as he wrote, No, of course not, huh? He stopped writing. Is that about it? Yeah. Sarah said slowly, then snapped back to reality. Yeah, that's how I want it. You can just whip something up and make any guy do that. Wayne smiled again. The changes you mention are pretty trivial, actually. They align easily with core tendencies, so it's easy to just tweak a little of this and that and get what we want. That is, yes. OK, then I'd like one of those, please. And how will you be paying? Crap. Sarah hadn't taken her wallet when she left her house because she thought she was coming back again. All she had was her house keys and phone. Shit, I don't have my wallet on me. Wayne's face fell. Oh. Sarah had an idea. How about you just mix it up now and put it on the shelf and I'll come back later today and get it. I'm really curious to see how it's done. Well, the lab is actually in the back, but I don't see why we can't do that. Wayne went off through the door, then came out a moment later for the list, which he had forgotten on the counter. Sarah figured if she went home, got her wallet, and then came back, it would only take an hour. She felt like she needed to keep moving on this plan before too much time passed and she talked herself out of it. Best to text Alex and make a date with him soon. She could attach a picture of her cleavage if he forgot who she was. Sarah started taking selfies but didn't like the background too dark. A few minutes later, the door opened and Wayne emerged with a test tube filled with what looked like orange juice, 
except that smoke was billowing softly out of the top. That's it? She asked, staring at the tube, her wishes and dreams in liquid form. Yup, that's it. And I just spike his drink or something? You can do that, although it isn't necessary. It's very potent, and basically, as long as it comes into contact with part of his body, it'll work. And what, he'll just start banging away? No, there's a few minutes while the potion takes hold, then he's yours for a while. I'll just leave it on the shelf until you get back. I just need to find a cork. Actually, said Sara, biting her lip, can I see it? Up close. It's really pretty. She looked into his eyes. She stuck out her chest ever so slightly. Sure, he said, eyes darting down and then up. He brought the tube closer to her. See the swirls in it? That's the different ingredients that don't quite blend together. Their faces were less than a foot apart, separated by the small glass tube. She looked at him again. You're cute, you know. You just need to loosen up. And she hit Wayne's hand from below, splashing the contents of the tube all over him. Wayne shook the liquid off of him, spitting it on the ground. Smoke rose from his face and shirt where it had splashed. He gave Sarah a look that burned. You bitch! That's the spirit, she said. So what do you think on the counter? Wayne had a faraway look for a moment, then shook his head like something was rattling inside it. Uh, no, we have to go to the break room. I don't think your parents can afford to replace all the junk you'll break out here. God, are you even 18? Nope. Guess you'll have to keep this quiet then. Not too quiet, I hope, he added. Wayne shook his head again. He looked around desperately. Sarah moved behind the counter and passed Wayne on the way to the door. His eyes started losing focus and became dull. Something I'm forgetting. He mumbled to himself. His hand started grabbing at his crotch absently. Sarah thought for a moment. Maybe you should close the store. Lock up for lunch, she offered. Wayne's eyes snapped back to reality again. Yes! That's it! He made a small motion with his hand, and Sarah heard a clunk from the door. Cool, show me something else. Wayne was gasping now. He pushed Sarah somewhat roughly through the door. No, emergencies only. Not supposed to show off, he said, trailing off. As Sarah heard Wayne lock up the register with the last vestiges of his normal intelligence, she looked around the room. It looked more like a cheap den than anything else. It had a worn couch whose cushions were moulded to the shape of a couple decades' butts. On an end table was a book, presumably the one Wayne had been reading when Sarah came in. There was a small table with two chairs that had the remnants of lunch, a burrito and a soda. There were windows across one wall with Venetian blinds and an air conditioner in one. The room was otherwise lined completely with packed bookcases, whose shelves sagged under the weight of all the volumes. There was a door across from the one she had come in marked Lab Do Not Enter, in the same hasty sharpie writing that had first lured her inside. Sarah turned on the air conditioner and enjoyed the cool air blowing in her face until rough hands grabbed her boobs from behind, pulling her backward against a strong body. She let out a coo of pleasure. She couldn't help wondering, why did boys always go for the boobs first? The hands pulled hard, squeezing her tits against her chest. Fingers and thumbs found her nipples, and squeezed. She let out a moan. The hands loosened enough for her to turn around. Sarah could see a change that had come over Wayne. His eyes were dull and vacant, but there was an intensity of purpose that was impossible to miss. The muscles in his face were taut, making his face less soft and more angular. He pulled at her shirt in places. Why? This on, he said simply. Sarah put her finger to his lips, stifling a squeak. Better you don't talk or I'll be laughing too hard. But you're right. Without further ado, she crossed her arms and lifted the top off her body and undid her jeans, letting them puddle on the floor. She stepped out of each pant leg and sandal, leaving her nude. She saw his approval in the motion at his crotch. He grasped at it again, adjusting it. 
Sara knelt down and undid his S&M pants. Luckily, the straps were just for show. The actual waist was simple. She pushed them down his legs and reached into his boxers. She had wondered if, as a black guy, Wayne's dick would be huge like Cameron's, but it was regular sized. It was darker than the rest of him and thickly veined. A small amount of pre-cum was already dribbling from the tip. She was admiring the cock when Wayne put his hand on the back of her head and forced her mouth onto it. She didn't have much time to get it wet before he started forcing it all the way down her throat. He put his other hand on the back of her head too and started face-fucking her with short thrusts. Sarah leaned against Wayne with one hand, feeling his abs work. The other found her pussy and started rubbing the outer lips. She was soaking wet and her clit was a hard, sensitive nub. She could already force in two or three fingers easily. Sarah pushed against Wayne slightly and he slowed down almost immediately, allowing her to remove the cock from her mouth. Long trails of spit came with it. Ah, you're a good boy. You know what really good boys do? Eat pussy. She walked over to the couch and plopped on it, hearing the springs complain. She spread her legs wide and tressed her outer lips with her fingers. Wayne's ease were locked onto her cunt and he moved toward her like she was magnetic. He nearly tripped and realised his pants were still around his ankles, so he removed those and his shoes. Remember to get rid of that shirt, boy. Sarah had a chill of naughtiness. Calling him that, it was super bad. Wayne nodded dumbly and took off his shirt. He knelt on the floor in what looked like a near tumble and plunged his face into her box, overwhelming her with stimulus. He grabbed her ass with both hands, pushing her into his face. Ooh, she squeaked. Wayne lapped at her pussy, plunging his tongue inside her. He might not have a large cock, but he sure had a long tongue. It plunged deep inside her, driving her nerves wild and quickly pushing her toward orgasm. She was moaning constantly now, her voice getting higher and higher. Sarah pinched her nipples like he'd done, and the wave crashed over as his tongue dragged itself right across her clit in one long lick. Don't stop, she squealed. And he didn't, continuing to lick her in earnest. Finally, she came down from the high, breathing deeply. She pushed lightly at Wayne's head, and he looked up, face covered in her juices. She pushed forward off the back of the couch and licked his face, tasting him and her and all that salty wonderfulness. He stood up, lifting her with him. Even after he was standing, he continued to lift her. Sarah gave a cry of surprise at his strength. She hadn't expected him to be able to lift her so easily. Finally, her tits were in line with his face and he mashed his head in between them. Then he started licking and sucking at her nipples, while all she could do was hang on for dear life. Sarah felt his hands move between her legs and felt him spread her pussy lips apart. She lowered herself down and felt his cock bury itself in her snatch in one wet stroke. He grabbed her ass again and began to fuck her, bouncing her on his dick. Sarah found she didn't need to hold on anymore and let go of his shoulders. She closed her eyes and began to catch the next wave as he pounded into her. Suddenly he grabbed her tits again, squeezing them like he was milking them, sucking on her nipples at the same time. Sarah's eyes shot open and she flailed about for a moment, wondering how it was she hadn't fallen to the ground. She looked down at Wayne, and he stopped licking her nipples long enough to flash a big grin at her. He was using some sort of magical ability to keep her in the air. She hugged his head and pressed her nipple into his mouth. Oh, very good boy, very good. Sarah relaxed and leaned back onto nothing as Wayne continued to fuck her in midair. He leaned back as well, although he seemed to need to prop himself up on one of the chairs. He was sweating profusely now and began to grunt as his strokes became harder and deeper. Then he leaned forward and spun her on his cock so she was facing the floor and he was doing her from behind. He grabbed her ass and pounded with all his might while all Sarah could do was take it. Soon he let out a deep guttural groan and held her against his body. She felt his dick spasm inside her as he came. She flexed her kegels to say thanks. 
that earned her another groan and spasm from her good boy. Suddenly, whatever had been holding her up disappeared, and Sarah crashed to the floor ass first, her fall somewhat broken by the old carpet. Ow, asshole, watch what you're doing, bad boy! Sarah glared at Wayne, and he looked down at her sheepishly, his cock softening and dripping with cum. She couldn't feel bad for him for long. Two weekends later, Wayne's control had improved dramatically. Sarah still insisted that he use the potion because it helped him loosen up. They had tried having sex without it a couple times, and he was so nervous that he couldn't get it up. After that, she gave him a choice between having sex or keeping his full intelligence, and he gladly abandoned his mind temporarily for the chance to feel his cock buried in her pussy again. Sarah wished he could get over his problem and loosen up on his own, but for now this was the only way she could get satisfaction. Ma Wayne had just gotten off and let her down as gently as a feather in front of the air conditioner so she could cool off. She had been dropped a few times after their first encounter, but her orgasms were so good she was willing to put up with it. He knew his future sex life depended on mastering telekinesis, and he had clearly been spending all of his spare time practising. You've been a very good boy, do you think you can get me off again? Ne Wayne looked nervously at the door that led to the lab, beyond which was the area that Ben lived in. At this moment, Ben was sleeping, having left Wayne in charge of the store. Don't worry about the old man, he's not going to wake up. Come on, isn't there something new we can do? Wayne furrowed his brow in a parody of deep thought, and then brightened up. His cock gave a lurch too. Sarah liked the funny faces he made when he was on the potion. They were so cute. I guess so, huh? Sarah said. Wayne grinned madly and closed his eyes. Slowly, he opened them back up and looked at the door to the shop. Sarah looked over his shoulder but couldn't see anything. Then, around the corner and into the room, came a thick white rope hovering in mid-air. Ah, uh, Sarah said. Where'd that come from? Wayne just grinned and shrugged his shoulders as the rope continued to float through the door and into the room. Sarah stared at it and imagined all the things he could do with it. Sarah tried to sit back on the couch and wait for the rope to come, but she discovered that her feet were no longer touching the ground. Wayne had floated her a few inches in the air, and now she drifted to the centre of the room as the rope snaked its way toward her. It found her right foot, and the frayed end of the rope tickled the bottom of her feet. She squeaked at the sensation. It was soft and springy, not rough at all. Wayne watched as she hung in mid-air, the rope snaking around her calf and up her leg. He stroked his dick openly, and it was quickly regaining its hardness. The rope was up to her thigh, and it tickled her, driving her wild. She pulled on her nipples, trying to detract from the intense feelings coming from her crotch. This only doubled the stimulation and made her wetter. Oh, good boy, where did you learn this? Wayne shrugged simply and mumbled, Practice. The rope slithered over toward her pussy lips and it glided between them, rubbing against her clit directly. Sarah cried out, her orgasm sneaking up on her and taking her away without warning. The rope continued to pull along her pussy as she spasmed. She tried to pinch her nipples again, but discovered that the rope had wrapped around her wrists and was holding them apart. More length of rope had encircled each breast and held them apart, squeezing them slightly making them seem even larger than usual. Her nipples were diamond hard points that caught the wind of the air conditioner and made her shiver. Finally, the end of the rope was wrapped up and down each leg, holding her ankles apart. The loose end of the rope hung near her pussy, almost a penis of her own. She was completely immobilised. Wayne admired her form as the rope held her, stroking his now totally hard cock. He made a spinning motion with his left hand, and Sarah spun around in the air so her ass was pointed right at him. This time, when she spun, it wasn't gentle. It was like the rope was pulling her body around with it. This caused all sorts of rubbing, squeezing and slightly painful sensations where the rope touched her skin. She kept rotating until she was nearly facing the ground again, and once again Wayne approached her from behind. The ropes tightened and her legs were pulled wide apart to give him access. For the first time in a while, she was a little worried. She suspected that Wayne was a little kinky, but she didn't know how much, and with the potion, 
he didn't ask her permission, how far would he go? Mmm, she groaned. Gonna fuck me from behind again. He, you like that? His cock touched her pussy lips, causing a jolt of pleasure like a spark. She let out another squeal and tried to force her cunt onto his dick but was unable to move. He rubbed his dick up and down, getting it wet again, but he didn't push in. Be a good boy, fuck me, fuck me. She moaned in desperation, unable to move or even finger herself. He backed away and she readied herself, but Sarah was unprepared for the feeling of his dickhead against her anus. Oh, you naughty boy, you want my ass, she gasped. It was too late now, he was going to take her whether she wanted it or not. Hopefully he'd take it slow. Wayne pushed hard, his pussy juice slick dick trying to force its way into her tight hole. The ropes began to pull in the opposite direction, and the head of his cock poked inside. Sarah wanted to pinch her nipples, to rub her pussy, but she couldn't. Oh God, I'm so close. I just need to pinch my nipples and I'll come, oh God. He didn't respond and continued pushing his dick inside her. He seemed to much bigger than before. Her frustration built as all she felt was the pressure on her ass as he mindlessly forced his way inside her. Her juices were dripping onto the floor now. Finally, he bottomed out, his balls not quite brushing her pussy. He slowly pulled out, still only touching her with his dick, until only the head was inside. Sarah's clit felt like it was reaching out, trying to touch anything, even to steal a slight breeze from the AC unit. But no, she wasn't pointed that way. Wayne started fucking her with long, slow strokes, waiting for her ass to loosen up completely. I'm so close, oh God, Wayne, squeeze my nipples. Her voice was at its highest pitch now. She was going crazy. She felt movement on her tits and saw two small tendrils of rope that had unwound themselves from the main length and were snaking their way across the expanse of her flesh, toward the nipples. At the same, she felt the loosened end of the rope near her pussy stiffen, make its way toward her cunt. Oh God, yes, oh God, yes, she babbled watching the tendrils near her nipples. Make me come, make me come, make me come! Her voice rose to a shriek as the tendrils wrapped themselves tight around her nipples and the end of the rope plunged into her pussy. The short length fucked in and out with shallow thrusts. At the same time, Wayne grabbed her ass and fucked her hard, pulling himself deep into her ass. Amazingly, she didn't come right away and instead felt the wave crest higher as she felt the textured cords of the rope pump in and out of her pussy, vibrating against her walls. The threads at her nipples rolled up and down the hard points, causing shock waves to shoot from each one back down to her clit. Wayne continued fucking her until he pulled her ass tight against his dick, grinding it into him and groaning in a low rumble. Sarah felt his dick spasm again, and the rope in her cunt seemed to stiffen as well, and she came hard, arms and legs still outstretched, a cock deep in her ass and as good as another in her pussy. Her body was racked with spasms as she exploded harder than she ever had before, the pleasure cascading up and down her body, from her clit to her nipples and back again. It was a long time before she was aware of herself again. And then it was over. And after Wayne had withdrawn, the ropes went slack and fell off her body, and she was gently lowered to the ground. She stumbled over to the couch and lay down, Somewhat dazed still, she looked over at Wayne. He had downed the antidote he'd cooked up, which allowed him to return to normal instantly, instead of needing to wait for the formula to wear off. They had discovered early on that it could take hours depending on the dosage. He was shaking his head, his eyes regaining their clarity, the softness of his features returning. He looked over at Sarah, lying spread eagle and fanning her pussy and still gaping arsehole, and went pale again. She smiled. Yes, she sighed. A short time later, Sarah was buttoning up her jeans, walking a little crookedly. Wayne was already dressed and was admiring her as she finished putting herself together. She could feel his eyes moving up and down her body as she rearranged her shirt. He shifted as his pants started to become uncomfortable again and sipped a Coke. Oh, Wayne, are you going to get horny again? He shrugged. I just like watching. 
When I'm on that stuff, everything is sort of hazy. You know you're too uptight without it. We'd never get anywhere. You'd never try anything like you just did. I should slap you. Wayne looked at the floor where the rope lay limply. I was saving that for later, actually. I could have really messed that up and hurt you. Sarah leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. You're so sweet. Wayne turned his head and stole more of a kiss, reaching up to feel her breast. She gave him a little slap in the face for that. No more grabby grabby. Won't you be a gentleman and walk me home? Wayne stewed, looking at his shoes. She took a swig from his cola and saw him steal a glance as she arched her back to do so. Sarah thought perhaps the world's problems would be solved if only men had been the ones with the boobs. They couldn't seem to get enough of them. You're not worried about your dad catching us? Nah, he's totally clueless. But I gotta finish some stuff and close up the shop. Come on, Wayne, seriously, it's late and I'm worried. Wayne rolled his eyes. You're seriously worried about an animal attack. There's no cougar on the loose, at least none that wants to eat you. Three bodies had turned up in the past two weeks, including Crazy Dan, the local crazy guy who yelled unintelligible gibberish at everyone but who was actually kind of sweet and pathetic. He'd been mauled, guts spilled everywhere, by what the police were saying was probably a cougar scared into town from the mountains. So little was left of another of the corpses that it couldn't be identified except by a scrap of clothing nearby. It was found to belong to one Cameron Barnes, missing for four days previous. There was a giant outcry, a candlelight vigil, and a lot of wannabe sportsmen roaming around town lately. Sarah didn't buy that story for a second and had a pretty good guess what, or who, was really responsible. Walk me home, Wayne. This is part of being a good boyfriend. Boyfriend? I thought I was just your convenient drugged-up fuck buddy. Sarah turned beet red. Fuck buddy? Is that all you think you are to me? I like spending time with you. I gave you a chance. Twice to have sex like a normal person and you couldn't handle it. I was hoping that you'd loosen up eventually and we could stop using that stuff. It's expensive, right? Fuck you, I'll walk home myself. And she stormed out, making a big show of being barely able to open the heavy shop door. As she left, she could almost feel his eyes rolling as he got up, whining. Look, Sarah, I'm sorry. Cameron felt bone crunch and tried to ignore the sound as his body kept eating. He tried to resist the hunger as long as he could, even tried eating raw steak, but nothing worked. Every day he woke up feeling hungrier and looking hairier, and although he found he could resist his transformation for a while, eventually the hunger would win. When that happened, Cameron took a back seat, and the werewolf took the wheel, finding the closest victim and ripping them to shreds. He tried to focus on anything else, like how his breath jetted out of his nostrils and turned to steam in the cool spring air. After he fed, he would be human for maybe a few days, but it wasn't long before the hunger came creeping back. This was what? His fourth, fifth feeding? He had been proud of himself for putting himself in bad neighbourhoods late at night before the feeding became unbearable so that the victims would at least be people no one cared about. But the homeless wised up within a week and the werewolf had roamed back toward the main part of town when it hadn't found anyone. Now Cameron was dining on some poor old lady who'd been walking her dog. He tried to shut his mind against the memory of downing her poor little terrier in two bites before starting to work on her. He couldn't let this continue anymore, not when he was hurting innocent people. It was time to get help. Help? He thought as he crunched on a flimsy leg bone. That old fart fucked me up big time. This was no mere accident. This was an old wizard playing with a naive kid like a toy, ruining his life because he just wanted to see what would happen. Ben had suckered him in from the beginning, had let him bargain for a dose of pills, knowing full well that Cameron would take them all. He was probably gazing into a crystal ball, watching him eat this poor woman, cackling with glee. Even though the wolf was still feeding, Cameron let out a roar of rage. He suddenly stopped, never having been able to control his actions while transformed before. He looked around the alley where he'd dragged the body, and listened carefully to see if anyone had heard. 
All he could make out was the sound of two people arguing somewhere off in the distance, maybe a block or two away. As he calmed down, he felt the wolf start took over again to resume feeding. Cameron concentrated with all his might, trying to leave the bloody corpse, fighting the beast inside him that was licking its chops at what little meat was left. He pulled, starting to back away slowly, but a light gust of wind brought the scent of meat to his snout, and he pounced back on the body, finishing it off. Were he human, he would have cried. He didn't want to do this, it wasn't his fault. He'd been following the news as best he could, snatching newspapers out of recycle bins, and he knew the authorities were officially looking for a cougar, but he thought that might be a cover story. They might know exactly what was going on and were covertly seeking him out at this very minute. And they would surely execute him. He was a serial killer now. He had to get to Ben. Ben had to fix him. Having consumed what little meat was on the lady's old bones, Cameron was able to turn his head away and he felt himself gain more control over his body. He started to feel full again and he felt his body start to relax, start to transform back to human. He no longer felt pain during his transformations, just the dull ache of his bones stretching and compressing. Cameron hid in the shadow of a fire escape, waiting to return to human. He breathed heavily, the rasp of his throat loud in his ears. There was no living thing nearby, not even a stray cat. He looked up between the buildings, seeing a few washed out stars in the sky. He closed his eyes, waiting for his body to return to normal. These days, normal wasn't what it used to be. He was always somewhat pumped up, like an athlete. He had used to want to be this way all the time, but it didn't make him happy now. It was only a sign of what was wrong with him, that in a few short days, he'd be tearing into another helpless victim. Finally, he felt his body calm, his stomach full. He would be fine, at least for a little while. He opened his eyes again. He saw the pile of blood and bones near his feet, and his rage at Ben returned. He let out another involuntary yell, but before he could stop himself, it had become a roar again. His nose had started lengthening into a snout and his hair grew out suddenly. He almost roared again in panic. He was really losing control now. He tried to calm himself, tried to breathe slowly. In, out, in, out. It worked a little, and he felt his features start to shrink again. The constant push and pull of his bones was aching. He needed to go to the store now. Cameron started down the alley toward the main street, trying to keep calm. He tried not to think about his situation, how fucked he was. Of course, that got him going again, and the dull ache of his jaw told him he was failing to keep control. He would have to go down the street partially transformed, there was no other way. The store was only three blocks away, and with everything so empty and quiet, he had a good chance of making it. Benedict was fast asleep. Now that the two lovebirds had finally left, he'd been able to get some rest. Ah, to be young again, he'd thought as he drifted off. It was soon, though, far too soon, that he was suddenly awoken. One of his basic security spells had detected something abnormal approaching the shop, and it was getting closer. It was Cameron. Benedict sighed and fished around for his glasses. He jammed them quickly on his nose and put on a robe. He entered his shop and stood behind the counter like he was minding the store. He waited. Even at his age, he could hear the sound of heavy footfalls as Cameron came up the stairs. The sound was much louder than it should be. There was no way that this Cameron was the same boy who had come through his door a few short weeks ago. Benedict heard the footsteps reach the door, then pause. The door crashed open with a sound like an explosion. The top hinge broke in half, and the door leaned precariously on the remaining bottom one. If Benedict hadn't cast a few quick protection spells, when was getting ready, the sound would have woken the dead. Well, not literally. Through the doorway strode a tall figure. Cameron was larger than Ben had thought he would be, his head stooping slightly so as not to touch the top of the doorway. His eyes seemed to glow yellow in the dim light, his teeth were bared and were dripping red. The fur on his front was matted all over with blood, with small rivers flooding down his muscles. You old fucker, he roared. 
he lifted his arms, his claws glinting in the light from the street. Ben's face fell. Oh, dear gods, he sighed. It is as I feared. Cameron smashed a glass cabinet with one arm. The glass cut his paw-like hand, releasing blood that mixed with what was already on him. As you feared, look what you've done to me. I'm a monster and a murderer. Cameron Barnes, I told you the pills were very powerful. I told you not to take more than four. Cameron crossed the shop at great speed, knocking over small tables as he leaped. Before Ben could react, a strong hand was around his neck from across the counter. A claw came into view, dangerously close to his face. You did this, you fucker. This is your fault. Fix me. If not... Benedict was trembling now. He felt the blood drain from his face. Cameron didn't seem to have much control over himself, and he might just get his throat slit if he wasn't careful. Please, boy. Please, I beg you, calm down. I will fix you. Yes, I will fix you. Cameron released him slowly, still showing his claws. Benedict looked down at the hand that had smashed the cabinet, noticing the blood that was still flowing. You're bleeding, he said. Cameron grawled lowly, pulling the hand away and taking a step back. This is important, he tried to explain. Natural werewolves are self-healing. You appear not to be. What's the point? barked Cameron. Benedict tried to calm himself. He needed to try to explain. This will help me formulate a cure. Cameron, this is extremely complex magic we are dealing with. We will need to be careful. I will help you, I promise. I couldn't possibly stay in business by leaving my customers unsatisfied, could I? Unsatisfied? roared Cameron. Ben shook his head. He needed to watch his words. I'm sorry, I understand this is a horrible side effect. There's no need to worry about payment, naturally. I will find a way to cure you. I will work on nothing else until that's done. But you need to calm down. I can't possibly work if you're threatening to eviscerate me at every moment. Cameron grumbled something suggesting confusion. Benedict grimaced. Eviscerate means do whatever you did to the person whose blood you're wearing. Now I need to run some tests back in the lab. I need a small sample of your fur. Cameron gripped his arm and ripped a patch of fur off. He barely flinched doing it. His yellow eyes never strayed from Benedict's face. Now please wait here while I go. This may take a little while. Please try to remain calm. I'm not going far. I'll be back soon. He turned to leave but thought of one more thing. And Cameron, please try not to destroy any more of my shop while I'm gone. While Cameron was waiting for the old man to return, he tried to calm himself down. He sat in a big easy chair low behind the clerk's counter and breathed slowly and deeply, trying to empty his mind of hateful thoughts. As a large wolf-like creature dripping in blood, this probably looked absurd from the outside, but he closed his eyes and willed himself to believe old Ben, believe that he would figure this out and cure him. Slowly he felt his body deflate, his teeth dulling and his face squeezing flat. He barely felt any aching at all this time. He continued breathing slowly, noticing the changes to his body in subtle detail. He felt the fur retracting into his skin, a strange tickling sliding motion. For a moment, he willed it to pause. And it did. Cameron didn't open his eyes or change his breathing. He tried pulling his fur in again. Slowly, the tickling feeling returned and the fur disappeared from his body. He was probably human in appearance now. He continued his slow breaths, trying to feel every part of his body, trying to discern if he was human just by the feel of his feet, his hands and his head. He thought he was. He found he could still feel the sharp teeth inside his head, as if they were behind his human teeth. If he pictured it, he could imagine his claws inside his hands, in his fingers. They weren't actually there if he touched his hands, but in his head he could feel them. All over his body, he could feel the fur near the surface of his skin, ready to push out again. It was like he could feel the wolf inside his body, just underneath his human exterior. And then, just as an experiment, he tried to push the fur out. A small amount slid out smoothly, barely a tickle at all. He kept pushing. The wolf emerged from under the shell of his human form, like a swimmer climbing out of a pool. 
Along with the fur, his claws, teeth, face and altered body appeared too. Cameron's eyes were still closed, but he could feel himself in full wolf form. It was easiest to know what state he was in by the feeling of his mouth. His large, tooth-filled muzzle was very different from his short, dull-toothed human mouth. The wolf form felt like it was a costume on the outside of his body. A second skin. He was still human, he thought with a sigh of relief, although it came out as a growl. He now knew he could remove the costume, pulling it back inside him. The teeth, the claws, they didn't scare him anymore. They were fake, for show. His real body was still inside. There was the sound of footsteps from behind the door, and Cameron pulled in the costume of the wolf, feeling himself shrink and change back to human. It was getting easier. He smiled slightly, knowing he had mastered at least one aspect of his curse. The door opened and old Ben shuffled out. He was wearing his apron, which was splattered with some orange substance, and his fingers were somewhat purple. Cameron looked up at the old man expectantly. Ben's eyes darted over Cameron's human form, then briefly around the shop. Ah, good, yes. Human again. And you haven't destroyed my shop. Thank you very much, Cameron. He paused, smiling widely. I have good news. There is a cure, so that's very good indeed. But first, I can help you understand the nature of your predicament a little better. Cameron tried not to get upset at old Ben's light tone, but felt the wolf trying to emerge anyway. It seemed it was as upset with the situation as he was. He didn't let it come out, though, keeping the fur pulled back and under his skin. For now, he had good control, but he wondered if it'd still be so easy after a few days of not feeding. You are not a natural werewolf by any means. One aspect of werewolves is their powerful physique, and it was this trait that I had tapped into to create the pills you took. But merely making you a part werewolf wouldn't have been very useful. You would only have been able to use the pills at the full moon, for instance. So I tempered the werewolf nature with other spells to allow you to change at any time. Similarly, a werewolf is deathly allergic to silver and wolfsbane, so I worked in some magic which fixed those problems. Lastly, werewolves are naturally self-healing, and I could have left that ability in the potion. However, you were very rude and cheap, and so I mitigated that effect as well. Cameron grunted. These are all things I already knew and expected to find, and indeed, when I tested your fur, I confirmed all of these properties. The mystery was that of your need to feed and your inability to stop transforming as your hunger increases. After careful analysis, I think the reason is because although you are not a true werewolf, now you are slowly becoming one. Werewolves create other werewolves by bite, and although you were not bitten, the pills did contain minute amounts of werewolf blood. Your immune system was able to fight what it sees as an enemy, and you turn back to human. When you took too many pills, however, your body was not able to handle the invasion and the werewolf blood established itself in your system. Luckily, the amount is still small enough that you are not nearly 100% werewolf. Yet. The trouble is, the werewolf blood running through your veins is growing stronger, asserting itself more every day. Eventually it becomes powerful enough to force you to feed, which gives it the magical energy it needs to continue growing. Cameron, every time you feed, the werewolf will take more control. My petty spells will quickly fail, and you will be a monster permanently. You will be a werewolf for the rest of your life, and that life may be very short. Natural werewolves are very rare for the simple reason that they have been nearly hunted to extinction. You need to resist feeding in any way you can, or find some other way to satisfy the hunger that doesn't give the werewolf blood the magical energy it needs to grow stronger. But keep your chin up, young man, because I wish to emphasise this is curable. You're not a werewolf yet. We can still cleanse your blood of the beast in this relatively early stage. So, Cameron interrupted, why the long speech about being an ugly beast for the rest of my life? Just give me the pill and I'll take it. Old Ben took his glasses off his nose and began rubbing them with his shirt. It is a very complex spell, and I don't have all the ingredients. Moreover, some of them are very rare and difficult to find. And frankly, I am an old man. I am in no shape to go on a spell-collecting expedition. 
The old man looked up. Cameron understood and leaned back in the chair, staring at the ceiling. You want me to find them for you? No, said the old man forcefully. For you. This is something you must do. If you like, consider it your punishment for those people you've snuffed. I will guide you where I can. You won't be completely on your own for this little quest. I can probably lend you someone that can help at times. Cameron grimaced. It was probably only fair. Benedict held out a scrap of paper. It looked like a grocery list. Cameron didn't even look at it. He went to put it in his pocket and then remembered that he'd been nude for hours. Old Ben seemed to know what he was thinking. Why don't I get you a pair of pants? I think I have something in your size. He looked at Cameron. Your current size, anyway, he muttered, going back through the door. Thanks, grunted Cameron after him. Soon Cameron was dressed in a pair of baggy jeans, which on his muscled form were not so baggy as they were meant to be, and an old white t-shirt that looked like it had been used as a rag. The shirt was small, and his biceps pushed the sleeves practically to his shoulders. He put the list in his pocket. Do you have a safe place to stay? asked Ben. You could stay here, but I'd have to lock you in the basement. We could find you a mattress to sleep on. Cameron shook his head. I've got a place I can get there, but I could use another normalcy charm. The last one blew up. Ben asked why it had blown up, and Cameron explained that it happened when he transformed the first time. Ben seemed lost in thought for a moment, then nodded and went into the back of the store, rummaging around. When he returned, he held an amulet which appeared identical to the last. I speculate that the charm was too weak to make a transformed werewolf appear normal to a large group of people. This one should be more resilient, but it still has its limits. I would not attempt to transform on national television and expect the amulet to function. It will also cloak your identity, so no one should recognise you as the supposedly deceased boy. Wow, but the last one also worked through clothing not just skin to skin. Ah yes, of course, there's a fix for that issue. Ben mumbled a few words, and the amulet glowed briefly. Sorry about that. Sometimes the spells need a little patching up. Cameron put on the necklace and headed toward the front door, which was still off its hinges. Ah, sorry about the door and stuff and everything. Old Ben smiled. This situation is both our faults, Cameron. We shall both learn greatly from the experience. Cameron grimaced. Thanks, he said, and walked out the doorway. Rays of light coming through the blinds finally woke Cameron up. He squinted, wishing like he did each morning that the place had shades instead. He pushed himself up off the mattress, still in the old clothes that Ben had given him three days ago. He went downstairs to the kitchen to look for something to eat. He groaned when he looked in the freezer. TV breakfasts, TV lunches and TV dinners. None of it appealed to him. What he could really go for was something savoury, juicy, some fresh... meat. Uh-oh. Cameron felt the wolf inside him smile and lick its lips. He forced himself to pick one of the Hungryman breakfasts and stick it in the microwave. A few minutes later he had eaten the whole thing. But it hadn't helped. He was still hungry. He sat in the kitchen looking around the room. The trash was piling up and it was starting to stink. He sniffed again and realised his clothes were starting to stink too. Maybe it was time to buy some detergent for the washing machine. He'd been here long enough that he'd have to start taking care of the place if he wanted to stay. But how long could he stay here, really? Cameron had found the house the very first night he'd turned. He'd been blindly running away from the restaurant, keeping to the shadows and the darkest streets he could find. He'd found himself in Sarah's neighbourhood, the one that was so dark because so many houses were foreclosed or never sold. There was one that seemed far from any lights at all, and he'd broken in through the back door. When he'd woken up the next morning, he had found that the place was still livable, the lights worked, and to his surprise, the faucets did too. It even had most of the furniture. The only sign that anything was wrong was the total mess in the bedrooms. Someone must have packed very quickly and left with only a few suitcases. Cameron knew he should be working on finding Ben's ingredients, but he was too paranoid about being discovered squatting in the house. He probably should have taken Ben up on his offer. 
being locked in a basement would be preferable to this house arrest. He spent most of his time hiding and waiting for the hunger to return. He kept the windows shaded and didn't dare to turn on any lights. He didn't even open the fridge at night. He could go for a few days without eating and be all right. But sooner or later, the wolf forced him to hunt. Once, after he fed on a homeless man, he discovered a significant amount of cash in the guy's tattered coat. He snuck out the next day and bought as many TV dinners and 12 packs of soda as he could carry. Thanks to his muscled condition, that was quite a lot. He ate the dinners but didn't know what to do with the boxes. He didn't dare leave trash on the curb of a supposedly abandoned house. TV dinners and soda cans were piled high all around the kitchen. If he bought some trash bags, he could probably stuff all the junk in them and leave them in a dumpster somewhere. He still had a little money left over from his first shopping trip, but he'd need more if he was going to start buying detergent and trash bags. And so that led to the question, how long could he stay? What was he going to do? Start paying the electricity bill? Sooner or later, the microwave's clock would blink out, and that would be that. He just hoped he could find all the items on Ben's list before then. His stomach growled and he started to sweat. He could feel the wolf beginning to get restless. He took out the list again, looking at the items on it. He hadn't heard of anything on it. How was he supposed to find them? He might just have to contact. There was a sound at the door. Someone was putting a key in the lock and turning it. Cameron looked quickly around. The basement door was right behind him. He'd be trapped down there, but the front door was opening, so that was the only option. He got up, opened the door, and crept down the stairs with the lights off. Shit! Came a woman's voice from the front hall. <laughs> now that he thought about it, he should have just run out the back door, but it was too late now. He stepped slowly into the basement, trying not to make a sound. He knew the layout roughly, having explored it soon after he found the house. It was barely finished, with plain plaster walls and a wall-to-wall -wall carpet. The floor was literally covered with toys of all shapes and sizes. It was like someone had bought one of everything fluffy and bouncy from Toys R Us and thrown it all down here. Toward the far end of the room the toys were piled high, almost two feet deep. The coating of toys thinned out closer to the stairs, and you could see much of the carpet beneath. Right now it was pitch black, and he decided to just stop rather than risk stepping on a toy that squeaked. He listened intently to the sounds coming from upstairs. He heard the sound of shoes, like high heels, filter down through the ceiling. They were moving toward the kitchen. The woman's voice said something Cameron had trouble making out, but he definitely heard the word, squatters. He heard a sigh, and then the shoes walked out of the kitchen and up the stairs. Cameron stood perfectly still, hardly daring to breathe. Somehow the former owner of the house was back, which made no sense. He'd seen the foreclosure sticker, and didn't the bank usually change the locks after that? Clearly the authorities were neglecting their duties. This woman had opened the door with her old key. Maybe she was back to get some stuff she'd left behind after she cleared out so fast. Now that she was finding all his trash, Cameron knew he was screwed. If she checked the whole house, she'd find him here in the basement and call the cops. Heck, she'd probably call the cops anyway now that she found all his crap. What was he going to do? A rumble from his stomach provided an answer. Yes, that was one way to deal with the problem. He could sate his hunger and deal with the situation quickly. Cameron shook his head trying to think with something other than his stomach. Eating her would be the stupidest thing he could do. The wolf blood would be stronger and this woman would certainly have family that would notice her missing. It was getting harder to ignore the wolf's hunger though. He could feel the fur trying to push its way out of his skin. If he hadn't learned how to control his transformation, she'd already be dead. He'd just have to hope she'd get what she came for and leave. He'd have to clear out that night taking whatever he could carry from the fridge. Maybe he'd be lucky enough to find another house close by with power. Although, he thought with resignation, he should probably just take old Ben up on his offer. Cameron slowly sat down in the dark where he was, not sure of his balance. He carefully felt around him for the nearest wall and scooted himself over to it and sat there, leaning against a doll of some sort. He was starting to shake a little from keeping the wolf under control. 
He couldn't hear the footsteps at all now, not since she'd gone upstairs. He felt his ears twitch, wanting to becoming larger and pointed. He knew he could hear better when he was in wolf form. He waited, concentrating on remaining human, keeping the wolf inside him. From upstairs, he heard the footsteps clomping back down the stairs and into the kitchen. He was covered in sweat now, his t-shirt damp. He was having trouble focusing on the sounds he heard. There was lots of shuffling and shifting of furniture and objects. And then, to Cameron's dismay, the basement door opened. Light leaked down to where he sat and he looked around for any hope of escape. There was none. He doubted he'd be able to escape if he wanted to. He was trying so hard to ignore his stomach. Then, the light flicked on. Cameron was blinded by the sudden brightness and squinted his eyes. He heard a couple footsteps and then a woman's head leaned below the ceiling and found him. The face looked younger than he'd expected, perhaps over 30, with a sketch of worry lines, but she'd still get carded. He expected her to scream or whip out her cell phone and call 911, but instead she looked at him with puppy dog eyes. Oh, you poor bastard, what a mess you are there. She had a slight southern twang which instantly made her seem nice. Cameron hoped she was. If she made the wrong move, well, he knew what would happen to her whether he meant to do it or not. She stood up and continued walking down the stairs, giving him a nice view of her long legs and black steel-toed combat boots. Cameron was too far gone to think and couldn't help but stare. She had on black pocket-covered pants that were loose toward the cuffs and grew enticingly more tight as they went up. As she descended, Cameron saw she had on a racing-style jacket covered with zippered pockets. It was thick and tough-looking, but hugged her curves like a motorcycle on the road. She moved over to him, arms outstretched. She was babbling on about how he must be on drugs, how it wasn't his fault, how she would get him cleaned up. Cameron nodded dumbly through all this, not really able to pay attention to what was being said. He was using every ounce of his energy not to change and didn't have anything left to do much else. She helped him get slowly up and started walking him toward the stairs and he became dizzy. The next thing he knew he was sitting in the kitchen as she did something at the counter. He noticed a motorcycle helmet on the table next to him and a cell phone next to that. Not call cops, he managed. She looked over her shoulder and smiled. It lit up her face and her somewhat spiky blonde hair swished. Nah, I just came back to get some of my shit. Nothing's missing, so you can stay if you want. It's not my place anymore, anyway. Cameron sighed. A scent caught his nose. His stomach rumbled. Thanks, he breathed. Lana. Thanks, Lana. That's what you mean. Lana, he breathed again. He could smell her. She was fresh, alive, warm-blooded, good meat, so much better than he'd been having out of boxes, microwaved on high for five minutes. The taste was in his mouth now. The wolf wanted to eat her. She didn't deserve it, though. Better some bum than a nice woman like Lana. Gotta get out, he said. No, stay, it's okay, really. Have a burger. She turned around, revealing a plate with a little hamburger on it. Cameron nearly passed out with relief. It was just a regular old burger he'd smelled. He now saw a paper bag of groceries on the counter where she'd been working. He took the plate and had finished the burger almost before the plate touched the table. It helped, just a bit. Seconds, he said with a full mouth, indicating his empty plate. Jesus, kid, y'all are hungry. Have mine, I'll make more, said Lana, taking the plate. You want tomato? Sure. She served up another burger on a bun, and Cameron saw how she placed the patty, just so on the bun so it was lined up right. Then she cut a slice of tomato and lined that on top of the patty. It was cute. Cameron did his best to eat slower this time, feeling himself growing stronger against the wolf with each bite. He must just be able to resist the urge to feed long enough to get out, or wait until Lana left. Cameron, he said between mouthfuls of burger. She was cutting more slices of tomato and stopped, mid-slice. Hmm, she said. My name. 
and then Cameron realised he was supposed to be dead. Oops. He should have come up with an alias by now. I thought that's what you said, said Lana, still looking down. Cameron wasn't sure what happened next. The wolf inside him seemed to panic and the lurch, pulling his body with it. Next thing he knew, he was on the floor, tumbled out of his chair. The wolf was growling with anger. It lurched again and he had only enough time to look up where he'd been sitting to see the large knife. Red bits of tomato dripping off it, vibrating in the wall. Before he knew it, Cameron's body was throwing itself down the stairs to the basement. He lay at the bottom of the stairs, his slow human brain still back in the kitchen trying to put the pieces together. He rolled over and peered up toward the kitchen. The wolf inside him howled with rage, insisting that he run, that he let it take over. It knew what to do, but with his stomach momentarily sated, Cameron maintained control. The sounds of those boots, why had he assumed they were dress heels, came closer and the wolf only allowed him a glimpse before it pulled him away from the stairway and into the basement. All Cameron needed to see was Lana coming around the corner, pulling a sleek, deadly throwing knife from one of her many pockets. Cameron found himself at the opposite side of the basement, backed against the wall. He was breathing rapidly, fighting with the wolf inside him. It wanted so badly to rip this woman to shreds, to gnaw on her bones until there was nothing left. Maybe that wasn't a bad idea. Lana appeared at the top of the stairs and the wolf reacted again, leaving another blade quivering in the chest of a large stuffed bear next to him. You all must think you're pretty fast, she called. She slowly walked down the stairs, her eyes never straying from his. It won't matter. You were mine since I opened the door. You should have got me then. Instead, you were stupid and let the cute girl cook you lunch. How dumb do you have to be? as if anyone would feel sorry for your ass. She threw again, and again the wolf in Cameron dodged. This time it wasn't quite quick enough. He felt pain on his left cheek, and knew that a trickle of blood was escaping down his face like a tear. Lana smiled. This time the smile darkened her face. That ought to do it. Those knives are silver. Yeah, I know what you are. It's nothing personal, you little shit. You piss off the wrong people, you're gonna get it. She sauntered into the room a few paces and kicked a rubber ball out of the way, apparently ready to watch him die. It's weird though, you don't look like I expected, but you gave your name away easy enough. But Cameron barely felt any pain and the wolf's rage boiled over. Cameron let it win and he groaned and pushed with all his might, forcing the fur out of his body. He felt his face stretch and the sharp teeth explode into his mouth. His nose flattened and instantly picked up the scent of his own blood. At this, the rage increased. He flexed, straining his upper body like a weightlifter in competition. The muscles pulsed and grew, coiling around his limbs like constricting snakes. His chest inflated, pushing against the flimsy t-shirt until it exploded off his back. He crouched, feeling his legs grow until they popped the buttons off his pants, the jeans splitting up the seat. His tail spilled free from somewhere in his body, out the ruined jeans. Usually when Cameron needed to feed, he took a back seat while the wolf took complete control. This time, he and the wolf seemed to share his body equally. He smiled his thin canine lips, revealing his dripping fangs to the would-be assassin across the room. Lana had turned white as a ghost and was almost completely frozen, loosely holding a knife in her hand. You were supposed to die, you bastard, she yelled, her voice wavering. She threw the knife, but Cameron dodged it easily. He'd forgotten how much smaller things seemed when he was a wolf. She was like a child pestering him. This was going to be fun. He turned to pull the knife out of the wall, but stopped when he saw his clawed hand. He had ten little knives to kill her with, and he had better control with any one of them. Why sink to the human's level? Instead, he dragged his claws across the wall, making five deep gouges in the cheap drywall. Lana made to throw another knife, but didn't. He didn't flinch. Are you going to waste all your knives trying to hit me? He growled, his voice rumbling in his barrel chest. She put on the best game face she could and changed her grip on the knife, ready for a close quarters fight. 
Cameron moved toward her slowly, bent low, his claws up in front of him. He moved from side to side, circling her, toying with her. He kicked toys out of his way and used one of his toes to spill the foam guts of a stuffed animal onto the floor. She tried to keep her eyes on his, mirroring his moves, but she saw how he had eviscerated the toy without the merest thought. Cameron wondered how she could look into the round yellow eyes of a beast and think she could win. Did someone tell you those silver knives would kill me no matter how small the cut? He boomed. She jabbed at him, but he jerked out of the way. The wolf was enjoying playing with his food, but it wanted to eat soon. You must not know, he continued, enjoying hearing the low rumbling tones the wolf produced. I'm not a natural werewolf. I change when I please, and I'm not harmed by silver. She jabbed again, catching him in the side. It stung. Much. He slashed with his clawed hand, tearing through her jacket at the arm, drawing blood. She yelped in pain, dropping the knife. He picked her up and threw her at the far wall, which she crashed into, creating a large dent. She landed deep in a pile of toys, her arms and legs splayed out. She struggled trying to get up, tripping on the loose items and landing back on the layer of foam and fur. She looked at him and he saw her tremble in fear. The wolf wanted to finish this poor excuse for an adversary, but Cameron wouldn't let it. The wolf seemed almost to pout like a kid not allowed his candy and he roared, leaping across the basement in one stride and pouncing her where she lay. He threw his body weight on her, pressing her into the soft layer of stuffed toys. The wolf wanted to finish her, but he didn't want to, not quite yet. He grabbed her wrists, holding them to the carpet. You're not so fast anymore, he growled at her. What happened? Scared of the big bad wolf? Her arms barely struggled against his grip, or perhaps her struggles had hardly any strength compared to him. Maybe I let you catch me, she whispered. Maybe I have a surprise for you. Like what? Some kind of trap, he said. Maybe she had a spring-loaded knife hidden in her jacket. Cameron restrained both her hands with one of his and began to paw at her roughly, trying first to unzip her pockets, and then, when his paws proved too imprecise for that, simply tearing them open with his claws. He removed knife after knife, throwing them behind him into a growing pile next to the wall. No surprise that I can see he said to himself as he threw another blade on the pile with a clang. With each tear, her jacket became more shredded until it hung in tatters off her body. Lana was starting to look a little lightheaded. A sheen of sweat covered her skin and she breathed rapidly, the sports bra she had underneath catching his eye. Her nipples were hard points beneath the fabric. Oh, well maybe you're the one with the surprise, she breathed and Cameron saw that she wasn't looking at his face anymore. He followed her gaze down and saw that she was staring at his crotch. His package had been exposed after his pants had ripped, but he'd been too caught up in the fight to care. He looked back to her face and saw what he'd seen weeks ago in Jess right before she jumped him. Cameron leaned back, releasing Lana's hand slowly. He thought she'd reach for another blade, but she remained still. She lay back in the sea of toys and lazily moved one hand over her breast, lifting it slightly. The other hand snaked down between her legs, cupping her crotch and rubbing slowly. His magic was still working. He had assumed after he turned into a werewolf that the effect would go away, but clearly Lana was under the full effect of the attraction spell. He looked at the blood drying on her arm where he'd nicked her. Skin-to-skin -skin contact. She'd reacted normally to him until he'd grazed her, and now she was getting the full effect. He sat on his haunches and pulled his cock fully free from his ruined pants. Lana gave a little sigh and rubbed her nipple through the fabric. He looked back at the athletic woman, her chest heaving, her eyes locked on his dick. It started to harden rapidly. You want this? He carefully grasped the ridged pink dick with one clawed hand and stroked it slowly. A small amount of pre-cum oozed from the tip. She nodded dreamily. Cameron laughed at her, a cruel sound. The werewolf didn't seem to want to kill her anymore, so he decided to let it have a little more control and see what it'd do. The werewolf stood up, its chiselled form towering above her. The bright cock, 
veins pulsing as it stiffened, was still leaking clear fluid. The werewolf leaned its head back, its barrel chest pushed out like it was going to howl at the moon. Instead, it hawked up a spitball, projecting it onto its cock and splattering the woman's face. Lana coughed and spluttered while it rubbed the thick substance into the length of its meat. You said you want it, so here it is, roared the beast, grabbing her head and stuffing its cock into her mouth. It forced her mouth onto its dick roughly with shallow strokes. Lana's arms flailed wildly, then found the wall to hold onto. She made gagging noises as the long dick got harder and the werewolf was able to push it farther down her throat. Eventually it was balls deep and holding her head against its crotch. It held her there for a few moments, closing its eyes and enjoying the sensation, until Cameron felt something cold against his balls. He looked down and saw that Lana was holding yet another knife against him. She tapped it gently a couple times and looked at him with fire in her eyes. Cameron relented, letting go of her head. She pulled her mouth off his dick, spitting to clear her throat. She wiped her face with one arm, still holding the blade against his sack. You know, she said, normally if you'd tried what you just did, I would have already made you scream. But my pussy's aching and you're gonna get me off. Now lean back or I cut off your balls. Cameron narrowed his eyes. You should know werewolves can heal themselves. She glanced at his side. I ain't as stupid as you, kid. Y'all still bleeding. Cameron knew he was beaten for now and leaned back onto the floor. He wouldn't let the werewolf take charge again if he wanted to keep his manhood intact. Still pressing the cold steel to his balls, Lana spun and swung her leg over his body, sitting on his chest facing his dick. She leaned over and stretched, pointing her ass at his face. A hand appeared from below and cupped her pussy through the material, rubbing it madly. The cloth was already damp at the crotch. Lick me, asshole, she said. Your pants are but Cameron felt the steel press harder. Slowly, he leaned his head forward, took one claw and tore the pants down the ass crack, careful not to nick her. He grasped both sides of the tear with his paws and tore it open wide, revealing her dripping shaved pussy and winking asshole. Cameron's cock was rock hard, but she wouldn't touch it. There was only the feeling of the cold blade on his sack. His nose filled with the scent of her, and he plunged his snout between her legs lapping up the juices. His long, canid tongue was adept at swirling all around her pussy lips, driving her wild. Her ass twitched and tensed and he had to hold onto her firm globes to keep his snout against her pussy. His cock ached for contact. Sometimes he felt the knife leave his dick momentarily, but she always seemed to remember herself and resumed pressing it against him. If he was going to retake control of the situation, he'd have to get her off. Cameron redoubled his efforts, trying to figure out what licks would cause her to lose concentration the most. He found she didn't mind direct stimulation of her clit, and concentrated on keeping it busy. He kept that up for a while and then gave her whole pussy a long, wide lick from top to bottom. Oh, she moaned, and the hand not holding the knife grabbed his stiff cock, squeezing it hard. Lick it, growled Cameron, and resumed his attentions on her cunt. Soon he felt her lips on his dick, kissing it gently. She was kissing the odd ridges and bulges on the strange cock. The knife wasn't being pressed quite so hard against him anymore. Her ass had stopped flailing around so much, but it was clear that Lana was getting close to coming. Her pussy seemed to be flexing a little, and every so often her ass would give a little shake. Suddenly she stopped kissing his dick and said, Oh God, stick that long tongue in me. Fill me with that tongue. Suck me and I will, Cameron replied. You fucker, she sighed. I ought to. But he couldn't feel the knife on his balls anymore. Her desire to come was overwhelming everything else. No, suck it, he growled into her pussy. That got a little shiver from her. God, I love it when you do that. It vibrates my clit. She rubbed her ass back and forth against his snout again. Sooner you start, sooner I growl. That seemed to make up her mind, and Cameron felt two hands encircle his cock and her mouth take his head. True to his word, 
Cameron growled and began to force his tongue deep into her cunt as far as he could go. He plunged it in and out, which caused her to moan onto his dick, which caused him to growl, which caused her to moan even more. He twirled his tongue around deep inside her, and Lana released his cock from her mouth, crying out loudly. Her moans increased in pitch and volume, and Cameron held her ass tightly against his snout as he tongued her pussy. Oh God, yeah, 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 she moaned, and Cameron roared into her, pushing her down onto his chest so her whole body vibrated. This seemed to be what she needed, and she came with a long scream, her body tensing and her pussy squeezing the length of his tongue with tight contractions. Cameron waited while Lana came down from her high, panting and gasping. He waited until she had calmed down and her body started to relax. Mmm, she purred. See now we both got what we wanted. The werewolf suddenly took over again, standing up in one smooth motion, its powerful legs pushing them both upright while holding on to her waist. The knife fell to the floor and disappeared into the sea of toys. Woo! She said, hanging upside down. It lifted her up and then dropped her onto the soft covering of toys face down. It knelt forward over the woman, reaching down below her to grab at her tit. Finding it still covered by the sports bra, it dug its claws into the material and tore slowly, grazing her skin just enough to raise welts. Her bra went the way of the rest of her jacket and the beast grabbed her tit roughly. Cameron and the beast were on the same page. His dick was painfully hard now. You think I got what I wanted? The beast said. It positioned its cock under her pussy, rubbing its length along her slit. The hard ridges danced across her clit, her sensitive pussy causing her to spasm and more groans to issue from under the layer of toys somewhere. It pulled back until the tip was just teasing her hole. You know what? It continued. I don't think you got what you wanted either. It pushed slightly forward into her pussy, never quite entering. More moans from below. The difference is, it said, I'm going to get what I want, but you aren't. It repositioned its cock, slick with spit and pussy juice at her asshole, and pushed hard. Cameron wasn't feeling good about this. The beast was going to hurt her. Lana groaned in pleasure. Oh God, yes, take my ass! she moaned. The beast just couldn't win. She was so turned on it didn't matter how he fucked her. The huge head was slippery, but it still looked unlikely it would ever fit. Finally, thanks to brute force or magic or Cameron didn't know what, it popped inside. As it pushed, the beast pinched her nipples and the fur tickled her skin, raising goosebumps. It had half of its cock in her when it noticed that her hand had snuck back to her pussy. It smacked her hand away. No touching, bitch, he growled, and pushed harder. Soon the beast had bottomed out and its balls rubbed against her pussy lips. The beast pulled out slowly just a bit, then pushed back in. Seemingly satisfied with the amount of lubrication, it started pumping its hips, fucking the woman with short strokes. Soon it was on autopilot, fucking her ass rapidly, its balls slamming into her pussy lips, its tongue lolling dumbly out of its mouth. Lana seemed to be working up to another orgasm quickly, even unable to touch her dripping pussy. Cameron closed his eyes and enjoyed the sensation of the woman's ass on his cock. Everything felt tight with his giant werewolf dick, but fucking her ass gave him a feeling of ownership he hadn't experienced before. She had come to kill him, and then had the nerve to demand sex on her terms. Now he had her begging for his cock so bad that she was enjoying an ass fucking The werewolf continued slamming its cock into her ass from behind like a dog on a bitch, and Cameron could feel himself getting close to the edge. He pulled at her tit, now slick with sweat, and pinched the nipple between his fingers. Unk, she said, every muscle in her body tensing, squeezing his cock tight. She was coming again. The werewolf let go over her tit and leaned its head back, pushing out its chest again. This time, it did howl, long and loud, a sound that could travel miles but instead was amplified by the basement walls. Cameron felt his own orgasm exploding and his giant cock pulsed, spewing semen into her ass. He gripped Lana's ass tight. 
nearly crushing her with his strength as his body tensed. Her own orgasm seemed to be triggered again, and her screams blended with his howl. Cameron came down from his high to find the assassin limp on the floor. She was breathing slowly, but she looked like she'd been knocked out. He withdrew his cock, dribbling the excess cum on her ass. He moved back, admiring her. Cameron didn't think anyone actually passed out from coming, but apparently getting ass-fucked by a werewolf was enough to overload her system. She stirred slightly and Cameron realised that now was his chance to escape. He should tie her up, though. Working quickly, he pulled and felt himself transform back to human. The form felt weak, and he already missed the heightened sensations that came with the wolf. Glancing around the laundry area, he found a spool of clothesline. Using one of the knives, he cut a length and tied the limp woman's wrists and ankles together behind her back. He gathered the rest of knives in one of the laundry baskets and brought them upstairs. He stashed the knives in one of the cabinets and thought about what to do. Looking around, he saw her helmet and cell phone. She had a motorcycle helmet, but where were the keys? Probably in her ruined pants downstairs. Cameron first went upstairs to put on some clothes and pack his bag, then back down to the basement to search her. She was awake and had managed to roll herself over. With her hands and legs tied, she looked like the cover of an S&M movie. Her tits were thrust out, one with long red scratches on it, and her ass was dripping cum on the floor. What do you all think you're doing, Cameron? She breathed, unembarrassed of her condition. I'm getting out of here on your bike. I just need the keys. Do you even know how to ride, stupid? Cameron paused. You're going to tell me the basics. They're going to find you. It doesn't matter. Let them try. I just need your keys and then I'm getting out of here. Lana was reluctant to explain her motorcycle, but she was quickly convinced when Cameron brandished the knife again. After she was done explaining, she looked worried. What about me? Cameron paused. I should probably kill you, but you're clearly no match for me and my yellow-eyed pal. You all can't leave me here, she pleaded. I fucked up the job. They'll kill me. Cameron rolled his eyes. No, they won't. How about I'll put a knife over here and lock you in the basement? Then I don't have to rush out to here. I don't want to see you ever again. You won't, she mumbled. Holding a knife to her throat in case she wanted to try biting him, Cameron searched her pants and found her keys. Cameron left the knife on the dryer over Lana's protests. She'd probably figure out how to get it off there somehow. He couldn't make it too easy. He put on her helmet, but decided against taking the cell phone. It might be tracked. He smashed it instead. He paused at the front door, still wary of going outside. He looked back at the basement door and realised that all of his precautions had been worthless anyway. How had Lana known where he was? It was too late to ask her now. He emerged outside in daylight for the first time in days squinting at the midday sun even through the visor of the helmet. Lana's bike was down the street a block, far enough to make sure he hadn't heard it approaching the house. Cameron stared at it, wondering if Lana had been truthful. Maybe what she told him would cause the engine to explode. It didn't, but Cameron had trouble shifting gears and decided to just walk the bike to Majik within reach. He'd been travelling over an hour before he realised that he wasn't hungry The couch anymore. Lana sat on was comfortable but she still shifted her weight frequently. This house, the place across town where she was supposed to collect her payment after the job was done, had the same layout as the one she'd just been in. She looked in toward the kitchen and fought the impression that the door would be broken down from when she'd had to smash through it. And below there'd be a room full of stuffed toys where she'd begged for an ass fucking by a werewolf and loved every second of it. She was fucked, um, in more ways than one. Soon the men in imitation FBI outfits who were her contacts arrived, coming through the back door. Their big dark glasses and fake earpieces looked only a step above Halloween costume, but that was the point. They didn't work for the government, but it was hard to guess who else they could represent. The one in front, a black man built like a bouncer, took one look at her and scowled. He turned to the other man, a slightly smaller white version of himself. Bob. Does that look like the face of mission success to you? No, Bob. No, it doesn't. 
Lana hated the Bob thing. Everyone was Bob to these people, even the women working for them. It had something to do with preserving anonymity, but it was damn confusing. The Bob in front looked back at Lana. Status report, Bob. She steeled herself and spoke slowly. Due to incorrect assumptions made... Don't tell me fucking why, Bob. Tell me fucking what. Lana started over. The dog has left the kennel. Bob, said the one in charge, turning again to his compatriot. Our vetting process appears to be in need of remediation. She stood up. Not my fucking fault. Shut up, Bob, he said. She grabbed the lapels of his suit, forcing him to look at her. She was smaller than he, but strong enough. A soft click told her the other Bob's gun was pointed at her head. She didn't care. Listen, shithead. The knives didn't work. I got him and he barely felt it. He said he's not natural. And if you'll want to know anything else, my brains are more useful keeping inside my head. Big Bob looked down at her hands on his suit. She let go and sat back down. The Bobs also sat, looking sarcastically thoughtful. Do go on, Bob said. Lana was about to begin, but Bob interrupted. And I'm extremely curious to know if this tale explains why you're in a frilly sundress instead of your usual badass attire. Lana looked down at the pastel-coloured thing she was wearing, the thing she'd found upstairs and thrown on after abandoning the ribbons her clothes had become. She began describing what happened, gaining Cameron's trust, confirming his identity, his lightning-fast reactions and flight downstairs, and the ensuing standoff. She paused. Then what? Then what indeed, she thought. I fucked him. If a trained behavioural expert had been observing the room and had the benefit of video playback, they might have seen the two men's eyes widen the slightest fraction of an inch, betraying the slightest, tiniest bit of surprise. Do please elaborate. After he threw me, I couldn't stop looking at him. I just suddenly wanted to jump his bones. Just so there's no misunderstanding, Bob, you found yourself attracted to the giant hairy werewolf you were sent to kill, and you acted on that impulse. Well, uh, Bob, I would say I felt compelled. There was an overwhelming desire to fuck the giant hairy beast with the huge dick. I don't think I had a choice. Bob turned his head again. That's totally hot, Bob. Is that making you hot? The other Bob nodded. Bob, if I was a woman, my nipples would be all pointy right now, too. Lana couldn't help but glance down, and it was true. She was getting turned on again. You'll think I get a lot of work fucking my marks instead of killing them. This is some part of his not being a natural werewolf. Maybe next time we should send a man to do a man's job, said Bob, narrowing his eyes. I don't think that'll work. Are you speculating the boy is bisexual? Perhaps. Or maybe your man will just become friendly and forget what he was supposed to do. Just give me a rifle and I'll pop him from a mile away. Big Bob shook his head. No, no, we can't do that. This has to be quiet and invisible. No one knows the boy is alive, and no one can know when he's dead again. He turned back to other Bob. I think we may need to go to plan B. Let me get him close range then, I can make it clean. Bob shook his head again. If what you say is true, close proximity is too great a risk. Don't take this job away from me, there's got to be something I can do. The Bobs looked at each other, then back at her. Big Bob spoke slowly. Yes, I think there is. Cameron parked the bike in the alley behind Magic within reach, fumbling with the lock but getting it to work. He stood up and noticed that all of the shops on the block had doors to the alley for dropping off their trash. Magic within reach had such a door too, and Cameron found it was unlocked. He opened the door and saw a dingy staircase leading up to the shop and down to the basement. He climbed the stairs and reached the shop's door, which was currently being refitted by a workman. He grimaced inside the helmet. Ben was flitting about the shop, dusting the shelves again. He noticed Cameron, peering at him over his glasses. Hello there, Cameron, he said. Cameron moved over by the old man and leaned in close. You old fart, he said in a low voice. 
I'm supposed to be dead. You should call me, I don't know, Brandon or something. And how did you know it was me? Cameron, my good fellow, you worry too much, said old Ben, just as loudly as before. I don't think Luis cares one smidge about your situation. Do you, Luis? He leaned past Cameron, speaking at the man fixing the door. Casi hecho, señor, he said, not looking up from the screw he was tightening. Excellent, thank you, Luis. He turned back to Cameron. So, how is your quest proceeding, eh? Uh, well, not well. Can we please talk about this somewhere else? He indicated the workman again. Benedict rolled his eyes. If you insist, allow me a minute. He walked over to the door behind the counter and gave it a knock. Wayne, can you, um, disentangle yourself from your current studies? I need use of the room, please. Just a sec, came a voice from inside the door. There were some noises, and soon Cameron saw a black goth kid emerge, tripping over his impractical strappy pants. It even looked like a length of rope had gotten caught in his pants and he was dragging it behind him. He looked at Cameron, smiled weakly, and quickly averted his eyes, tripping his way out the front door of the shop. Benedict rolled his eyes and mumbled something to himself, then indicated the open door. Who was that? asked Cameron. The summer intern. This way. Cameron went in the door and found a small smelly room and sat on the old couch. He yelped in surprise as an errant spring inside the cushion poked him in the rear. Benedict chuckled and sat in one of the chairs that surrounded a small table. So Cameron, what troubles have you been having? The place I was staying, it's not safe anymore. I think I'll need your basement after all. Ah, I see. Cameron thought about what to say. He didn't want old Ben to know that anyone was after him, then he might refuse to help him at all. Someone, uh, stumbled in, and I had to leave. Was there another... incident? Not really, although... Come on then, out with it. Cameron stared at the ground. I discovered another way to satisfy the hunger. Ben's eyes lit up. That's excellent. I was afraid I would have to supply you with various vagrants and disagreeable types like meat for a zoo lion. What a scintillating development. So what is the method? Raw meat? Small game? Roadkill? Fucking! Mumbled Cameron. Is that... Ah, uh, spelt with an F? You got it. Benedict sat back deep in thought. Yes, that does make sense. Your spell had, from the start, its roots in sexual magic, of course. So, when that magic came into contact with the werewolf blood, there was a little cross-pollination of sorts. Yes, I don't know why I didn't think of that before. It doesn't have to be just virgins or something, does it? No, at least this person... Well, actually, we didn't, ah, uh, do it regularly. Mr. Abby, as I will try to call you, you will need to be specific and unfettered if we are to solve your problems. Anal. Not vaginal. Benedict squinted in thought again. Interesting. Did you achieve orgasm? Yeah. That's probably the key. Your orgasmic response is interpreted by the werewolf blood as satisfaction and sates the hunger. The next experiment would be to discover if masturbation produces the same effect. What if it doesn't? Yep. Well then, you're going to have to acquire a steady girlfriend, and quickly. And given the nature of your enchantment, that shouldn't be a problem, eh? Cameron grunted. Ben continued. As to the issue of the ingredients, how are you faring? Cameron slouched further down on the couch. I haven't even started. I don't know what half this stuff is. And then there was the hunger. I don't know how I'm ever going to find everything. Well, let's look on the bright side. You have a little more time to work with, now that you can satisfy the hunger and prevent further progress of the curse. And I don't think I'm ever going to figure out how to get some of this stuff, Ben. It's hopeless. Maybe that intern can help me or something. Or something, indeed. No. Wayne is much too preoccupied with his telekinesis studies to devote the proper time. Perhaps there is someone... Ben looked like he was getting another thought. Mr. B, it is clear you need assistance locating the ingredients to your cure. 
I was hoping you'd be able to get started on your own, maybe with a little research in the library or utilising the internet. But it is clear that, like most of your generation, you are helpless. So I am going to help you, or I will never be rid of you. He smirked, taking the edge off the statement. There is a young lady who comes often to my store who has shown great interest and ability, and she may be able to assist you. She usually pops on by after her classes. Until then, perhaps you would like to familiarise yourself with your new sleeping quarters. Cameron agreed and the couch groaned in despair as he got up. Ben lead him down the back stairway Cameron had just discovered and into the basement. It reminded him of the basement bathroom from the high school where he'd first tried the pills. It was lit only by faltering fluorescent lights and had a thin layer of dust coating everything. The basement floor plan was large but was subdivided into smaller compartments, each with a locked heavy steel door. Each door had a number, which Ben explained corresponded with one of the suites in the building. The compartments were clearly supposed to be used for storage, not housing. They approached compartment number 2A. So, said Cameron, you're going to lock me in a storage closet all the time. I do not see that we have any other option, Cameron. Excuse me, Mr B. Why not get Luis to put in a lock that I can open from the inside at least? The old man opened the door, studying it. My boy, that's just the type of lateral thinking we needed. Cameron got a look at his new room. It looked like a jail cell. It was a small concrete box with a dim light whose switch was on the outside the room and a small garden-level window at the back that let in some additional sunlight. The floor was covered in pieces of cardboard, trash and bits of insulation. Otherwise, it was empty. Ben, finished inspecting the door, joined him at his side. Perhaps this is the perfect time to replace that couch upstairs. It will be your new bed. It's disgusting, said Cameron. Then perhaps you would like a broom, hinted the old man. Yeah, I guess so. And so, for the first time ever, Cameron willingly cleaned his room. The old man happily fetched a broom, duster and apron for Cameron, although the apron was politely declined. He attacked the dirt and grime with glee that would have made his mother cry with joy. They spent the next couple hours cleaning up the storage room, arranging to have a new lock put on the door and to have a new couch delivered to the store. Luis was pleased to earn a few more hours' pay and ran out to buy a new two-sided lock. The shop door was now reinstalled and worked like new. He had even tweaked the mechanism so it wasn't the heavy test of strength it used to be. Benedict ordered the couch over the phone, using an old rotary dial phone Cameron had never seen outside the movies. Benedict seemed very concerned that the couch was extremely robust and effortlessly washable, which didn't make sense. How much damage could the old man do to a couch? The couch would arrive that evening, so they prepared by moving the old, nasty couch downstairs into the cell, as Cameron had started calling it. He and Luis had been planning how they were going to carry the couch, but instead Benedict just wiggled an eyebrow and the grungy thing floated into the air like a feather. He walked it over the counter and out of the shop, humming to himself the whole time. Cameron looked over at Luis, but the workman was just grinning to himself. He didn't seem the least bit startled. Luis's work done, he collected his pay, bid everyone adios, and left. After the couch was moved, Cameron saw the utter disgusting disaster that was the floor where the couch had been and began sweeping that up. Benedict was in the shop, with his apron as usual, cleaning some of the dust that had started to accumulate from all the movement in the shop that day. Suddenly, from the front of the shop came a gigantic crash as the front door burst open and slammed into the wall beside it. Cameron froze where he stood. Had they found him already? A familiar voice said, Whoa! Then Benedict's voice. Ah, young lady, so good to see you today. I have a great request to make of you. He raised his voice. Um, Mr Brandon, would you like to meet your assistant? Cameron crept slowly into the shop, still holding the broom. He saw who had entered the shop and wanted to jump out the nearest window. Assistant? Sorry about the door, Ben. It's way lighter than it used to be, she said. Benedict turned to Cameron and indicated the young woman at the door with a backpack. Her Egyptian-style eyeliner contrasted sharply with her pale makeup. 
Brandon, meet Raven, your new assistant. What's going on? asked Raven. Benedict shuffled over, escorting her into the store. Come in, come in, I will explain everything. Cameron was still standing behind the store counter, unable to move. The last thing he wanted to deal with was all of Chelsea's drama. Cameron realised that he was staring off into space, and the other two were standing in front of him like customers waiting to check out. Hi, I'm Raven, she said, holding out her hand like they'd never met. She had a ring with a big black stone on her middle finger. Cameron, on reflex, went to shake it, but suddenly Benedict started coughing and waved his hands like he was warding off bees. He accidentally knocked Raven's hand out of the way. My, my, it's dusty in here. Mr Brandon, I think you're doing more harm than good in there. Cameron thought dumbly that it wasn't dusty at all. Then he looked at his hand, realisation dawning. Duh, skin-to-skin -skin contact. He had to be careful about that. Brandon, he said, nodding his head. And now he realised that she also couldn't recognise him thanks to his locket. He wasn't Cameron Buddy from middle school who has better things to do than play with his old friends, but Brandon, hunky teenager with a mysterious quest. And if he wasn't Cameron, that meant that she couldn't be Chelsea. He had no choice but to accept the name she claimed. Raven, he said, trying the name out. That's a, a pretty name. I was into Poe when I picked it, but most people just make jokes about EDM music. You go in Raven, Raven, and stuff. That's too bad, I like it, he forced himself to say. Why don't we all go into the parlour and have a little chat, offered Benedict. I have a ton of homework to do, Ben, said Raven. And there's nowhere to sit anymore, said Cameron. Nonsense to both of you. Once you hear this boy's tale, Raven, you'll think of nothing else. And there's still a couple chairs, Mr B. Just bring in that stool. Cameron made a show of lifting the heavy shop stool with one hand, which took no effort at all. He hoped he saw Raven's eyes widen a little as his bicep flexed. They sat in the book-lined room, which without the couch seemed to be much larger, and Benedict began explaining Cameron's predicament. He was careful not to be too specific about the exact source of Cameron's woes or its particular sexual nature. But he also seemed to make it a little too obvious that he was leaving out certain facts, and Cameron could see in Raven's face that she saw holes in the story. Benedict finished his speech and he and Cameron looked at Raven. She eyed them both. So you, she pointed at Cameron, are an unnatural werewolf who turns unpredictably and frequently, and you, she pointed at Benedict, think I should help him find his spell ingredients because you're too old to find them yourself and he's too stupid to look them up. The men nodded. How does this plan not end in me being eaten by the unpredictable frequent werewolf? There was a knock at the door. Benedict excused himself quickly and left the room quicker than Cameron thought possible for a man of his age. Cameron looked at Raven. I can control it, mostly. At least I have a lot of warning that I'm getting hungry. And there are ways I can prevent myself from turning, although it doesn't keep it satisfied for as long. How's that? Yes, how indeed. As Cameron was wondering how he was going to explain this, Benedict poked his head in the door. He wouldn't be able to avoid the question for long, though. She'd have to know the details soon. The new couch has arrived. Please make way. Raven pushed her backpack to the corner of the room, and soon a new sturdy-looking couch with washable covers drifted into the room with Benedict humming behind it. He guided it over to the wall where the old couch had been and let it drop gently to the floor with a light thump. Couch test, yelled Raven, and she ran over to the couch and began jumping up and down on the cushions. The springs complained, but held. Benedict stood up angrily. Now cut that out, girl, this is unacceptable. Cameron sat in his chair, transfixed by the effect Raven's bouncing had on her figure. Not even her baggy goth clothing could disguise her lithe, compact frame, and she was definitely not wearing a bra. It looks perfectly acceptable to me, he said, ogling. Raven stopped bouncing and glared at him. This only made her cuter. Watch it, Buster, she said, or I'll slap you silly. She held up her hand dramatically. Cameron knew he couldn't let her slap him or else all hell would break loose, so he retreated, putting up his hands in defence. Raven, please, 
Benedict interjected. I need to know if you will assist Brandon, or else I need to locate someone else who can. Her face became serious and she nodded. I'll help. Excellent. Now, I am exhausted from the day's events, so I am going to lie down for a while. You two can get acquainted and go over the list on your own. And Raven, thank you so much for your assistance. Benedict's eyes shifted to Cameron pointedly, and Cameron wondered what the look was for. Then he got the hint and thanked her as well. The old man bid them good evening and headed off through the lab door, suddenly looking much older and slower than he had just minutes ago. Cameron and Raven listened as he padded off to his room. They sat there in silence for a few minutes, not looking at each other. Cameron didn't know what to talk about. Cameron's human stomach rumbled. You hungry? We could get some pizza, said Cameron. How about tacos? said Raven. Cameron hoped Raven wasn't looking because he turned white for a second, recalling their last conversation so long ago. He'd mentioned tacos the day he'd run into her coming out of the shop, but there was no way she knew who he was. It had to be a coincidence. Uh, yeah, sure, he said. And they got up, Raven retrieving her backpack. But Luis said not to go to the place across the street. They don't pay the cooks for overtime. Who's Luis? As they walked, Cameron explained who Luis was, and led Raven a few blocks to a place that Luis had recommended instead. He started to fill in some of the details old Ben had left out, like his new residence in the basement and the normalcy charm, which he explained was for accidental transformations only. Raven seemed to respond well to the new information, nodding whenever a new piece of the puzzle was filled in. He knew he should be more cautious about going outside and being seen since the morning's attack, but he was tired of hiding all the time. Lana had said she couldn't recognise him, and Besides, he'd dealt with her easy enough. As far as he was concerned, they were welcome to try again. The taco place was a hole in the wall that wasn't well labelled, just a small unlit sign over a door. Cameron guessed the food was authentic because they were the only white people there. He and Raven ordered and started looking over the spell ingredient list while they waited. The piece of paper was crumpled and ripped from all the abuse it had taken, so Raven got a fresh sheet from her backpack and copied the items onto a new list in purple ink, which Cameron thought was a little cutesy. Then she made a second copy for him to have. Cameron had never really looked at the list before, and was embarrassed to see that some of the items, like dietary supplements, could be bought at any drugstore. Raven gave him a hard time about these, but even she started frowning when she read certain items. Soon the tacos arrived and they both dug in, to their extreme regret. The food was super hot, and when it hit them their eyes went wide. They both drained their glasses and yelled for mas agua por favor, to galas of laughter from the other customers. They took it easy after that. As they finished, Cameron noticed that Raven had put numbers next to all of the items on the list. So, she said, and then stopped. <laughs> he said, I've rated everything on the list from one to three based on difficulty. About half of the list are things you could have bought at any drugstore, dumbass. Okay, my bad. The twos are things I've heard of and know where to find. Like we can get some of this stuff at the mall. Bath, I hate them all. And the threes? Stuff I have never heard of. Okay, then probably you should... Wrong, she interrupted. I'm helping you, so you are going to have to do what I say, not the other way around. Cameron had to admit she had a point. So, uh, what do you recommend then? Okay, you should probably go to the store and buy the number one items. Even a dumb jock like you, Brandon, could handle that. Hey, I'm not a dumb jock! Raven tilted her head and put on a look of exaggerated curiosity. No. Hmm. So while you're doing that, I'll go online and look up the number threes. Then we need to go and buy the number twos, although we need a car to get those. Do you have a car? Motorcycle. How tough. Do you have a second helmet? No. See if you can get a helmet from somewhere. She paused, looking over the list again. That's pretty much it for this. 
They finished up their food and were surprised at how cheap the bill was. Cameron still had some cash left over and made a big show of paying for both of them, and Raven made a big show of being surprised and smitten. They left the restaurant and started walking back to the shop, yakking and laughing together. Raven tried a couple times to ease closer to Cameron and have him take her arm, but each time Cameron had to back away to avoid touching her. Cameron led her around to the back entrance of the store and awkwardly bid her good night. Thanks for the help, really, he admitted. You're gonna owe me, you know. Raven smirked. Yeah, I guess. Remember to buy your items tomorrow. If I come over here on Saturday and you haven't done that, you're gonna be in big trouble. She smirked again and Cameron realised she was coming on to him. It was cute, but it was too dangerous. Yeah, I guess, he repeated. You're not so bad for a dumb jock, Brandon. See ya. And then Raven did the worst possible thing she could have done. She gave him a peck on the cheek. Cameron's stomach sank. He had enjoyed spending casual quality time with Raven and had even almost forgotten how annoying she was as Chelsea. He didn't want to ruin their semi-professional relationship with his charm. Maybe she did deserve to know more about his curse but he'd prefer to tell her sometime other than right after they'd fucked. Now Raven was really starting to get the look, so Cameron acted fast. He reached down and picked her up, throwing her over her shoulder. She let out a whoop of surprise. He carried her through the door and down the stairs like a caveman hauling his mate. It was dark and he had trouble seeing, but he found his cell and dumped her on the couch. He flicked on the dim light and looked at her across the room. Wow! she said, a new fire burning in her eyes. And I thought you were avoiding me all night. Cameron started pacing back and forth. The wolf inside rumbled with anticipation. Cameron knew it wasn't a threat, though. He wouldn't need to transform for a couple days at least. I'm sorry, Raven, you shouldn't have done that. She sat up on the old couch, the springs groaning. No? Don't you like me? She stretched on the couch like a cat, arching her back. Her loose clothing momentarily outlined her body again, her small breasts high on her chest, her nipples visible in the fabric. Cameron's dick pulsed. Yeah, but... She got up and glided across the floor to Cameron, backing him against the wall. Yeah, I can tell. I've never had a dumb jock look at me like you do, they just think I'm a stupid goth. She pressed against him so that her whole body was making contact from top to bottom. She was shorter than he was and had to look up at him. Her breasts pressed against him lightly, and he was sure she could feel his hard-on rubbing against her. Cameron sighed, resigned to his fate. It's not that he didn't want to fuck Raven right now, but he was worried she'd get upset when she learned the truth. She was nice and didn't deserve this. But it was inevitable. So he put his arms around her, leaned down, and kissed her. It was much more relaxing than with Jess. She'd been in the full throw of the attraction spell, and kissing her had been an athletic, violent affair. But Raven didn't seem to be fully enthralled yet, and was kissing him gently, mouth closed. It was soft and sweet and made him painfully hard. He reached up and caressed her breast, and suddenly she pulled back. Hey Buster, way to reach straight for the boob. Cameron stopped short. None of the other women had complained about anything he'd done. I thought you wanted to... Well, make out, yeah, but I don't put out on the first date or anything. Cameron stood there dumbly. What was going on? There had been plenty of skin-to-skin -skin contact, so she should be all over him. He looked at her again, and she was definitely turned on. Her mouth was open slightly, and her nipples were still hard. Was she somehow immune? Raven, don't get upset. But what would you say if I asked for a blowjob? She smacked him. I said don't get upset. I'm not upset, jerk. You just need some sense smacked into you. What kind of girl do you think I am? Cameron's knees went weak and he had to sit on the couch. He wasn't sure where to start. So much for putting off telling her more of the truth. It's not you, it's me. Oh, that's a good one, she said, rolling her eyes. No, really, I need to explain. Sit. He motioned for her to join him on the couch. 
She crossed her arms and sat at the far end, glaring at him. It was now or never. Before, you asked about how I control the hunger without eating people. She said nothing. The other way is by having sex. If I have sex with someone, the hunger goes away. She still said nothing, her arms still crossed. Part of my curse is that if I touch a woman, they want to have sex with me, like, right away. So that's why I was avoiding you, and that's why I dragged you down here after you kissed me. I thought you'd been charmed, so I thought... You thought you might as well enjoy it. Some curse. Yeah, pretty much, he said. She gave him the finger. Raven... But she interrupted him. This ring, she said, indicating the ring on the middle finger inches from his face, is a ring of magical protection. It means I can't be affected by magical spells that other people try to charm me with, including teenage boys who want some easy tale. Cameron stared at the ring. Oh, was all he said. Then a thought occurred to him. She had still come on to him and she hadn't been affected by the spell. So before what you said. But she saw where he was going with that. You ruined the mood, Buster. Or should I say, Cameron? Cameron stared dumbly again. You can... Keep looking at the ring, she said. He looked again at her middle finger, which was still held up. You look different than how you used to. But I can still tell it's you. I wondered why you were walking around instead of dead, killed by a wild animal. But once Ben explained what you were, that made sense. But how come you're just walking around? What if someone else saw you? Cameron reached into his shirt and held up his amulet. He explained its properties. She finally put her finger down. Just don't call me Cameron in public, it's too risky. Stick with Brandon. And Raven, he pleaded. I don't have a choice. I need to be able to have sex regularly, or more people will die. So rape is better than murder. Wow, you are something. Her jaw was tight now. She was super pissed. Cameron tried to resist snorting at this. Trust me, once they get charmed, it's not that. I'm sure it looks that way to you. I bet you wanted Ben to get me to help you so you could have a girl to fuck every night you need it. Cameron sighed. The old man thought of you himself. But you know what? Yeah, that crossed my mind. But if that's what I had wanted, I would have brushed up against you earlier. I'm sorry, but this is the way it is. If you can't handle it, Ben and I can find someone else to help. Someone else who doesn't have protection from your curse, you mean? She looked at the ground in silence. She seemed to be weighing her options. Cameron decided the best thing was to stay quiet, letting her decide. Finally, she spoke. It was rotten of you, both of you actually, not to tell me everything before I said yes. She held up a hand so he couldn't interrupt. But I'll still help, on one condition. What's that? Show me. Cameron's mouth fell open. Uh, show you what? Show me that the women enjoy it. You have to do it, right? So it's sooner or later, and if they really have a good time, then who am I to judge? Your amulet there means we can go outside right now and pick someone up, right? Yeah. Cameron's mouth was still stuck open. So much of what Raven said reduced him to confused silence. She got up. Then let's go, wolf boy. Cameron was frozen on the couch. Now? Yeah, now. But I don't need to transform. It's not... No, I thought you said you could control it. Oh, too bad then. See you around, she said, and turned to leave. Cameron stood up. So you and I, Cameron said slowly, making sure everything was clear, are going to go outside and find a hot girl who I'm going to touch and you're going to watch me while she jumps my bones and see if she likes it. Wow, she said, mocking being impressed. You're not as dumb as I thought. Cameron shook his head. Well, if I have to, sure. He started for the door, but Raven stopped him. Never. Now, Cameron, I wouldn't want you to ruin your clothes by suddenly growing two times your normal size. 
You should really take them off. Cameron made a stupid sound. He just didn't know what she was going to say from moment to moment. He kind of liked that. But what was she doing with him? It's very simple, she explained. That charm means everyone will see you as normal, so there's no reason you can't go around naked. And that way, you won't ruin your clothes. It's perfectly logical. Then she crossed her eyes and stuck out her tongue. Cameron tried to argue that he might not even transform, but Raven was having none of it. She stood there with her arms crossed again, and he shrugged his shoulders and quickly stripped, realising he needed to man it up and not be embarrassed. If he got nervous, she'd notice and only make it worse. After he dropped his pants, Raven made a big show of checking him out. She smiled wickedly, stuck her tongue out again, and walked out of the door. Cameron followed, fighting not to cover himself. On the street, Cameron was reminded of walking the school corridors. With his amulet, there was no way anyone could see his nudity, but he still felt like people were looking at him, as if on some level they knew what they were seeing. Surprisingly, this didn't make him feel as embarrassed as when he'd had to strip for Raven. He'd probably never see these people again, so who cared if they got to see his hot bod? And the nights were finally warming up and the sidewalks were filling with dinner-goers. Every so often, Raven would point at a woman and ask him if he wanted to fuck her. Invariably, she picked the oldest, fattest, ugliest women. Cameron was not amused, worried that she was going to push him into someone. Finally, Raven suggested that they go to the park, reasoning that grass would be more comfortable than concrete. Cameron agreed. When they reached the park, Cameron saw another benefit of being there as he saw a few joggers running around getting their after-work exercise. One was a young college woman, her skinny body slick with sweat and dressed in a minimal outfit of a sports bra and shorts, her tight ass flexed as she ran. Yes, he'd find someone suitable here. Cameron and Raven wandered around the park, finally finding an area close to the centre with a curving path and a soft expanse of grass. A double-sided bench sat on the side of the path, one side facing it, the other facing the grass. The park lights created creating small pools of soft white light on the path, insects swirling around each fixture. Raven sat on the bench, but Cameron felt the cold metal and decided to remain standing. They waited in silence, Cameron feeling chilly. It was still spring and he was standing in the park nude after all. A few men jogged by and Cameron stood off the side of the path as they passed. Then a woman came around the bend and Cameron started to walk back on the path, but Raven put up her hand, stopping him. I'll choose, she said, and he backed off. They waited a quarter of an hour, in which time nearly a half dozen women had passed. Finally, a woman rounded the bend that made Cameron look twice. She had massive tits that her sports bra desperately tried to hold steady to little effect. She was larger than some of the skinny athletic things that had run past, but Cameron wasn't complaining. She had probably started trying to lose weight for the new year, and her running was starting to pay off. But his eyes drifted back to her bouncing boobs, and he glanced at Raven, pleading silently. Raven nodded. Raven watched as Cameron walked toward the path. She was a sucker for a man with muscles, but usually they were assholes. And sure, Cameron was usually an asshole, but Ben seemed to think he was worth helping and he'd been really nice at dinner. And when he'd picked her up after the kiss, oh. He had changed somehow in the last month and she wanted to see just how much. As much as she wondered if this whole curse business wasn't just an excuse to get some easy tail, she knew he'd be on his best behaviour if she was there to keep an eye on him. A man with that kind of ability was liable to just spot a girl in the street and take her on a whim and she couldn't allow that. Better to control the curse as much as possible. She knew he'd lusted after all the girls at school that had big tits. She knew that was one reason he'd stopped hanging out with her even if he didn't know it. Her boobs hadn't really come in yet if they were going to at all. She let him think she was choosing the girl, but the second he'd seen her coming around the corner, she knew what he wanted. The jogger was definitely out of college, but still young and had a ponytail tied with a scrunchie. She was in the zone, rocking out to the iPhone wrapped around her arm as she ran. Cameron walked toward the path, and she continued like she didn't see him. As she passed,
Cameron reached out with a hand and touched her on the arm, brushing it lightly. It was a soft touch, not grabby at all. The woman's eyes snapped into focus and she slowed down, turning to face him. She jogged in place, not wanting to cramp. Cameron was gazing stupidly at her boobs again, which were bouncing in front of him. She looked a little confused. Raven wondered how fast the charm took to take effect. Hi, he mouthed and pointed at his ears. The jogger got the hint and removed her headphones. She finally stopped jogging in place and then she seemed to notice he was naked. Raven saw her inhale sharply. His enchantment looked like it was working like he said. Cameron looked over at Raven, seeking approval. Good boy. She nodded at him again. He spoke to the woman. I couldn't help noticing you as you went by, he said. Your tits are awesome. Any self-respecting woman would slap a stranger that said that, or would run away screaming. But Cameron didn't stop there. He got closer to her, reached up, and grabbed one of her breasts roughly, much more roughly than he'd touched Raven. He squeezed the tit flesh like he was testing a grapefruit. The woman gasped, going weak in the knees and leaning toward him. Raven saw his thumb seek out her nipple, flicking for it, but it was concealed under the sports bra. Not finding it, he squeezed her breast again. His arm muscles flexed as he played with her tit. Raven found herself getting turned on again. Get this off, he commanded, indicating the bra. The woman nodded, crossing her arms and pulling the sports bra quickly over her head and dropping it by the path. Her breasts spilled into view, deep seam marks tracing their outlines. She itched the marks, arching her back. Cameron leaned in and planted his mouth on the tit he hadn't been grabbing, licking and sucking the nipple, his tongue running over it. The woman gasped and cooed in pleasure and pressed her tit against him. He kept his other hand still busy on the other tit, finding the nipple with his thumb this time. The woman had little spasms of pleasure as he tweaked her nipple. Raven thought maybe there was still a chance that she was just in a trance somehow, that she wasn't in control of her body at all. But then the jogger reached down for his cock on her own, fondling it as it stiffened and playing with his ball sack, which was tight against the cool air. She was only too happy to participate. Raven had first seen Cameron's cock when she'd commanded him to strip, and she thought it was a good size then. But now that it was getting hard, she saw how big it really was. She snuck a hand under her pants and tested her pussy. She was getting wet. His dick was almost as big as some of her dildos at home. Another jogger, a man, came down the path, and Raven thought for a moment that he must see what was going on that a woman was jerking off a muscular man on the path while he sucked on her tit. Cameron saw the jogger too and led the woman off the path toward the grass. The jogger continued right on by without a second look. Raven composed herself, removing her hand from her pants and trying to remind herself that she wasn't included in the normalcy field. She moved to the other side of the bench that faced the grass, where in the dim light she saw the woman on her knees sucking on Cameron's big dick, her tits swinging back and forth. Her headphones had been yanked out and were forgotten on the ground by the path. Raven, in shadow from the lights, put her hand back where it wanted to be and resumed teasing her pussy as discreetly as she could. She wondered when he was going to turn into a werewolf. How much bigger could he get? She shivered with pleasure. The woman was bobbing on just the head of Cameron's cock, which looked too big to go any further. But he clearly wanted more. He put his hand gently on her head to slow her down then pulled it slowly toward him. You can take it, he whispered. Go on and take it. Her mouth opened lewdly, and somehow she started to take his length. Raven kept looking back and forth between Cameron's huge cock and the jogger's small mouth. It didn't look like she should be able to take him, but somehow she was. The woman groaned, reaching under her shorts to play with her pussy while he continued to pull her head slowly onto his dick. Once the jogger realised she could take him, she moved on her own. It was clear to Raven that she was going to somehow be able to swallow his whole cock. There must be some other subtlety of magic in play. Finally, the woman bottomed out, her lips against his crotch, her tongue sneaking out to lick his balls. Raven plunged a finger into her own wet pussy.
Cameron started fucking the woman's mouth with short strokes, which Raven thought looked uncomfortable, but instead she grabbed his ass and blew him harder. Finally, running out of breath, she withdrew, his cock slick with spit and dripping on the ground. The woman caught her breath, stroking his cock up and down again. I, she gasped, want to do that again. Then she looked straight in his eyes and put her mouth on his dick. She grabbed his ass and deep-throated him again in one long stroke. There was no question in Raven's mind now that Cameron was telling the truth. And if all the girls liked it this much, this was a much better than the alternative. Raven had now had two fingers in her cunt, and the other under her shirt playing with her tit. She wondered how long she'd be able to resist Cameron even without the charm. The jogger fondled his butt and forced him to fuck her mouth, her throat making gulping noises. Another jogger shuffled past, not sparing the slightest glance to the two of them. The woman pulled off of Cameron again, another long rope of spit coating his dick. You know, she said, jerking his dick again. I don't usually pick up guys at the park. I could never do that before, actually. Uh, that's okay, Cameron said. I couldn't say no. She sighed and leaned back, removing her shorts and panties in one swift motion, leaving her shoes on. She spread her legs wide, and Raven could see her pussy, puffy and wet. Cameron admired her, stroking his pulsing dick. Fuck me, she moaned. Fuck me with that cock. Cameron knelt down in front of her. Wait, said Raven, her voice cracking. Cameron looked over his shoulder at her with a pathetic look. Come on and fuck me, the woman was still babbling. Raven shivered, and Cameron now noticed where her hands were. You have to transform, said Raven, short of breath. I have to see if they like it, even when you're transformed. Was she telling the truth? Was she really interested, in a detached and scientific way, in how the woman would react? Or was this just her own desires inflamed? Raven shivered again. Cameron nodded and stood back up. He closed his eyes and squatted, bending his arms and legs. He moaned, and suddenly hair and fur began to sprout all over his body, first looking like an all-over five o'clock shadow, and then shooting out a short glossy coat. A long mane spilled down his back. His body began to stretch and grow, the chest growing larger and, and his nose and mouth stretching out of his face. His toes joined together and became paws, while his feet grew until his legs were more animal. His head became elongated and canine, with sharp teeth flashing in the lamplight. His eyes, now piercing yellow, seemed to glow. Raven's hand moved furiously against her pussy. His cock became larger, bright pink against his dark coat, and more angular. The ridges that appeared on it almost looked like spikes. Raven shuddered to think of what those would feel like against her clit. Now he was definitely bigger than her toys at home. The werewolf Cameron stood before her, posing, almost showing off. He roared, and Raven came despite herself trying to keep quiet lest the joggers that still sometimes passed heard her. Her cunt squeezed her fingers and she shuddered against the bench. It was a small orgasm, but it was enough for Cameron. The beast seemed to smile at Raven. The woman beneath him was still babbling incoherently, and now had most of her hand jammed into her pussy. She didn't look at all alarmed at the beast that stood above her. It knelt on top of her at her waist, and the woman's only complaint was that he should stop wasting time and fuck her already. Instead, it spit into one paw and rubbed the valley between her tits, already wet with sweat. It leaned forward, mashing her tits together with the pink cock squeezed between them. This seemed to be good enough for the jogger. Oh yes, fuck my titties. Fuck those big titties, she mumbled, and the wolf's haunches jerked back and forth. Its tail was high in the air, providing a counterbalance. Cameron's tongue was lolling out of his mouth now as his animal body took over. The woman stuck out her tongue, grabbing little licks of his cockhead as it emerged from her cleavage. The werewolf looked at Raven, startling her. She was working toward another orgasm, and those yellow eyes fixed on her with supernatural intensity. 
I've never had a titty fuck before, it rumbled, its voice booming in its chest. Raven fingered herself hard. Have you ever had a titty fuck? it asked. It stared at her, waiting for a response, still fucking the valley of the jogger's cleavage, carefully pinching the nipples without poking her with its claws. Raven arched her back, thrusting her chest out as much as she could. The wolf's eyes moved down her body, not at all disappointed with what it saw. No, Raven admitted between gasps. God, she was hot. No boobs. She squeezed her shoulders together for effect. Maybe the old man can help with that, said the wolf, and turned its attention back to the jogger, her tits shiny and wet. Raven had always thought big boobs would just get in the way. Even so, based on Ben's success with Cameron, he'd probably turn her into a chicken or something instead. The beast moved backward over the jogger's legs, his dick finally near her pussy. He grasped it with one large paw and aimed it for her hole. It was shaped like a spear, narrow at the end, and getting much larger very quickly. He placed just the tip of the spear inside her. Yes, the woman groaned. Fuck! And he rammed home in one swift stroke, her dripping pussy more than ready to receive his cock. Me! She screamed, holding her own tits now and pinching the nipples hard. Raven watched the beast's cock embed itself in the jogger's cunt and imagined it was in her, spreading her wide, filling her up. She stuffed a fourth finger into her own pussy, hoping no one on the path would glance over her shoulder and see. The beast's haunches started moving again, that rapid animal thrust that was all reflex, all instinct. Raven pulled at her cunt, trying to match what she saw thrust for thrust. The jogger was crying out constantly now a mix of mostly pleasure and disbelief at the thing inside her. She leaned her ass back, letting the werewolf thrust even deeper, and her legs extended and lifted into the air like a butterfly spreading its wings. The beast grabbed her legs as it fucked her, its furred form like an inky black hole, visible in the night only as a silhouette. Then the beast turned toward Raven again, and once again those yellow eyes pierced her. It watched her as it fucked the jogger, its eyes locking onto Raven's crotch and watching her pleasure herself. Are you happy now? Convinced? It asked rhetorically. The werewolf's eyes were still on her crotch, and it changed its movements until they were in sync. He thrust into the jogger, she thrust into herself. Raven pinched her nipple, sending sparks through her. No, she managed. Make her come. I want to... see her come. The beast turned back to the jogger, speeding up his motions again. The huge pink cock flashed in and out of her, the sound of his balls slapping her arse audible even above the woman's moans. And now the beast let go of her legs and began to growl, low and deep, and leaned down further until he was snout to face with the woman. It was still panting, saliva dripping on her tits now, and she happily rubbed the substance over herself making her tits wet and shiny in the light. Still fucking her, the beast moved its head down to her breasts and took control of its long tongue. It started by licking her cleavage, running the tongue from bottom to top, then circling her left breast, leaving it wet and dripping, circling in closer until it neared her nipple. The woman gasped, anticipating contact with her nipple, but instead the beast pinched her other nipple with the hand that she hadn't been paying attention to, causing her to jerk and moan again. Oh, you bad dog, she gasped. You fooled me. Bite my nipple. Bite it. The wolf placed one paw over her tit and moved slowly, almost gently, and positioned its slobbery snout above her nipple. Its lips pulled back, revealing a mouth full of pointed fangs, any one of which could tear open her throat. The growling continued, louder now that its mouth was open. The wolf, still thrusting into her, moved with precision as it placed its teeth on either side of her nipple. Its paw squeezed, holding her tit in place. Oh God, yes, oh God, yes, the jogger cried. Cameron bit down ever so lightly, not quite piercing her delicate flesh. The woman screamed in orgasm, her hips raising up and thrashing, and the beast held onto her tightly, 
ensuring it didn't injure her. It stopped nibbling her tit and focused on fucking her through her orgasm, its hips a blur as the pink cock ravaged her pussy, the wolf's yellow eyes watching in rapt attention and the growl increasing in volume as the woman's tits bounced and shivered as she shook. Raven's own orgasm was quickly approaching again, her hand stuffed down her pants and the path completely forgotten. Cameron was a magnificent creature of pure animal lust and masculine strength. The jogger's orgasm was finished, but Cameron hadn't slowed down a bit. He was fucking her fast and hard and she was just along for the ride, holding onto her tits for dear life, which the beast appreciated, licking her presented nipples, first one, then the other. Cameron gave a few more thrusts and burst into a full-blown wolf howl, nearly bursting Raven's eardrums and echoing off the buildings that bordered the park. And this triggered Raven's own orgasm, and she came too. Her cunt squeezing her fingers again, and she forced herself not to cry out, instead gritting her teeth and bending over in pleasure. Her body went tense a few more times and then it passed. She knew if she hadn't been forced to keep it in, she could have made it last longer. She relaxed for another minute, enjoying the glow. When she opened her eyes and looked up, she saw Cameron still as a wolf, prowling near the path, looking for the woman's sports bra and headphones. He tossed them to her as she lay on the grass, still recovering from her experience. She got up slowly and awkwardly, but Cameron didn't seem to notice she wanted a hand. She put on her clothes and stuffed the headphones down her bra. She smiled sheepishly and stumbled slowly away down the path, stealing glances back at him in the night. Raven stood up and gave the beast a punch in the guts as hard as she could. It hurt her and he barely flinched. The canine face briefly flashed with anger, teeth bared and ears pricked, but then it just looked confused. What was that for? It growled. You need to learn better after bed manners. Wham, bam, thank you mum is not a recommendation, Raven said. Like she cares in her state, came the reply. She punched him again. Maybe you forgot the point of all of this. You were proving that you were treating your meals with respect. He rolled his eyes, a comical face out of a talking dog movie. You wanted to know I wasn't raping them. Your own soaked panties seem like proof to me. As long as I'm helping you find your cure, you'll do what I say. Who knows, you may realise that it's good advice for when you want an actual willing girlfriend of your own. She glared at him, but it was difficult trying to hate those glowing eyes. He was damn handsome. Now change back to a form where I can properly slap you she added. The wolf closed its eyes and within seconds Cameron stood before her, a little woozy and unstable. Raven put her arm on his shirt and helped steady him. Once he stopped moving, he looked at her suspiciously. Are you going to slap me now? he asked. Good boy, she said and patted him on the head. They walked out of the park, not saying much to each other. Cameron had all but forgotten that he was naked. Only the chill he felt when the wind gusted reminded him of his state. Eventually they reached the place where Raven needed to walk one way to reach her house and Cameron another way back to the shop. So, she said, remember to buy your things. We're not going to the mall until you do. God, I have so much homework to do tonight. Yeah, yeah, he said. Just stop by the shop and I'll let you know if I got the stuff. I don't have a phone or anything. They stood there. And, uh, started Cameron. Yeah? asked Raven. That stuff about the titty fuck and all, that wasn't me. Wasn't you? I mean, I don't care what you do. But how was it not you? Who else was it? The wolf. I mean, it has a mind of its own, and I can usually control it. But sometimes, if I'm not paying attention... You're saying your wolf alter ego likes titty fucking. How does that make any sense? You like girls with big tits, Cameron. You do. That's okay, I guess. But don't think buying a girl a boob job is a present for her. No, I know. It's okay. You're, uh... Cameron stumbled. Your tits are great, is what you were going to say, I think. Raven said, smirking. She put her hands on her hips and gave a small curtsy. And thanks, Cameron, for complimenting my tits. You're a true gentleman. Good night. 
Cameron decided now was not the time to lean in for a kiss. She thought he was an idiot, but she wasn't mad. He nodded dumbly, and they went their separate ways. Wayne was not looking forward to this. After the big fuck-buddy blow-up, Sara seemed really hurt, and had insisted that he come over for dinner and be introduced to her parents. She also told him this was a really bad idea, and that her father might forbid her from seeing him ever again. Wayne had tried to point out that this presented a contradiction, and maybe he shouldn't meet her parents, but Sarah argued that it was his fault he had to meet them in the first place. This reasoning made Wayne's head hurt, and seeing that pursuing the issue was just going to set her off again, nodded dumbly and assented. Sarah wasn't very specific about why her parents might hate him, and Wayne didn't want to force the issue just yet. He had a good idea why a white girl's father might not like him. Sure enough, when Sarah's father, Dale, answered the door, Wayne thought he saw him flinch. Are you the boy my daughter invited over for dinner tonight? He said. Yeah, uh, yes, sir, Wayne stammered, remembering Sarah's advice to call him sir. He hated doing that, but Sarah had insisted he do it. She said her daddy was still a military man at heart, and he put more stock in basic formalities than just about anything else. Wayne could see Dale was just like the jocks in high school, only with professional training in murder, to boost his sense of superiority. His eyes narrowed as he looked Wayne up and down, inspecting him. Wayne held out his hand. Dale stared at it like it was a smelly sock before shaking. If you break her heart, boy, he said, I'll have you killed. Wayne didn't doubt it for a minute. He nodded dumbly. It looked like Dale was about to shut the door on him anyway when Sarah barged in, pushing her father out of the way and kissing Wayne on the cheek. Don't kick him out, Daddy, I'm warning you, she said with a smile. She wore loose jeans and a long-sleeved shirt that didn't do justice to her body. Her dad probably didn't allow anything that remotely hinted at her feminine figure. If he was still Daddy, she was still probably Baby Girl. Before dinner, they sat in the living room, talking uncomfortably while Sarah's mom finished cooking. Wayne and Sarah sat chastely next to each other while Dale interrogated him. He asked Wayne first about what sports he played in college. When Wayne told him he didn't play any sports, Dale looked bewildered. It looked like he couldn't imagine the possibility. The whole time, Dale kept watching Wayne like he was keeping an eye on him. He noticed that the watchfulness increased whenever Wayne leaned near any of the little angel figurines that were placed on seemingly every available surface. Did Dale think he was going to steal one? If he was a racist idiot that would explain the flinch, calling him boy, and the questions about sports, Sarah might not even have told her dad he was black. He looked back at Sarah for reassurance and was reminded why it was all worth it. She had removed the long sleeve shirt when he wasn't looking, and under it she was wearing a tight-fitting, light-coloured t-shirt with a faded tattoo and paint splatter pattern on it. It hugged her form much better than the other shirt, and the material was so thin he could clearly see the shadow of a much darker bra underneath it. Dale must be more permissive than he thought. Maybe she had just worn away at him over the years. Sarah's mum called out that dinner was ready and the three of them made their way to the dining room. Wayne had never seen a family that actually ate around a dining room table. He and his parents usually just ate in the kitchen. But with the Myers, formality was important. Dale, of course, was at the head of the table, his wife at the foot. Sarah and Wayne sat across from each other at the middle. As Sarah's mum began to serve the lasagna, Wayne noticed that Dale was staring at him again, although this time he was looking down where he sat on the chair. He was looking to see if Wayne had pocketed something. Wayne shifted uncomfortably in his chair causing Dale to peer even more closely. So Wayne, said Sarah's mum once the food was served, tell us about yourself. Now dear, said Dale, I've already talked to the boy in the living room, there's no need to retreat that ground. Uh, that's okay, said Wayne. I go to the college, I'm majoring in history, the Dark Ages specifically. Dale snorted with laughter. Yes, I suppose you would, he said, grinning meanly. The racist bastard. Wayne decided this was a test and tried not to react. He looked back at Sarah for reassurance. She gave him a pleading smile and... He did a double take and quickly reached for his water glass to mask his surprise. 
The dark-coloured bra which had been under her shirt was no longer visible. It had been obvious before, and now all he saw was the light colouring of the shirt. He ate a few bites of lasagna and snuck another look. Her breasts were high and proud, and the only silhouettes he saw now were the two large circles of her nipples. How had she removed her bra in the last five minutes? She had been behind him and Dale when they moved from the living room to the dining room, but it hadn't been long at all. You like? Sarah asked with a giggle. Wayne was frozen for a moment, wondering if he had misjudged the family, and they were all nudists, and Sarah was just easing him into it. He had almost started to say, they're fantastic, when he glanced back at her face, where she was indicating a fork full of lasagna. She was giving him an evil grin. It was like she knew exactly what he was thinking. Oh, the food. It's great, Mrs Myers. Really delicious. He looked back at Sarah and couldn't miss her nipples poking up the flimsy fabric of her shirt. He averted his eyes and prayed Dale wouldn't notice. Not your best, I'd say, said Dale. A little salty tonight. There was an awkward silence. You know, offered Wayne. Actually, I think it's really good. Not too salty at all. Are you contradicting me, boy? said Dale. What would you know about good cooking? Oh, sighed Wayne sarcastically. I suppose all I know is fried food, right? Lots of oil and salt. Sounds about right, the man said. Wayne threw down his silverware and stood up. I'm sorry, Sarah, but I don't have to take this kind of prejudice. Wayne, sit! Sarah hissed. But Dale stood up and moved toe-to-toe -to -toe with Wayne. Go on, get out. It ain't prejudice when it's true. You people are all the same. Daddy, please, Sarah said, trying her father now. You people? Spat Wayne. Come on, sir. What kind of people are you talking about, or can't you say it? You. Dale was tongue-tied for a moment, then found the words. You. Gothics. Wayne had been so tense he nearly fell over. What? was all he could say. Daddy! Sarah yelled. How could you? Wayne, calm down. He doesn't mean it. You all hang out at the mall eating greasy crap when you could be getting some exercise playing sports. And you've all got your ridiculous pants that threaten to knock over the Mrs. figurines and scratch up our nice chairs. And studying a worthless subject like the Dark Ages because it's so spooky. What a waste of time. Wayne's brain hurt. Dale didn't like goths. He looked back at Sarah for help, but what he saw made his brain hurt even more. She was completely topless now. Come on, Wayne, just relax, OK? She pleaded. She was just sitting there, her hands in her lap. Her nipples were still at full attention, rigid peaks on her soft mounds. Wayne staggered backward, and his pants caught on an end table. A giant dried flower arrangement on top teetered over. He caught the vase, but dozens of delicate flowers spilled out of it anyway, most of them cracking and breaking on the floor. Oh God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he said, putting the vase back but leaving a disaster of dust and petals and seeds behind. He looked over at Mrs Myers. She looked stricken. We do not take the Lord's name in vain in this house, she said. Dale approached Wayne again menacingly. Boy, I think you'd better leave, he said in a low voice. Wayne looked around Dale at Sarah one more time, but now she had on the original formless shirt from the beginning of the evening and had tears in her eyes. I'm sorry, he mumbled, and made his way to the door, careful not to knock anything else over. He had pissed off Dale, made Sarah cry, and even had managed to annoy her mum. The evening was a complete and total disaster. As Dale walked to the front door to make sure the miserable boy had really left, the cell phone on his belt rang. He picked it up, looking out the window as the kid walked down the street. He didn't even own a car. Go, he said into the phone. Sunday, said a voice on the other end of the line. Good, said Dale, and hung up. The next day, Wayne begged Benedict not to have to work the counter. Benedict relented, 
giving him some menial tasks to do in the back. He couldn't bring himself to do even that and instead spent his time stewing on the new couch. He had blown it, royally. He'd had his chance to show Sara that he could go out with her on a regular date, that there was more to him than magically induced sexcapades. She wanted more than a fuck buddy, but there was no more chance of that now. Her parents had seen him and all but thrown him out the door. All he could do now was wait for the other shoe to drop when she called him up to dump him. Maybe she'd do it by text message. That would be easier. Wayne, called Ben from the front. Can you help this customer, please? I'm afraid I need to attend to something. Ma Before Wayne could protest, Benedict came through the door and on went on through to the lab. He couldn't just leave the customer at the counter, so he grudgingly got up and went to see what they wanted. He should have known it'd be Sara. Her eyes looked red and tired, well cried. Wayne opened his mouth to say, I'm sorry, but she said it instead. I'm sorry, Wayne. I shouldn't have done that to you so soon. Daddy is always like that. Well, almost always anyway. But I... He started, but she cut him off. I wanted you to see. If you can't deal with their shit, it's okay, I understand. But they'll get better, I think. He didn't forbid you to see me, Wayne asked, dreading the answer. He did. Oh, God. Wayne sighed. But, she added, he just said, I don't want to see his dumb ass ever again. So that just means you shouldn't come over for a while. A while? So you're not dumping me? he asked. As long as you don't dump me, she said forcefully. It's better that you know what you're getting into, because if we're going to be together, you'll have to deal with them. You can't just take the good stuff with me. You have to take all of me, and that includes my stupid parents. Wayne looked at Sarah and wondered if he could stand more interrogations, more accusations, certainly eventual pressure to get married. At least the food is good, no matter what your dad says. Sarah sobbed and gave him a hug across the counter. Come on, she sniffed. Invite me to the back already. Wayne motioned toward the door. Would you come back? He asked. Yes! She smiled and went through the door. Wayne joined her on the couch. He put his arms around her shoulders, something he hadn't done before. It was weird knowing he'd fucked the girl in the arse, but hadn't put his arms around her yet. By the way, I noticed something. Kinda weird at dinner. Oh, you did? Yeah. Uh. Your shirt. He said, looking at his shoes again. What about it? She said, perking up. It disappeared, actually. I was kind of surprised no one else noticed. Sarah looked concerned. It just disappeared. Like that. Well, I guess not all at once. At first you had a long sleeve shirt, then I thought you took it off because you had a t-shirt with a, a bra showing through, he explained. Sarah was nodding. Then at dinner I noticed the bra was gone. I could even see your nipples getting stiff. Then when your dad was yelling at me, poof, you had no top. Sarah gave him a huge full body hug. It worked. It worked. If she was sad before, now she was positively giddy. What worked? Well, I've always had this problem that Daddy doesn't let me wear any clothes I like. So I asked Ben if there were any spells that could help with that. He's been helping me learn to project an image of myself that's different from how I actually look. So you made your parents think you were still clothed? That seems risky. Sarah giggled, a sound he had been missing. No, silly, if I messed it up, I'd be grounded for life. Instead, I projected at you that I was topless. That sounds really complicated. Amazing. Wayne shook his head. It wasn't so hard, she said. I was wearing all those liars, and I just projected that some were missing, one at a time. So what you saw was really there, stiff nipplies and all. She giggled again. You just normally wouldn't have seen it. Next, I'm going to work on projecting images that aren't there at all. You know seeing you like that really messed with my head? I thought you were nudists or I was going crazy or something. Sarah pouted. Oh, sorry, baby, I just meant to tease you a little. 
As she said the word tease, she stuck out her chest, rubbing against his arm from top to bottom. Tease nothing, he said tensely. I don't think you realise what an effect you have. He reached over to grab her tit, but she slapped it away like she always did. Naughty, naughty. None of that now. Mum thinks I'm shopping at a boutique and I have to meet her there soon. Wayne stuck his lip way out and pouted. Don't worry, she said softly, getting up and kissing him on the forehead. There will be plenty of time for that later. I couldn't go into a dressing room with Mum with wet panties, could I? She topped it off with another giggle. Couldn't you just project that they were dry? Ha ha! Huh, maybe. Just be patient. Sarah left the room with a sway in her step, and Wayne wondered how he could possibly wait. Cameron woke up aching again. The couch, with its piercing springs and short length, made for a horrible bed. Morning light streamed through the small window, illuminating the dust in the air. It had to be eight or nine in the morning. By ten, the sun would be high enough that the room only received indirect sunlight. He sat up on the couch and noticed he was hairy all over. He had partially transformed in his sleep. Since he'd become a werewolf, Cameron had learned to sleep in the nude after he'd woken up a few times having ripped through his clothes during the night. It didn't happen often, just when he was hungry. Today, Cameron wasn't apprehensive about being hungry. Before, being hungry meant escaping to a sketchy part of town and hoping his victim deserved what they got. It meant taking a total back seat to the wolf, no questions asked. But now it was no longer something that made him think dark and bloody thoughts. Raven knew his secret and approved of his new method of satisfying his hunger. Now it was something to look forward to. Who would he get to fuck today? One thing was bugging him, though. When he had fed, it kept him satisfied for at least a week. But his exercise in the park was only four days ago. Was the werewolf getting stronger? Or was having sex not satisfying him as thoroughly? He laughed out loud, realising what he would have done just a couple months ago to be able, required, even, to have sex every four days. Cameron sat up, pulling the werewolf back inside and making himself fully human again. He twisted his back, his joints popping loudly as they cracked. He reached over beside the couch and rechecked the ingredient list. Today he would call Raven. He had gone to the drugstore, an Indian grocery store, and even made a long trip to Chinatown in the next city over to get some of the stranger ingredients on the list. The next few items were the ones she'd said they could pick up at the mall together. She would be proud of him, seeing that he'd done his part. There wasn't a bathroom in the basement, so Cameron threw on some clothes and marched up the back stairs toward the store. Old Ben didn't have a phone, so he would have to find a payphone nearby to call Raven. He should probably buy a cheap cell phone. As he neared level with the floor, he stopped. Sarah Myers was at the entrance to the store, holding the door open. It looked like she was leaving. She was twisting around, looking back in the store, and the old t-shirt she had on stretched to trace her curves. It looked like she wasn't wearing a bra and her hair was a mess. What was she doing here? Cameron waited until she had gone down the front stairs, then continued to the store. Inside, the intern Wayne stumbled out of the back room also looking bleary-eyed. Cameron put two and two together. Nice score, Wayne, he thought. Hope you like giggling. Morning, Wayne, yawned Cameron. Hey, do you have a phone I can borrow? You're Brandon, right? Yawned Wayne in reply. What are you doing here so early? I live downstairs, didn't Ben tell you? Really? I don't see you much. Wayne looked puzzled. And why? He started, but Cameron interrupted. I usually leave through the back exit. I gotta make a call, so can I. Wayne mumbled something and then went to the back room to get his phone. Cameron punched in Raven's number and reached her after nearly 30 seconds of ringing. She was pissed that he had called so early on a weekend, but was happy that he had gone shopping. She insisted, however, that she come over and check his work first. Cameron thanked Wayne for lending his phone. By the way, he added, who was the babe going down the stairs just now? 
Wayne puffed himself up. That, he said, was my girlfriend, Sarah. Cameron could have mentioned that he'd had her, but it didn't seem like the right thing to say. Nice, he said. Wayne smiled. Cameron nodded and went through the back, through the door marked Lab, Do Not Enter, which just led to a hallway. The bathroom was on the side of the hallway, and the lab itself was through the door at the end. That door had another sign on it reading, This truly is the lab, truly do not enter. He still hadn't yet gone through that door. Not yet, anyway. He turned on the light in the bathroom and showered, his stomach rumbling now and then. He dressed in the same clothes he'd brought and went back down to his cell to wait for Raven. She arrived toward mid-morning wearing a skirt, fishnet stockings and a thing that looked like a corset except the ties were just decoration. Cameron realised with a start that this was her idea of dressing up. Were they going on a date? He complimented her, making her blush. Even if straps and leather didn't really appeal to him, she really did look good. Raven sat down carefully on the couch, avoiding the most awful spring. She folded her legs under her and checked over Cameron's ingredients carefully. Cameron waited impatiently for her verdict. Pretty good, she said. Cameron's heart sank. Just pretty good? Well, she said, holding up a bag of spices. These seeds were supposed to be whole, not crushed. And these, indicating another bag, were supposed to be refrigerated, so they're rotten now. Oh, said Cameron. She smiled, her black lipstick shining in the remaining sunlight. It's okay, we'll fix it later, we can still go. Yes, said Cameron, and opened his arms and gave Raven a huge bear hug. He squeezed tightly, then jerked back when he remembered the danger of skin contact, then squeezed again when he remembered she was immune to his enchantment. Raven seemed to understand, and said nothing. They hopped on Cameron's motorcycle, Raven using an old beat-up helmet he'd found at a yard sale the day before. His cash supply was running low, but it would be enough for whatever they needed, plus maybe some new shirts. He was getting much more adept at shifting gears on the bike, and they cruised through the tree-lined streets with ease. Leaves had finally burst from all the branches and rustled in the breeze of their wake. The mall Raven wanted to go to was about ten miles from the store, on the edge of town. It was a typical suburban mall surrounded by parking lots and chain restaurants with nothing to distinguish it from any other. He found a parking spot for the bike near the entrance. They entered and Raven found the mall directory. Cameron was a bit taken aback by the crowd. So many cute girls from the suburbs were here, all looking so tender and juicy. Raven was pointing at the directory. OK, I hate them all, so let's make this quick, OK? The candle store has the right type of candles and this store has some of the African imports. I want to get some more shirts if we can, Cameron said. Mine are all nasty. Raven sniffed. That's for sure. Let's do that first. Cameron looked around again at the walking meat market all around them. Summer was really kicking in, and the girls' outfits were shrinking to match. Jean shorts, tube tops, and other flimsy things were drawing his eyes right and left. It had been a while since he'd seen so much cleavage in one place. Raven, one more thing, he said. What, maybe some pants too? Not a bad idea, she said still looking at the directory. I'm hungry, he said, trying to put emphasis on the word. Yeah, the food court is... Oh. She looked up in realisation. Yeah, he said. Raven rolled her eyes. Well, make it quick, I guess. And don't change, you know. Cameron hadn't thought about that. He had a lot of control now. He could probably resist the change especially on this first day of relatively light hunger. They walked around the mall toward one of the discount stores, where Cameron would be able to pick up a pack of five shirts for cheap. He was finding it difficult to concentrate because the wolf was pulsing inside him, making itself known. Every time a cute girl passed in shorts, he had to stop himself from reaching out to grab her ass. He knew she wouldn't be angry, she'd be his, easy as that but he had promised Raven that she would approve his choices. 
He was starting to sweat and he ducked inside a high-end clothes store to calm down. He pulled Raven along with him. His head was pounding. What's going on? She whispered. Sorry, he said. It's too much. Too many. Oh, my poor man, Raven said in mock sympathy. Well, figure out what you're going to do. Raven stopped. Or who? She finished. Raven nodded her head at Cameron, who turned around. A sales girl was approaching briskly. She was a few years older than them, with brown hair and cute, sexy librarian glasses and a sleek, one-ear headset for talking with the other employees. He admired her slim figure, dressed in a crisp red button-down shirt and a knee-length skirt. Is there anything I can help you with? She asked. Yes, there is. He turned and grabbed a random black shirt from the hanger, hoping that it was at least a men's style. A dressing room would do nicely. Can I try this on? Sure, follow me. The girl smiled. Elizabeth, her name tag read. Thanks, Elizabeth. He turned to Raven. How about I meet you at the next store? He offered. Raven shook her head, but also smirked. Don't take all day she said, as the salesgirl started leading him to the back where the dressing rooms were. Call me Liz, she said. The store was fairly empty. He watched her ass as she moved. The heels she was wearing caused it to sway back and forth nicely. It made him hard, and the wolf inside growled. It sounded muted, though, not a threat at all. Wow, Liz, Cameron said, still admiring her ass openly. Do you work out? What? She looked over her shoulder briefly, losing her composure for just a short moment. She probably got hit on by customers all the time. She'd have to have pretty thick skin to work retail. Are you trying just the one shirt? She went behind a podium and fished out a plastic tag with a number one on it. Cameron leaned on the podium with his arms crossed. He knew he was wasting time, but it was too much fun toying with his prey before he touched her. Sorry, that was sort of rude, he explained. I'm just looking for a good personal trainer, and I thought maybe... To his surprise, she smirked. No, I just run cross-country at school. You don't look like you need it anyway. Your girlfriend is really lucky. Her eyes roamed over his physique, enjoying the view. She held out the plastic tag. Cameron could brush her finger if he wanted to, but he just took it and started fidgeting with it. He was used to girls pushing him away, not flirting back at him. How far could he go before he had to touch her and let the magic do its work? He'd have to think quickly to defuse the girlfriend issue, but he wasn't stressing at all. If it didn't work out, he just had to shake her hand. A thought came to mind. Yeah, she says that sometimes, but I try not to believe it. She's always hooking up with other guys anyway. Oh, that's horrible. Liz made a sneer. Oh no, it's okay. We're, you know, open and whatever. He left enough of an awkward pause that maybe Liz would put two and two together. She bit her lip just a bit. He gestured toward the dressing rooms. Anyways, I'll go try this on. Wait, said Liz too quickly. Uh, the rooms are locked, so... She held up a key that looked suspiciously like her own house key. Down the hall, some of the dressing room doors were obviously unlocked and slightly open. Her face was starting to flush now, and she was breathing through her mouth with shallow breaths. Was she his already? Liz removed her glasses, putting them on the podium. She led him to the dressing room farthest in the back, making a valiant show of pretending to unlock the door before opening it for him. The room was handicapped accessible, so it was wide, but the ceiling was awfully low. If he transformed, he wouldn't fit, but he knew he didn't have to if he didn't want to. The need, the want was there, and the wolf deep inside was growling in frustration, but it would do as he wished. He started to walk through the door, but her hand moved down to meet his crotch, stopping him. She pressed, feeling his hard dick underneath. She looked at him with hunger in her eyes. I don't have a lot of time, she said with regret. She followed him and closed the door. Do you do this with all the customers? Cameron asked. 
Just when I'm bored and today I'm really friggin' bored, she said and leaned in for a kiss. But Cameron avoided her and moved into the room. The second they touched, anything she did was because of the spell. He wanted to see how much she really wanted without any help from magic. We have a rule, he said quickly. No kissing people outside. Sorry. Liz smiled, removing her shoes. So well behaved too. Any more rules I should know? Uh, I'll let you know if I think of any, said Cameron truthfully. Now I believe I have a shirt to try on. You may enjoy the view. Liz groaned in frustration and leaned against the mirror, watching as Cameron made a show of taking off his grungy shirt, flexing his muscles and twisting somewhat unnecessarily. He put on the new shirt and slowly fastened the buttons. He didn't watch her, hoping that ignoring her would drive her more crazy. As he got down the, the lower half of the shirt, he realised it would be tough to tuck it into his pants, which had become extremely tight. He removed the belt and unzipped the fly, desperately not looking at the hot girl just feet away. The head of his dick was poking out over the waistband of his underwear. He heard a soft moan and looked up. Liz was leaning against the mirror, knees bent, a hand far up under her skirt. They made eye contact. Stop teasing and fuck me, she hissed. She turned around, display her ass to him. She lifted her skirt up, showing him that her pantyhose had a giant wet spot. Cameron removed his pants and underwear completely, kicking them over his shoes. Pull those down, he commanded. She reached up and worked the pantyhose down to her knees, wiggling her ass back and forth, flashing her pussy at him. Cameron grasped his veined cock at the base and moved forward, watching himself in the large mirror approaching his conquest. The first time he would touch her would be with his cockhead to her pussy lips. He wondered if she would have a reaction at all when the magic kicked in. He leaned forward, touching her pussy to get his dick wet. Ah! She cried out in surprise, her eyes flying open and then squeezing shut again. Her whole body shook and she leaned hard against the mirror. Jesus Christ, I must be pent up, I just came, she said breathlessly. Cameron didn't feel the need to say anything, rubbed his dick against her wet lips a couple times and pushed his dick into her in one long stroke. He groaned in satisfaction. Ah, oh, shit, she yelled. Her cunt gripped his entire length, and it still pulsed weakly from the orgasm she just had. Cameron was glad for the magic now, because without it, they'd have half the mall security barging in if the spell wasn't dampening the racket she was making. Cameron grabbed her ass, feeling the tight, lean muscles, he pulled out seeing his dick covered in white pussy juice and fucked her again. She was bent almost all the way over now, her hands pushing against the glass to hold herself up. Harder, faster, breathed Liz. She was watching him in the mirror now as he increased his pace and she started fucking back at him to match. Cameron took this as a challenge and fucked her harder and faster, but her runner's legs matched him thrust for thrust. Their bodies slapped together loudly as they pounded each other his balls slapping against her clit. The wolf inside Cameron seemed furious that it wasn't being let out. It pushed and roared under his skin, but Cameron had complete control. Shit, 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 said Liz with every thrust, like a mantra. As the pace increased, she was having trouble getting the words out, grunting, she, 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 over and over. A long trail of pussy juice streamed down the inside of her thigh. Cameron felt the wolf inside whimpering now, a plaintive, pitiful feeling. And for the first time, Cameron felt bad for the wolf. It just wanted to get a piece of the action. Cameron could feel what the wolf felt, and he could tell it really didn't want to eat her. Not for food, anyway. And then suddenly, Cameron realised he might be able to train the wolf like a pet. He could let the wolf out just a little bit, as if on a leash, not by transforming, but by letting it into his mind. The wolf, seemingly aware of his thoughts, bathed him in reassuring feelings. I'll be good, it felt. Could he trust it? Don't fucking stop, said a voice outside his head. How could he let himself get distracted at a time like this? 
Cameron tried to resume his previous pace and closed his eyes. He visualised a leash around the neck of his wolf and sent it the impression of a rolled-up newspaper he'd used to bonk it on the nose if it got out of hand. The wolf sent back more reassuring feelings. If the wolf got away, would he really be able to stop it? Cameron shrugged inwardly and let go of the leash. The wolf bounded in his mind like a dog let outside after being cooped up for a week. Cameron felt his hands grasp Liz's bucking hips and pull her toward him, using his strength to stop her own motion, holding her still. She panted loudly. Why'd you stop? She begged. Cameron emptied his mind and his body started fucking her again, controlling her hips with his arms, keeping her still. She tried to buck back against him, but his powerful arms kept her in check. He was going to be in charge of the pace now. He felt his cock sliding into her as fast as before, and then he kept speeding up. Letting the wolf take control, not having to concentrate, Cameron found his body moving faster than he thought possible, his hips nearly a blur. Shh. Moaned Liz, enjoying every second. The slapping of their bodies increased until it sounded like a jackhammer and the stimulation spread over his whole cock was driving Cameron to the brink. He thought he would have come sooner, but the wolf seemed intent on fucking Liz until her pussy burst into flames. Liz's mantra built up in volume and pitch until finally she crashed over the wall, screaming long and loud as Cameron's cock continued to pound into her cunt at its inhuman rate. She went limp, but Cameron's arms held her hips fast. The wolf seemed focused on its own pleasure, and it didn't slow down one bit, fucking her through her orgasm. Liz's moans faded, but soon her mantra started again. She, she, she. Oh God, I'm going to come again. She moaned. Cameron groaned as he felt energy build up in the base of his dick and then explode in his own orgasm, pushing into her and holding her ass firmly against his dick as it jerked and spasmed inside her. This set off her third orgasm, and as he held her ass still, he could feel the muscles of her pussy rippling all up and down the length of his cock. The wolf sent feelings of gratitude to Cameron, offering its collar for him to reattach the leash. He did, and felt control return to his body. He flexed his cock inside her when he was done, and Liz shivered in pleasure in return. Cameron withdrew from her and let her go, feeling much better and calmer. The wolf was quiet, satisfied for now. He mopped up his wet dick with his old shirt. He pulled up his jeans and finished buttoning the black shirt, noting that it actually fit quite well. Liz was straightening herself up, although a popped button on her shirt and her general glow gave her away. Cameron looked down at the shirt, then at his disgusting T-shirt, wondering what he was going to do now. It's on the house, said Liz smoothing the material against his chest more energetically than was necessary. I'll get the tag removed. She left the dressing room, a bit unsteady on her heels. Cameron arrived at the next door with his chest puffed out a bit, still high from the sex. Liz was the first girl he'd fucked who'd really, truly wanted it, no help from magic at all. Although, now that he thought about it, he did have magic to thank for his awesome bod. But he felt like it had been more than just muscles. He now understood why people always blabbed on about confidence. He'd always thought that just meant he needed to act like an asshole, but it wasn't that at all. If the counter spell worked and he was no longer a werewolf, he probably would go back to his old scrawny self. That had scared him before, but now he felt different. If he could hold on to that feeling he had picking up Liz, the ease, the lack of pressure, he wouldn't need the body. But if it was possible, keep the body... Well, he'd do everything he could to figure out how. Cameron found Raven on the bench outside the store, glumly poking out a text message on her phone. Despite the mass of delicious bodies around him, he found they were no longer an unpleasant distraction. They were quite pleasant indeed. Hey, he said, barely getting her attention. I totally nailed her without even needing to touch her first. I don't need the spell. Raven rolled her eyes. That's really great. Nice shirt. Cameron beamed. Yeah, she let me keep it. This is huge. I didn't think I could actually get a chick to sleep with me without touching her first. Uh-huh, 
she said and got up. Do you still want to buy more shirts? Yeah, I guess, but Raven, this is a big deal. Raven interrupted. You know what, new rule? I don't want to hear about it afterward. You're just bragging. And what am I supposed to say? Good job on tapping that. Cameron closed his mouth. Uh, okay. Sorry. The two of them went inside, but Cameron could tell Raven was really pissed. She was trying to keep it bottled up, but wasn't doing it very well. She was quiet, withdrawing. After a few minutes of browsing, she announced she was going to check out the underwear section. Cameron correctly guessed that he wasn't invited. Cameron picked out some bulk shirts and found a pair of jeans for ten bucks that didn't look particularly well made but would do the job. As he took them off the rack, a girl looking at the display next to him dropped one of her hangers and bent down to pick it up. He looked over briefly and caught a view right down her cleavage. He was transfixed and felt a growl from within. She smelled good. Cameron shook his head and resumed wandering around the store, eventually finding his way to the underwear section. Despite his earlier conclusion, he went in anyway. He was surrounded again by young, hot girls all looking at frilly, sheer, tight-fitting things. They were all starting to look quite delicious. He caught sight of Raven in one corner and walked over to her. Something's wrong, he said. Uh-huh, she said, not looking up. I'm still hungry. At this, she looked up, studying him. You're sweating again, she noted. So you're probably not making it up. No, I'm not making it up, he hissed. I don't know. You seem to have a good time back there. Maybe you just want another go. Cameron shook his head vehemently. Sure it was fun, but this not cool. I don't know what's wrong. This has worked before. You saw. He racked his brain. Raven sighed. She looked like she wanted to stay pissed at him, but that helping him with his curse was too important right now. The other day I saw you transform into a werewolf, she finished. And did you transform this time? Oh shit, he said. The wolf inside made an odd panting sound, which Cameron decided was laughter. Had it known all along that he didn't have a choice? What do I do? Raven looked at him like he was stupid. I think you know. Cameron closed his eyes, testing his control of the wolf. The leash was still tight. Nah. I can wait until tonight and then we can go to the park again. Are you sure? Raven asked, studying him again. You look pretty shitty. Cameron shook his head again. Even if he wouldn't mind finding another hottie to bang, he couldn't let the wolf win the battle of wills. Let's buy this stuff. I'll change into these new jeans and let's get some lunch. I'll be fine. As they checked out, Cameron found himself back where he started when they first got to the mall. The wolf pulled his attention toward every female and put thoughts in his head about what he could do to them. He could fuck the cashier against the register. He could follow that girl into the stockroom. He could take that security guard on the Segway just for fun. He stopped in a men's room to change his jeans and found he had to concentrate to keep the wolf hair beneath his skin. The wolf was pulling on the leash and it required all his strength to hold it steady. He was sure now that he wouldn't last all day. As he exited the men's room, Cameron felt the leash slacken and the wolf pant. He waited, and still the wolf seemed calmer. It had been using all of its energy trying to get away, and now it had worn itself out. All tuckered out, doggy, he thought. You'll have your fun, just be patient. The wolf seemed to be resigned to its fate. Walking around, Cameron found his attention wasn't being pulled in every direction anymore. Maybe he'd last the afternoon after all. Cameron had never owned a dog, but he thought this must be what training was like. It took a lot of patience and determination to show who was boss. He met up with Raven on the edge of the cafeteria. It was a large space with a fancy indoor water fountain in the middle surrounded by restaurant stalls. It was big and airy with a few large trees, adding some life and colour to the space. Large windows in the ceiling let light spill onto the water, causing reflections to glint off every surface. Raven picked a table near the fountain, and they took a minute to enjoy the gentle rushing sound it made. You look better, Raven said. 
Yeah, I think the little guy got all tuckered out. Raven stared at him. Did you just say you jacked off in the men's room? Cameron laughed so hard he snorted. No, no. It's like there's a wolf inside me, I can feel it. It wants to go outside and play and I'm not letting it. I think it got tired of trying and gave up for now. But what you're talking about is not a new puppy. How many people did it kill before you took control? Cameron grimaced. I don't even know for sure, but I think it knows that having sex is more acceptable than killing. So it'll try again? Yeah. There was a pause. Raven furrowed her brow in thought. Does it realise that having sex doesn't satisfy it quite as well as killing? I don't know, he said, depressed. Let's grab something to eat and get the rest of the stuff. I don't want to be here too long. They went to their own preferred food stalls, Cameron picking something as cheap as possible to preserve what was left of his money. He met back up with Raven, and they walked back toward the fountain. Oh God, said Raven suddenly, then turned away from the fountain suddenly. What happened? asked Cameron. Raven whispered low. It's the three cheerleader bitches from school, Holly and her minions. Holly Light? She's all right, I thought, he said, looking around her at the girls. Sure enough, there was Holly, and two girls who looked a lot like her. One girl was a blonde, like Holly, only shorter and with not as big a rack, and the other was a brunette whose ass looked like it had been modelled directly from an apple. They were sitting at the table that Cameron and Raven had been sitting at. You remember that day I tried to ask you out and you totally blew me off? Just before the first time he'd taken the pills. Uh, yeah, he said. I just needed a friend to talk to because those three have been making my life hell for a year, she said, her voice full of venom. Of course, you don't know anything about her except how big her tits are. Kara and Caitlin are no better. Uh, sorry, Raven. Should we move? Nor fuck em said Raven. Then she sat down in a nearby chair and repeated herself. No, actually fuck them. What? he said, looking for a chair of his own. Fuck them in the ass hard, one at a time. You can use their pussies too if you want. Cameron looked around. The wolf was stirring again. Uh, Raven... Raven's dark eyes were locked on the three girls. Look at Kara, Cameron. She's the other blonde. Look at those lips. Are you looking? Cameron was getting fidgety. If he was going to train his personal demon well, he should resist temptations like this. But with Raven egging him on, it was hard not to look. Kara's lips were done with light purple lipstick. Yeah, sure. Wouldn't you like those big soft lips wrapped around your dick, sucking on the head then taking you deep inside? Raven stood up and moved close to Cameron. The wolf growled inside him. Cameron couldn't stop looking at the girls. She would enjoy it, Raven, he said. Raven whispered directly in his ear. And I would enjoy watching. Look at Caitlin. Hmm, her ass is pointed this way. Wouldn't you like to see your cock buried in that ass, dripping with sweat? I know I want to see it. Cameron imagined giving her ass a good smack. The moans she'd make. The wolf pulled on the leash, hard. Cameron only managed a grunt. He was sweating through his new shirt. Raven's voice lowered even more, and Cameron was barely aware that she was speaking the words. They sounded more like his own thoughts. And Holly, look at those tits. Some girls say they're fake, but I've seen them in the locker room. She loves to show them off. They're the real deal. What it would be like to give her nice big tits a good titty fuck. The leash broke. Cameron's will gave and he bent double as the wolf blasted to the surface of his skin. His muscles twisted and clenched with pain and his chest expanded suddenly, the buttons of his beautiful new shirt popping off one by one as his body expanded, the fabric giving way until there was nothing left but scraps. His new jeans, the cheap stitching ripping audibly quickly fell off his body. His skull stretched and rearranged and the werewolf howled not only in pain, but in satisfaction. Blood gushed to its cock, filling it rapidly to hardness. Cameron's locket burned hot against his chest, keeping
keeping this display from all in the room but Raven. Raven pulled her chair up close to the table, keeping her hands well out of view as they snuck down to start working her pussy. The thought of finally getting back at Holly had made her wet. Cameron knew if he didn't start fucking someone, anyone, the wolf would take over his mind as well as his body in its aim to feed. It might try to take Raven, or it might try to eat someone. He directed his attention to the three girls, and as it eyed their young, supple bodies, the wolf had no complaint. He crossed the distance to the table in a few long strides, his bulging cock leading the way, dripping pre-cum. He roared at the girls, but they only looked over at him like the wimpy tea nigger who'd cracked his voice mumbling, Excuse me! Uh, excuse you? Kara asked disdainfully. It seemed that the wolf didn't quite understand how the spell worked, so Cameron helped it out by grabbing the back of her head and forcing her mouth onto his dick. There was a slight popping sound as her jaw opened wide. Her eyes grew large as the magic kicked in. Suck, he growled. The cheerleader got the idea as soon as she made contact and started running her hand up and down his shaft, tracing its ridges and veins. She couldn't even get her hand all the way around it. Her mouth, affected by the magic, stretched bizarrely over the head, taking him in. Her other hand grabbed his furry thigh, holding on for leverage. She didn't quite seem to know what she was doing, but the wolf didn't seem to care. The contact of her teeth on his shaft didn't hurt at all. It was already thrusting its hips, catching the back of her throat and causing her to gulp uncomfortably. The wolf quickly turned its attention to Caitlin, and it grabbed her hair, pulling her out of her chair with a yelp. It pushed her down and forced her to her knees in front of him, pulling her face against his balls, which were swinging back and forth as he thrust into Kara's mouth. Spit and pre-cum dripped onto Caitlin's soft, white sweater, causing it to adhere to her breasts. Lick, he growled as the balls slapped against her face. Caitlin made an effort to comply, but she was staring up at him with a wide-eyed expression. The wolf turned finally to Holly, who was also looking at the three of them oddly. What did she see? wondered Cameron. How could anything they were doing be made to look normal? Maybe all she saw was them standing there, talking. The wolf leaned forward over the table, nearly touching snout to nose with Holly, looking at her with its deep yellow eyes. The girl leaned back in her chair, almost defensively, but there was nowhere to go but in the water. The wolf opened its mouth and licked her face from bottom to top with its long, pink tongue, covering her face in saliva. Holly gasped once and spit, then gasped again in that sexy way women do when they realise they've just gotten wet. In her leaned back position, her tits were prominently displayed, nipples forming points in the soft fabric of her own thin sweater. The wolf nuzzled her boobs, sniffing them and nudging them with its snout. Then it bared its teeth, gripped the thin cloth gently and tore away her shirt, careful not to scratch her chest. Underneath was a lacy white bra holding her luscious tits captive. A careful slice of the claw was all that was needed to remove that obstacle. Her boobs danced as they escaped, and the wolf watched them for a moment before licking them too. Its tongue glided up between them and then encircled each one in turn, licking concentric circles around each nipple then dragging its length over each point, causing Holly to jerk and moan. Cameron heard more moaning at his feet as both Caitlin and Kara had worked off their pants and were fingering themselves as they serviced his cock. He straightened back up again, looking down at the two pretty girls doing their best to give his giant cock as much attention as they could. Kara took her mouth off of the cock, resting her jaw for a while, and motioned for Caitlin to try. Caitlin shook her head. I can't open my mouth that wide, she complained. Try it anyway, urged Kara. Cameron got impatient and interrupted their conversation. Yes, do, he growled and gripped his cock, pushing it into Caitlin's mouth. At first, all he got was teeth at the very tip of his dick, but pretty soon his shaft was sliding easily into her mouth. Caitlin looked shocked and quickly put her tongue to work. Cameron looked over to where Raven was sitting, and saw a grim, determined look on her face. Her legs were spread wide underneath the table and her hands were out of sight. He looked at her face closely again and saw that her grim look was just trying not to betray any pleasure as she fingered herself. 
He grinned. Holly was transfixed, staring at her friends as they continued to suck the cock of the huge animal before her. When she'd first looked up and saw the beast leaning over her, she'd nearly wet her pants with fear. This had to be the creature that had killed all those people. They'd been torn limb from limb, and although they could have been killed by a stray big cat, she was pretty sure that it had actually been this thing. This... It had to be a werewolf. It was tall, sort of human-like with fur all over, a tail and a wolf's head, and looked nothing like the cougar that had been described by the local news team. When it had opened its mouth, she'd thought that was the end, but instead it just licked her. She thought she'd scream, but instead she felt a rush of pleasure at the contact. Moments before her brain had told her she was looking death in the face, but suddenly her brain was noticing how sexy it was. Randall Scott, head quarterback and current hookup, had nothing on the pecs that this beast flexed, and when it straightened up and she saw the magnificent cock and her friends, Holly's brain almost cracked. The beast was looking at her again. The two sides of her brain, the side that knew it was going to become lunch and the side that wanted to get eaten out, warred with each other. She looked at her friends, eagerly pleasuring that huge cock, and realised what they must have realised. If they were about to become lunch, there was nothing they could do to stop it. The fact that she'd never wanted to fuck as much as she did now, that helped. What do you want? she asked out loud. The beast grinned, rows of sharp teeth revealed. You! it replied in a growl. Holly felt her pussy clench in anticipation again, but her rational brain wouldn't stop imagining the meal she would make when it got tired of her. Couldn't it just shut up and enjoy itself while it could? Are you going to eat me? she asked. The wolfman before her almost looked shocked and paused, idly pushing the back of Caitlin's head while she sucked its cock. Only if you want it, the beast finally replied. Holly felt relief wash over her. But mostly I'm going to enjoy watching your tits bounce as I fuck you in the ass. Cameron was confused by Holly's question. She asked it like she could see what he actually looked like, but with his charm that was impossible. He decided that she probably just wanted her pussy to get some attention. She was in no position to make demands. Strip, on the table, he grunted. Holly stood up and arched her back as she shucked off what remained of her top. She looked less uncertain now and seemed to be posing for him, arching her back to show off. She turned to face the water and bent over, shimmying out of her capris and panties with a pop. Her wet pussy glistened in the reflected sunlight. She stood up, gazing at him with a look of hunger. Kara and Caitlin paused to watch her performance, their hands still stroking the ridged shaft. God, Holly, said Caitlin, you are so fucking hot. As Cameron moved toward the table, they backed off, reluctant to stop pleasuring him. They sat in their chairs and resumed fingering themselves as they watched. Holly climbed onto the table on her hands and knees, then rotated away from him, pointing her ass up at him. On your back, he commanded. Oh, he heard her say as she flipped over. I thought you'd want it that way. Why would she think that? She couldn't know. Cameron grabbed Holly's thighs, spreading her wide and pulling her to the edge of the table with a squeak. Holly's pussy was slick and ready, too bad for her. Cameron grabbed the base of his cock and stroked the head against her pussy lightly, just to tease her. His cock was plenty wet already. Then he lined up the thick head with the tiny bud of her asshole. She gasped, looking wide-eyed at his cock. It's too much. Oh, it'll fit, piped up Caitlin. Holly was still staring. How? Cameron smiled again and stuck his long tongue out. Magic. He pushed, holding onto her thighs with his paw-like hands, careful with his claws as always. Holly leaned her head back on the table, her eyes on the ceiling and her mouth agape. Her arse relaxed just a bit, and Cameron felt the head of his cock begin to enter. When he couldn't go any further, he pulled the tip of his cock out and pushed again. The magic began to help him, and he felt her sphincter pop closed over the head of his cock. There were moans of approval behind him. Holy shit, said Kara, 
and she jammed her fingers in her pussy as she came. Oh, God, Holly said, and looked down at her own arse in disbelief. Fuck me, I won't be able to do splits for a month. She straightened out her legs so they were pointed in a wide V above the heads of her friends. She reached down to play with her pussy, but Cameron growled. You can play with your tits, but that's it. Holly nodded obediently and grabbed hold of her nipples, tugging them sharply. Cameron resumed pushing his cock into her ass with slow, shallow thrusts, allowing the magic to resize the two of them until he could penetrate her completely. It took longer than he expected until he withdrew most of the way and saw just how much cock he was stuffing in her. Her asshole gaped, and he pushed back in until his balls touched her ass. Fuck, said Caitlin behind him. Jesus, said Kara, and they rubbed vigorously as they admired the great pink cock buried in their friend. Cameron heard the sound of an orgasm, but it sounded like it came from a couple tables away. There was another popping sound, but Cameron didn't know quite where it was coming from. He looked over at Raven and saw that she had forgotten to maintain her modesty. She had her legs up on the table now and had her hand deep in her pants. Didn't she remember that she wasn't in the normalcy field? Cameron was about to say something when he felt a tap on his shoulder. He turned to find a mall cop, a black man who looked like he also worked nights as a bouncer, looking at him inscrutably through his sunglasses. Excuse me, sir, Mr. Werewolf, sir, he said. And Cameron nearly lost his erection right then and there. He looked down at his charm, which was still hot against his chest. It was riddled with cracks, each of which glowed brightly. There was another small pop, and another crack appeared. It was breaking. The cop continued. Your, uh, display, sir, is getting me horny as fuck, so I just thought I'd let you know I was going to borrow one of your girls here. He was indicating Caitlin, who had stood and whose arse he feeling up. She had her hand on his crotch, and was squeezing a clearly hard cock inside. Cameron nodded slowly and the renter cop quickly dropped his pants, giving his hard dick to Caitlin to suck. Cameron started fucking Holly's ass slowly and finally took a look at the cafeteria around him. Far away, nobody seemed to notice what was going on, but as people sat closer to him, Cameron could see guys and girls shifting in their seats and glancing his way every so often. Closer still, Cameron could see Mulgo as clearly horny, watching the performance and stroking themselves. Some had hands down their pants, others with their cocks visible or tits pulled out of tops. At the tables just next to him, girls were in guys' laps, bouncing up and down on their dicks. Some girls had their hands in each other's pussies. Behind one tree, Cameron thought he saw two guys going at it. A full-scale orgy was breaking out at the mall cafeteria. Cameron looked back at Raven, who shrugged and mouthed the words, Fuck her! Cameron's sex-clouded mind needed no further suggestion, and he increased the pace, angling his huge body so Raven would have a good view of his cock pistoning in and out of Holly's arse. Holly had no complaints even as Kara climbed up on the table with her, positioning her cunt above the head cheerleader's mouth. God, Holly, please lick my snatch, I've always wanted it. Holly reached up, pulled Kara's arse onto her face, and they both groaned in pleasure. Holly went to town on Kara's dripping pussy as Cameron started pounding her ass in earnest. A somewhat nerdy-looking boy with glasses and his pants undone was watching as Holly ate out Kara and stood up, seemingly in a trance. He had to be only a freshman, but his dick was rock-hard and ready. He approached the table stroking it, and offered it to Kara as she ground her pussy onto Holly's face. Kara smiled and reached out to grab the boy's dick. She lost her balance and fell forward, reaching out to catch herself on the kid's shoulders. Cameron thought for sure the kid would collapse and cause a disaster, but he held firm and caught her. She ended up with her head next to his cock and needed no encouragement to take it in her mouth. After having taken Cameron's monster cock, she had no trouble taking the freshman deep and the kid's eyes nearly rolled up into his head. Behind him, Cameron saw the mall cop had bent Caitlin over a chair and was pounding her from behind giving her arse a good smack every so often. Caitlin seemed to love it and gritted her teeth in anticipation of every smack. 
Looking around again, it seemed the orgy was still confined to the same few tables around Cameron. Those outside the circle were adjusting themselves uncomfortably, or stroking themselves, but it was only those inside that had started fucking each other with abandon. Eight or nine couples and groups were now fucking energetically, surrounded by dozens of horny onlookers. Cameron's cock slid easily in Holly's ass now, and pleasant sensations were starting to build deep in his balls. The freshman getting blown by Kara demanded she fuck him, and she was more than happy to sit in his lap. The kid sucked her tits like a lollipop on Christmas morning. Holly's moans, formerly muffled by Kara's ass, now echoed off the high ceiling. Glancing over at Raven again, Cameron saw that a 30-ish blonde woman with large sunglasses had taken a seat next to her. She had her legs spread as well, and she had undone the zipper of her tight pants in order to allow better access. The woman's head was bobbing up and down on a cock that belonged to a man in a dark suit and sunglasses, who stood between the two women. The only thing improper about his attire was his hard, purple-headed cock emerging from his slacks. His balls had also been pulled free, tight with arousal. Looking at his face, he barely seemed to notice the attention, keeping his head up and scanning the crowd back and forth. Raven was staring at the man's cock as the woman sucked it, biting her bottom lip and studying the woman's technique. Cameron was disappointed that she found a simple blowjob more interesting than his butt-fucking of a cheerleader. How could he be less interesting? Cameron saw the man mouth a few words, and Raven licked her lips, then leaned over to caress his balls with her tongue. Cameron stopped thrusting in shock. The man moved over to give her better access, and Raven licked eagerly, taking his whole sack in her mouth. Cameron discovered he was growling. Oh God, came Holly's voice from the table. Don't stop. Sorry, said Cameron, unable to look away. Raven now had one hand wrapped around the man's dick. The woman's face was blocked by her hair, but it looked like she was smiling. My girlfriend is blowing another man. That bitch, spat Holly. Fuck me, she added. How could Raven do this? <laughs> she had taken the head of the man's cock in her mouth now, and her cheeks betrayed suction she applied. <laughs> she was cheating on him. Not just cheating, but shoving it in his face, showing off that she'd blow a random guy, but not him. <laughs> Maybe he was balls deep in a holly lights ass this very moment, but Cameron didn't have a choice. He was cursed, and he only had sex, because that was the best possible alternative. <laughs> Besides... She had told him to fuck Holly. He always made sure she gave him permission before satisfying his need, and she just turns around and sucks the nearest cock. He was only fucking Holly's ass because he'd wanted to impress Raven and give her what she wanted. But if she didn't care anymore, then he didn't have to restrain himself. Cameron looked down at Holly's neck, and an unfamiliar and animalistic urge stirred within him. He smiled to himself. Raven wouldn't be able to ignore this. A bitch, he thought woefully, wasn't really his unless he had her neck. Holly's head was leaned back, an act of subjugation to his werewolf brain. He wanted to bite her, neck, just enough so she knew who was in charge. The thought of doing this nearly made him come. He stopped moving his dick, leaving it buried in her and took his paws off her breasts. He leaned over, opening his powerful jaws, Small droplets of spit fell on her thighs. Her eyes found him. That's it, she said, and Cameron saw her eyes were filling with tears. Just make it quick. She thought he was going to finish her. Cameron could understand that. If you want to live, he rumbled, don't move. She sniffed, not believing him, and closed her eyes. He turned his head and bent toward her tiny, skinny neck. His head swam for a moment as he recalled the times he'd done this to unsuspecting homeless people and unlucky interlopers in the previous weeks. The quickest way for the werewolf to kill someone was to rip out their neck. Did Holly not realise what an honour it was to be in the jaws of a werewolf and survive? He closed his jaw gently, pressing his sharp teeth against her delicate flesh. She gasped and froze stiff. He bit down just a bit more, just breaking the skin the smallest bit. He breathed heavily through his nose and her scent filled his brain with desire. Nothing else around him registered but her. 
On a sudden impulse, he pulled his dick out of her ass, repositioning it at her cunt instead. She was sopping wet, not having been allowed to touch herself. Cameron pushed and the thick, ridged cock slid in easily. Holly's moans caught in her throat, where she couldn't release them properly without killing herself. This bottling up seemed to cause the pleasure to echo back down to her pussy, which squeezed Cameron's dick tightly. It feels so good, she whispered, and Cameron could feel her voice through his teeth. Don't kill me. Holly's pleas went unanswered. Even if he wanted to let go, the smells and tastes he was experiencing were too strong for Cameron's canid senses. He knew he wasn't going to hurt her, but she clearly didn't understand the symbolism of the act. But Raven would understand. He knew she was looking at them right now, filled with jealousy that he was claiming Holly as his bitch, and not her. He could have saved this honour for her. He leaned onto the table further, thankful that the tough mall furniture could take both their weight. His broad chest pressed against Holly's tits, and her ass rotated so he could fuck down into her. His bitch started to relax a little as he resumed fucking her and caressed his head lightly, running her fingers through his fur and then daring to play with his pointed ears. This felt better than he expected, and he rewarded her by pounding even harder. The pressure resumed, filling his balls again, harder than before, and it was redoubled whenever her cunt gave his cock another tight squeeze. Holly's moans began to return, although they were strangled in her throat. She couldn't bring herself to give herself to him completely. Her pussy squeezed again, and Cameron realised his bitch was in a state of near-constant orgasm, and with a few vigorous thrusts he came hard, deep inside her. His jaw involuntarily tightened again, biting down a little too hard, and he felt a small trickle of blood against his tongue. The salty taste was something he realised he'd missed. His dick spasmed, pumping cum into the girl, and Holly's cunt squeezed him hard and didn't let go. Her whole body tensed and didn't relax until he was spent. Cameron waited until they were both relaxed, before he released her neck and pulled out. Holly's neck was dotted with tiny holes dripping blood. His werewolf side knew instinctually that her bloody neck would be a symbol to all others that she was claimed. His human side realised she'd probably just have to wear a scarf for a couple weeks. Her arse and pussy were both gaping and dripping. Her eyes were closed and it looked like she'd passed out. From pleasure or fear, he couldn't tell. The rest of the world returned slowly and Cameron could hear the other groups finishing as well. Those who had just finished jerking off wiped themselves up zipped up their pants, and went back to eating their food or talking with their friends. They still idly adjusted themselves occasionally, though. It seemed that Cameron's power was still in effect, but at a lower level. The couples who'd been fucking were behaving like new lovers, cuddling and caressing each other, enjoying the afterglow. Some of them simply got dressed, held hands, and wandered off into the mall. Others just sat there, looking doe-eyed at each other. Cameron stood up at his full height and admired his prey on the table. He looked over to Raven to see how she'd reacted to being so publicly snubbed. She was gone. So was the man whose cock she'd been sucking. But the woman who'd been next to her was still there, breathing deeply like she was coming down from a particularly powerful orgasm. Cameron jerked around, looking past the fountain for Raven amongst the crowd, but she was nowhere to be seen. You're looking for someone called a familiar voice. Cameron turned back around and saw the woman Raven had been sitting next to zipping up her tight, pocket-covered pants, leaning back in her chair. She still wore the sunglasses, but it didn't do a thing to disguise her now. Lana. Cameron was on her in a flash, his claws against her neck before even he knew what had happened. All thoughts of Raven's betrayal were wiped from his mind. He bared his teeth, letting drool drop onto Lana's new track jacket. He leaned on her, smearing her with the various fluids that covered his crotch. Lana's face was still, and her sunglasses prevented him from seeing her expression. All he saw was his own bright yellow eyes reflected back at him. He squeezed her neck, ready to draw blood. I don't think you'll want to hurt me right now, she said. Cameron hesitated. He didn't have to kill her anyway. He was making direct skin contact. 
she'd be his soon enough. She continued, If I don't meet up with that fella you saw in five minutes, it's your pretty girl's throat that'll be in danger. Cameron smiled. We'll just wait a little more, I'm sure. Once you're fighting to get at my cock, you'll be happy to tell me where she is. Lana smirked and reached slowly up to remove her sunglasses. Actually, right now there's nothing in the world I want less than your sloppy seconds. I'm immune to your charms now, you see. Cameron narrowed his eyes, hoping to see some flash of tension in her expression, but Lana looked at him steadily. Somehow she'd beaten his curse, much like Raven had. What do you want? he grumbled. Lana smiled. Much better. First, you'll get the fuck off me. Cameron backed off, letting her get up. She sneered at the mess he'd made of her pants and made a show of retrieving a napkin from the nearest table and wiping herself off. She was revelling being in control, making him wait. Cameron suppressed another growl, fearing that she'd just delay further. Why had Lana come back? Cameron had left her in the basement pleading for her life that the people who'd hired her were going to kill her. That hadn't happened. Was she working for herself now, getting revenge? That man in the suit could have been working for her. Or maybe they'd come to an arrangement and she was still working for the same people. Cameron noticed Lana was still taking her time. He couldn't wait any longer. What do you... He started again. This ain't about me interrupted Lana, and I am the least of your problems right now. I'm just getting square with my clients. I help them get your little slut. They forgive me for fucking up the first time, and none of you crazy psychos ever sees me again. Why do they want Raven? he asked. Lana shook her head at his apparent stupidity. Oh, come now, Cameron, that's easy. They want to get to you. You all proved hard to get, so they figured it was easier to set up a trade. We kidnap the slut and you'll trade yourself for her. Or I'll follow you and get her back first. Lana shrugged. You are a dummy, you know that? They got three guys with guns on your little chicky at all times, ready for you to do something stupid like that. Tell you what, I'm going to go now. My friend over by the Taco Bell is going to keep an eye on you. You disappear from view before we've made our little getaway and you can kiss the slut goodbye. The man by the food stand looked like the other man, only with a moustache. He had his finger in his ear and seemed to be talking into a radio in his cufflinks. Why do they want me? Cameron asked, but he had a pretty good idea. You hurt someone real special, and they weigh they figure your death is the only repayment. But I couldn't help myself. It wasn't my fault, he roared. Fuck if I care, said Lana. You'll get a message tomorrow about where we're going to meet. You turn yourself in and your girl goes home. Unharmed, he asked, but Lana had already turned around, waving, bye, and started walking toward the exit. Cameron started to follow her, but the man in the suit jerked and started talking very fast. Cameron stopped and took a step backward. For a long minute, Cameron watched Lana's form as it receded out the door. Glancing back at the Taco Bell, Cameron saw the man disappear behind a door into a service corridor. It was time to get out of here. Suddenly Cameron felt someone grab his cock and he nearly jumped out of his skin. He looked down and found a woman, middle-aged, kneeling before him and quickly stroking his flaccid dick, licking her lips in anticipation. Another woman stood shyly behind her, her eyes wide. Jimmy's got nothing on this, damn, the first woman said. I get it next, said the other. Hey, stop it, said Cameron. He backed off, but the women followed. More were noticing him and approaching. He started to hear the slapping sounds of fucking again. He finally felt satisfied again, but his magical effect was already reasserting itself. If he didn't do something about his broken charm soon, he'd be buried in a pile of horny women. The charm was doing more harm than good at this point. Causing a panic now could let him get out of the mall without anyone getting in the way. Cameron reached up and pulled the charm off his neck, breaking the chain. Suddenly everything went quiet and the woman stopped stroking his dick. The cougar! Someone yelled. That ain't no fucking... What the hell is that? 
The quiet quickly dissolved as all hell broke loose, everyone scrambling to put as much distance between themselves and the giant beast that seemed to appear in the middle of the food court. Even the mall cop beat a hasty retreat. The volume of noise increased as tables and chairs overturned, clattering to the ground. Someone pulled a fire alarm and the court filled with a blaring, ear-splitting squeal. Finally, thought Cameron. Thinking quickly, Cameron bounded into the nearest store, employees and customers falling over themselves to get out of the way. He knocked over the shoplifting sensor and few racks of clothes for show, and then pushed through the back door and into the storage section. Back in the cafeteria amidst the chaos, Holly, Kara and Caitlin calmly cleaned themselves up, dressed and fixed their hair. On an upturned chair, Holly found a scarf that didn't look too out of place wrapped around her endured neck. As they walked calmly to the nearest exit, she inhaled deeply, then sigured. Randall is going to be such a step down. Kara and Caitlin nodded in agreement. In the back of the store, three stock boys sat on the boxes they were no doubt supposed to be moving. They looked like statues, frozen in place and staring at the creature looming over them. Cameron faked a lunge toward them and they fell head over heels off their seats. Cameron gave them enough room to get by him and out the door. As they left, he could hear them yelling, It's in there, and it almost got us. The wolf needed to disappear, and soon. He poked around the back and found a dark, quiet corner where he could transform back into human form. Thoughts of Raven filled his mind as he pulled the fur back in his skin and felt his stature slowly shrink. If Lana was telling the truth, she wouldn't be harmed. But Lana had lied before. Should he track Lana down right away? Or just wait until the transfer? If Raven got shot because Cameron was too hasty, he couldn't live with himself. How long would he have to wait? Wayne peered at the clock, confused. It was a cuckoo clock, kitschy but otherwise unremarkable by the looks of it, way back in a corner of the store and high up by the ceiling. The little bird was popping out of the doors and making its noise as it had been for the past five minutes. It didn't even make sense that it would chime now. It wasn't even the top of the hour. When it first started going off, it was just one little cuckoo. And Wayne barely heard it. But then it went off again a minute later, and then twice shortly after that. Now it was going constantly, even speeding up. Wayne was worried that the clock's mechanism was going to break itself. The more he thought about it, the more Wayne was sure that he'd never heard the cuckoo clock ever going off before. Maybe Benedict had tried to fix it with only modest success. The non-stop cuckooing was driving him crazy though, so Wayne was looking for a way to put a stop to it. He preferred not to get destructive, but it could come to that. Wayne turned around to find Ben and ask him about it, and started as he saw that Ben was right behind him. He was about to open his mouth when he saw the look on Ben's face. His eyes had gone wide and his little glasses threatened to pop off his nose. His lips were actually trembling. Ben, is everything all right? Wayne asked. Benedict's eyes seemed to pull back into focus and settled on Wayne. He cleared his throat. No, my dear boy, you must get away as fast as you can. Are you sure? Benedict interrupted. Away! Now! Wayne didn't need to be told three times. Cameron shivered in the cool storeroom air. Now a naked human and cowering in a corner, Cameron wouldn't stand out too much from the crowd. After waiting at least 15 minutes, the alarm had stopped and the sounds of panic had died away. It was getting a little too quiet. Did he hear a radio crackle out front? Cameron approached the door on his hands and knees. Oh my God, there's a monster in there, he yelled, pushing the door open and staying out of sight. As long as they didn't shoot right away, he should be all right. It was eerily quiet in the main corridor. No sounds came from the rest of the mall. A police bullhorn squawked. Please evacuate the store immediately. We're covering all the exits. Cameron grabbed some sweatpants and a shirt off a rack, threw them on and adopted an appropriately panicked expression. He ran to the front of the store to find three officers wielding handguns in an arc around the store entrance with piss-your-pants frightened expressions on their faces. Behind them, running down the hall to join them, were several more officers with the words animal control emblazoned on their shirts. 
There were no other people around. The crowd had apparently all been evacuated. The officer with the bullhorn lowered the mic and motioned for him to get out of the store. Just get out of here, he said in a hoarse whisper. We'll take care of it. There's a medic station outside if you're injured. Cameron hoped that the injury station was just a precaution. He hadn't caused any injuries, right? He ran out of the store and down the hall, leaving the police to watch the storefront. He wondered how long they would stay there until they realised the creature was gone. Outside was pandemonium. Everyone was running this way and that, trying to get to their cars. The blare of car horns filled the air as cars jammed the narrow lanes. Cameron smelled smoke and saw to his left that two cars trying to leave had gotten in an accident. One of the vehicles, a minivan, was on fire. A mum and her two kids stood on the curb nearby, watching their car burn with a sort of helpless calm. An ambulance was parked nearby and a tarp had been strung between it and a small tree. That was the medic station, Cameron guessed. There were only a few police officers running around, apparently trying to block of roads and set up a perimeter of some sort. Under the sound of the car horns, Cameron could make out the sounds of more sirens on the way. Cameron took one last glance around, but it was clear there'd be no way to find either Lana or her men or Raven. He found his bike unharmed and unlocked it. He manoeuvred through the jam of cars easily and in seconds he was back on the road, passing a convoy of ambulances, police cars and even a SWAT vehicle. Nearing town he heard more sirens, but was surprised when a fire truck passed him going the same way. The truck took the next right, the same way he was going. Cameron rounded the corner and looked up. A column of smoke was filling the sky. It billowed and pulsed, tinged with red like a beating heart. At the base of the column was the building that housed Old Ben's magic within reach. Raven woke up groggy, not remembering having gone to sleep. Her eyes drifted open, but she saw only darkness. She was cold and had a pounding headache, a low, dull throb that made her dizzy. Her hand tried to rub her head, but she gasped to find her arm was restrained. Snap Adrenaline rushed through her body as the memories of the mall flooded back. She had been watching Cameron as the beast fuck Holly, in the arse, when she felt something cold pressing into her back. A man behind her explained he'd shoot if she didn't start playing along and suck him off. Raven had no choice, so she did what she was told. Soon Cameron had gotten pissed off and stopped watching her long enough for the man to stick her with a needle. Now she was here. She opened her eyes wide, trying to see anything. All was inky blackness except for two or three small green lights off to her right. It looked like they were ten feet away. Whatever machine belonged to the lights was whirring quietly. Otherwise, the only sound was the dull roar of a ventilation system. She tried moving her limbs one at a time. Her arms and legs were held with thick leather cuffs pulled tight. From the feeling of bare metal against her skin, she was either naked or hardly clothed. Her protection ring was gone. Raven started to hyperventilate with panic. She shut her eyes, though it did nothing to change her vision. Somehow it helped her calm down and she tried to think of anything she could do. Her mind came up blank, and so she started to cry. A sudden clang of metal shocked the sobs out of her, and Raven opened her eyes as wide as they would go in the direction of the sound, her breathing still heavy but slowing down. A wedge of light appeared on the floor and grew as a door slid open. Cold fluorescent light briefly spilled into the room before a silhouette filled the doorframe and flickered a switch. The room became lit with a dim red light. Raven screamed at the man in the lab coat at the top of her lungs. She swore, she threatened, she begged, but the man carried out his actions as if she weren't there at all. He was walking around the room, checking various readouts on equipment laid out against the wall. Getting no reaction and growing hoarse, she switched tactics, closing her mouth defiantly and concentrating on committing everything to memory she possibly could. She was on a gurney in the centre of a large room with a long mirror on one side. She had no doubt it was a one-way mirror for observation. Various tubes and wires were attached to her body, applied neatly enough that she didn't even feel them. Most of the man's face was obscured by a surgical mask. A doctor of some sort? His eyes were visible behind thick technical glasses with telescopes affixed to them. He was making his way closer to her bed, and after she had calmed down he came nearer. 
He reached into a pocket on his lab coat, took out a small metal case and put in on a table next to her gurney. He flipped it open and withdrew a syringe filled with a shimmering liquid. Raven's eyes widened, but she forced herself to stay still, jaw clenched tight. The man ignored her and stabbed her IV bag with the syringe, injecting the liquid. Raven watched helplessly as the substance trickled down the tube toward her arm. A warm, pleasant feeling spread around her arm and to the rest of her body, and soon she was unconscious again. Cameron vaulted up the back stairs towards magic within reach. He always hoped he'd be the type of person that would run into a burning building, and he was pleased with himself that he was. In his untransformed but magically altered state, he felt more able to bear the heat and smoke. The stairwell was only somewhat choked with smoke and there was no fire visible. On the second floor, though, the door to the shop leaked puffs of blackness around its edges. Cameron pushed it open. A cloud of ash spilled out of the shop and enveloped Cameron. He sank to his knees, coughing and spluttering. His illusions of smoke-resistant powers vanished. His eyes stinging, Cameron looked around the shop. Everything was on fire, a lifetime of magical treasures and trinkets melting, warping and combusting. Occasionally a jar or beaker would explode, its magical contents spraying and glass shards embedding themselves in the nearest bookcases. Cameron took note to stay away from those aisles in case any of those potions were poisonous. Ben! he yelled, but got no answer other than the roar of the flames. Cameron stayed low to the ground, crawling toward the counter, looking for Ben, or any sign of him. At the same time, his mind worked to figure out how Lana's people had found Ben and his hideout spot. Had he been seen leaving the shop? Had he been followed? But what did it matter, anyway? They had taken Raven and they had probably killed Ben, his only link to a cure for his werewolfism. He could have all the ingredients on the list, but only Ben knew how to brew the potion. And even if the recipe had been written down, with the shop in flames it was surely lost. Ben! He yelled again. Cameron had explored the whole shop area, which meant Ben must be somewhere in the back rooms. The heat was getting more intense by the minute and the smoke was forcing him lower and lower to the ground. He crawled behind the counter and through the door to the library room. The couch, the new, wonderful couch, looked like it had already finished burning. The cover was blackened and consumed in most places, although it looked like the stuffing hadn't burned. The bookshelves were like walls of flame, the books providing more than enough fuel to the conflagration. Remnants of what looked like a rope snaked across the floor haphazardly. The smoke had gotten so thick that Cameron had to hold his breath to move around, then duck close to the floor to take a breath. He wouldn't last much longer, magical or not. Cameron heard a thump from inside the door to the lab hallway and shuffled over there as fast as he could. He stumbled, gasped, and sucked in a lungful of smoke, causing him to cough and retch. His eyes were getting bleary so he stumbled towards the door, desperate to get out. He pulled open the door, praying that the smoke wouldn't be worse inside. Instead, it looked like the fire hadn't yet spread that way. The hallway to the lab was mostly clear, with a thin cloud of smoke hanging at the ceiling. The door closed behind him. He leaned against the wall and caught his breath, the dull roar of the flames just outside the door seeming suddenly far away. He rubbed his eyes, trying to get them to stop stinging, but it didn't help at all. He blinked until they were somewhat clear, and as his eyes focused, he saw something in the bathroom doorway. It was a shoe attached to a thin leg, and it was moving, just slightly. Ben! he yelled, his voice hoarse and scratchy. He coughed, trying not to gag again, and crawled over to the door. The leg moved a little more, but only weakly. Cameron rounded the corner of the doorframe. Benedict was sprawled on the floor next to the sink, breathing quick, shallow breaths. A small leather-bound notebook lay in his lap. His skin was bright red in patches and there was black soot on his face under his nose and mouth. He was clutching his left arm which was blackened. There were patches where Cameron couldn't tell where his clothing stopped and skin started. Cameron choked back tears. Ben, what happened? Did you see who started the fire? How did they get past your... 
defences, whatever. The old man shook his head, asleep, on the couch. And someone broke in? Ben, we've got to get you out of here, he said. He moved to put his arms under the old man, but he pushed him away and shook his head weakly. No, he whispered. Oh, so can you teleport? Do you have a broom around somewhere? Cameron looked around the bathroom. Maybe Ben had come to this room for a reason. The old man put his hand on his arm. My boy, he said, I am finished. Cameron couldn't accept it. What do you mean? I can carry you... Mr Cameron, please settle and listen. There are things you must know. Cameron forced his mouth closed. The old man didn't look like he had a lot of time. You are probably most... concerned, he started and coughed. With getting you out of here, Cameron finished for him. Ben smiled. Be honest, boy. With the completion of your cure... Cameron grimaced. Ben's eyes found his and locked onto them with unexpected intensity. Mr Cameron, there is no cure. Cameron's mouth dropped open until he got another lungful of dirty air and started gagging and spluttering again. What? he choked out. I am truly sorry, said Ben, now unable to look at him. But you gave me the spell. You did this to me, why can't you reverse it? Just undo what you did. Cameron was yelling now his anger smothering the sympathy he knew he should be feeling. My boy, said Ben quietly, I don't know how. The truth of the matter is that I am not a very good magician, barely second rate as my tutor put it. In many ways, you and your friends are more talented than I. What I have achieved I earned through hard work and study, not through intuition or raw power. Why the very first day you entered my store, my identification pendant malfunctioned. I tried my best with your formula, but after your overdose I gave you the shopping list to buy myself some time. I contacted some of the greatest minds in magic, hoping they would give me an actual cure for you. They reacted with horror at my ineptitude and said the recipe was irreversible. Your blood had bonded with the werewolves permanently. Even now I lay here dying because I fell asleep on the couch with my pipe still lit and there is nothing I can do. Cameron had to sit down. He felt like he'd been punched in the gut. There was a loud crash somewhere behind them. The building was collapsing, because the old fool fell asleep smoking. So I'm doomed to become a full werewolf. Its blood will just get stronger and stronger. Not necessarily, said Ben with conviction. The condition will not progress as long as you never feed. You must be strong, but you are under no death sentence. Cameron was shaking his head. I don't... I can't... Oh, Ben. One thing, maybe one thing. Don't you have any more normalcy charms? The old man shook his head again. Those charms did naught but focus your thoughts. The normalcy projection was yours. The crystal was but a cheap plastic catalyst. You may have to concentrate, but you can do it yourself. You, all four of you, are quite powerful wizards. I regret I shall not see you grow. There was another crash and the whole room shook around them. Benedict weakly pushed against Cameron with the spine of the book he'd saved. This book will help you all keep progressing. Now go, get out and take it. Or, I'll turn you into a frog. Cameron looked at Benedict. The man he always thought was a powerful wizard toying with him, playing games with his life was instead revealed as a weak student of magic in over his head. He didn't know whether to thank the dying man or spit on him. Save him or kill him. He reached down and took the slim volume, dropping it in a pocket. Goodbye, Ben, he said, and left. His mind was elsewhere as he leapt out a window and landed smoothly on his feet in the alley. The man looked out through the one-way mirror at the subject lying sedated on the gurney, for the brief period she was awake, she'd been a feisty one, that was for sure. He hoped that tendency would translate well. He checked his watch. Things would start getting interesting soon. His earpiece beeped, indicating an incoming signal. Bob will be there momentarily, said the voice on the other end. 
The man acknowledged and pushed a button until the one-way mirror was totally opaque. Annette. Lana had been walking with the bobs for at least an hour, twisting this way and that in the large complex. Even in the dimly lit hallways they kept their sunglasses on. Occasionally they passed other people in the halls, some bobs, some in lab coats. But given how far they were walking, the place was much bigger than the small number of personnel seemed to justify. After helping them kidnap the girl, she'd thought they'd be done with her. But the bobs had insisted that she accompany them back to their headquarters. They'd insisted on blindfolding her for the journey, so she wouldn't know where it was any more than the girl would. Now they were leading her through this maze of hallways, obviously trying to disorient her. But they had to know that someone as good as she would be able to learn her way around. Perhaps it was just another test. As they walked, they filled her ear with intel about some sort of new super soldier program and how she had helped them achieve a breakthrough somehow. They were talking circles around something but weren't getting close at all to explaining what it was or what it had to do with the girl. Suddenly they stopped in front of a nondescript door and opened it. It had no number or any distinguishing characteristic Lana could see. They motioned for her to enter and she found herself in some sort of observation room. Along one long wall there was a large pane of one-way glass, although at the moment it was dark. At one end of the room, a lab dork looked at three screens, clicking around and occasionally making notes on a pad. Several plush chairs were lined up against the wall along the length of the room, no doubt for observing whatever was behind the glass. Toward her end of the room stood a solidly built older man in uniform, whose posture indicated he was very much in charge. Taking the hint, Lana saluted. It was the right move. At ease, said the man. And have a seat, Ms. Bob, sir, she said dutifully, and sat in one of the surprisingly comfortable chairs along the back wall. The other two Bobs sat down on a couch further along. No need for combat aliases here, he said. Once you've met Dale Myers, you're at a much higher level of classification, and I could have you bumped off like that if there's any problem. He grinned, mouth only. Lana, sir, she said, and made a mental note. This guy is insane. I had my men tell you a little about what we're doing here, Ms. Lana, but it's hard to understand without seeing it for yourself. Twenty years ago, I had a breakthrough that put me on a long road that has led me to where we are today. Very soon we'll be finishing that journey. I give you the soldier of the future. He pushed a button and the glass turned transparent. Lana's mouth fell open as she took in the room on the other side, illuminated in red. It was some sort of operating theatre, and restrained on a gurney in the centre was the young girl she'd helped kidnap. She snapped her mouth closed again, but Myers had already noticed. What you see before you is not a teenage girl. It is raw material, mass, that we can change and alter as we see fit. Jenkins, explain. The lab geek piped up. Using nanotechnology, we can rewrite the form of the subject's mass to our own specification. Not only can we increase muscle density, but we can design new, more advanced muscles from the ground up. We can also rewrite its neural pathways. We can create the perfect soldier, said Myers. More than perfect, actually. What they were describing was impossible, but whatever they had planned for the girl didn't sound pleasant. And what's wrong with using one of your own men? Lana had always had trouble keeping her mouth shut, and she certainly couldn't help herself now. The lab geek answered again. Too much mass. We found that the more existing mass there is, the harder it is to reshape. So we've been using subjects of smaller mass and getting better results. And with our new methods, strength to weight ratios are much higher, so it'll still be super strong. Lana's unease was growing by the minute. The callous disregard for human life didn't bother her. That was central to her job description. But her targets were never innocent bystanders. What had this girl done to deserve this? There was also part of Lana that realised she was apprehensive for another reason. If their little science project worked, there was a good chance she'd be made obsolete. It couldn't possibly work, could it? Her only comfort was that Maya's insanity would probably get in the way of good decision-making. But why her? she asked. Myers stared through the glass. 
We've had good success altering mass. Now we need to test our neural pathway controls. If we can rewire Mr. Barnes's girlfriend to attack him without mercy, there are no limits to how we can program future subjects. And what about this new breakthrough? Your incident Mr. Barnes gave us an idea. We had been trying to make a human better than human by rewriting their DNA, often using highly efficient feline elements. But the results were never as good as we'd hoped. Mr. Barnes, in his fully vulpine form, proved quite effective. Perhaps we haven't been going far enough. Perhaps we shouldn't be so concerned with maintaining a strictly human appearance. Strictly human, Lana said, trembling. She'll probably grow cat ears at least, said Jenkins giddily. Lana looked back through the glass. The girl looked like she was sleeping peacefully. From his references to past failures, she guessed there was a good chance the girl wouldn't survive the procedure. There was a soft beep from the computer setup. OK, analysis is complete. Proceeding with mass reconfiguration, reported the geek. Myers took another step toward the glass, watching the naked girl intently. Make yourself at home, Miss Lana. This will take a while. Lana braced herself for the worst, imagining the girl writhing and screaming as the literal fibre of her being was rewritten. But instead, nothing seemed to happen for a long time. The girl slept peacefully, unmoving. Lana asked once what she was supposed to see, but Myers glared at her with such insane intensity that she succeeded in shutting herself up after that. After a long time, she thought she saw a change. It was like watching the stars at night. Stars don't seem to move until you stop looking for long enough. Through the evening and into the night, what she saw was a peaceful, gradual transition. Lana wasn't sure, but she thought she could see the girl's muscles change as Jenkins had described. But it was hard to be sure anything was happening at all until her skin started slowly sprouting jet black fur and a tail emerged from underneath her. Lana couldn't stop watching. Jenkins had undersold the extent of the changes. The girl didn't just grow cat ears. Her entire physique was transformed. Her skull lengthened and became sleek, and even her eyes seemed to get larger in her head. The most drastic skeletal change seemed to take place in her legs, where her bones changed lengths, her knees moving high up and her feet lengthening to form the characteristic digitigrade posture of a cat. The girl had already been fit, but the process made her form lean and tight, barely constrained power visible even when she shuffled in her sleep. Sharply defined muscles tensed and relaxed, causing her new coat to ripple hypnotically. The computer beeped and it seemed like everyone had to remember to start breathing again. The process was complete. The cat girl on the gurney was so dark she seemed to suck the light of the room into herself. She made an involuntary stretch, her form stretching as long as it could, her breasts pulled up high on her chest and her new claws extending from her hands and feet. One of the bobs gasped. Lana realised that Myers had created a creature not only of unspeakable deadliness, but heart-stopping beauty. Enemies would line up to be slaughtered by her. Cameron looked up and down the alley and thought about his next move. He needed to track Raven down but had nothing to go on. He'd assumed the same people who kidnapped her also torched Ben's place, but that theory was out the window. He took two steps toward his motorcycle when he fell smack on his face. Something was grabbing his ankle tightly and pulling him up in the air. The wolf wanted to take over, but Cameron wouldn't let it. It was too risky transforming out in the open. Cameron looked at his leg and saw a thick metal wire coiled around it. He tried to grab it, but his arm was yanked backwards and out of reach. He was turned over as more wires grabbed his other limbs and turned him upside down. Immobilised, he could do little but grunt as he was slowly rotated in mid-air and brought face to face with Wayne. Wayne looked like he had been crying and his tears were fueling a rage that burned in his eyes. <laughs> Who and what the hell are you and what did you do to Benedict? He demanded, voice shaking. Wayne, you know who I am, put me down, you idiot, said Cameron, trying to keep calm. All four wires pulled in opposite directions, causing immense pain. A fifth wire whipped itself around his neck and squeezed. Cameron fought to keep control. I've never seen you in my life, asshole. 
I'm Brandon, Cameron choked out. And as he said it, he realised that without his normalcy charm, Wayne was seeing his true face instead of the Brandon projection. Liar. You don't look anything like him, Wayne said. Cameron choked again, unable to form words. Black spots were starting to crowd his vision. Inside the wolf was going nuts, but Cameron couldn't risk escalating anymore. Wayne had him beat. <sighs> he managed. What's that? said Wayne. He allowed the wire around Cameron's neck to loosen ever so slightly. You lent me your phone? Oh, sure. I lent Brandon my phone. What does that prove? Cameron closed his eyes and tried to focus. There was only one way Wayne would believe it was him, and that was seeing Brandon with his own eyes. Old Ben had said he didn't need the normalcy charm. Now his life depended on Ben actually being right about something. He tried to remember the charm hanging around his neck, what it felt like. Was there an energy running through it? A certain warmth? Oh, come on. Don't pass out quite yet. I'd like some answers before I rip your limbs off. Wayne's voice was far away as Cameron reached within himself, looking for some sort of clue. What was he supposed to do? How had he mastered his transformation? The wolf was pulling on its leash almost constantly now, but it was so much easier to control. And that was his original breakthrough, picturing the wolf and imagining it as an animal that could be trained. He looked at it now, a desperate, scared thing. He reached around its neck and fastened the tie to a string he invented with his mind. He imagined a weight on the string, a small tacky pendant with an oversized jewel. He looked, and the wolf grinned as the imaginary charm hung around its neck. Cameron opened his eyes and realised he could breathe. He coughed involuntarily. Wayne was looking at him differently now, a flicker of recognition in his eyes but his posture was still shot through with suspicion. Who the hell are you? Wayne asked again. My name, said Cameron, breathing heavily, is Cameron Barnes and I need your help, Wayne. Why should I help you? Cameron said the only thing he could think of. I know who started the fire. I know who killed Benedict. Wayne grunted and dropped Cameron to the ground. Raven woke up feeling different. It wasn't something she could put a finger on right away since she was still hung over from the sedative the man in the lab coat had given her. The substance still seemed to be playing tricks on her because something about the way her legs touched the table and the shape of her mouth seemed off. It wasn't until she shifted around on the table and felt fur rubbing the wrong way that she realised something was seriously wrong. And when the red lights flicked on and she looked at herself in the suddenly bright light, she heard herself yowl instead of scream. As you can see, said Dale Myers to Lana, the subject is initially traumatised at its altered state. Jenkins, please help it calm down. Lana watched the lab geek click a few buttons on one of his screens, and the commotion in the other room immediately ceased. Level 1 neural control confirmed, he said. You wouldn't believe how long it took to get just that far, Dale mumbled under his breath. The bobs seated to Lana's right chuckled quietly to themselves. Increasing restraint range of motion and moving to neural control stage two, said Jenkins as he clicked around on his workstation. In the other room, the cat girl's arms and legs raised and lowered robotically, the restraint still tight around her limbs but now paying out short lengths of chain to allow for movement. Testing went on for over an hour, each time introducing slightly more complex movement or combinations of movements. Some of the stages caused her to make various noises, from droning vowel sounds to cat-like meows to purrs. This last noise was something Jenkins thought of on a whim, wondering just how much feline anatomy had been introduced into the subject. He had to call it Stage 29B to insert it into his list. Sometimes the subject's reactions would cause Jenkins to get a slightly worried look on his face, but all the tests did seem to be passing. Once he mumbled, that's not quite as expected. But after Myers barraged him with questions, he kept any further comments to himself. Stage 69, whispered one of the bobs, and they both chuckled again. Did not copy that, said Myers forcefully. Could you repeat, gentlemen? 
They looked at each other slowly, trying to keep their faces straight. Bob here was engaged in speculation about, uh... Bob faltered. I was positing that neural control stage 69 would permit me to have sexual relations with the subject, the other Bob said, daring everyone else in the room to be embarrassed. Jenkins kept his gaze fixed on his screens, but turned a shade of red. Myers swivelled his head and looked at the geek with genuine curiosity. Lana looked out through the one-way mirror and said nothing. The cat girl was still forcibly relaxed, breathing slowly, her breasts rising gently up and down. What about it, Jenkins? Do we have adequate control over the subject to enable that behaviour? Myers asked. I think from a physical standpoint we don't have that fine-grained level of control, he admitted. Well, not yet, sighed Myers. The bobs shrugged. But, Jenkins continued, and then men all turned their heads in unison. We should have adequate emotional control to make the subject amenable to... that. Out of the corner of her eye, Lana could see he had turned an even brighter shade of red. The bobs high-fived. Excellent, said Myers, turning toward the bobs. Proceed. And the there was a pause as everyone in the room tried to figure out if Myers had just said what everyone knew he was saying. Jenkins made an effort to close his mouth. Myers was looking at the bobs. This will be an excellent demonstration of our capabilities. Wouldn't you agree? The bob with the bright idea pointed at himself. Me, sir? You, him, both. What's the difference? Get in there, or are you not up to the task? Lana's ears were on fire, but she said nothing. If she was honest, she was wet at the thought of the bobs in there with the girl. There had been something in the air since the transformation had completed. Even lying prone on the gurney, her every move was effortlessly powerful and sexy, and all of their minds had been wandering around the same place. It just took a lunatic like Myers to walk right up to it. What guarantees do I have that the subject won't eviscerate me? Asked Bob, no doubt thinking of the silvery glints they'd all seen at her fingertips. Jenkins demurred. Given our recent progress and the tests we've conducted, I feel fairly confident that... Fairly? The other Bob interrupted. Myers stared daggers at him. May I have a moment to confer with my partner? Said Bob. Granted, said Myers through his teeth. The bobs turned their backs on the others and whispered briefly. They turned around with stoic looks on their faces, inscrutable behind their sunglasses. They nodded. I should add, gentlemen, that we are performing a completely scientific experiment. As such, be advised that you are not to force the subject physically in any way. Verbal instructions and encouragement only. Is that understood? Understood, said Bob, and they exited the observation room. Myers turned to Jenkins. Do it, he said. Jenkins, visibly sweating, pushed a few buttons. Then he reached over to the wall toward the one-way mirror adjustment, but Dale snapped at him. Get your hand off of that control, Jenkins. I plan to observe their behaviour very closely. With that, Myers unzipped his fly and sat down in one of the chairs. I suggest you all do too, he added. Lana already had her hand discreetly in her pants and didn't need to be told twice. Raven's shock didn't wear off by itself. Instead, she had found her mind yanked away of this unfamiliar body. She became an observer, unable to control her movements or voice. This wasn't entirely a bad thing, because it prevented her body from going into a full-on panic attack and the crying, gasping for air, and loss of consciousness that might have followed. Not being in control of her limbs or even her breathing... Raven started to feel like she was floating off the table and into the air. Her perspective receded upwards, and she watched as her arms started to raise and lower themselves. Her sense of calm was unnerving. Without a body to react, her emotions couldn't rise to the level her brain knew they should be. Instead, she was forced to just think. She had no idea what had happened after she was knocked out. And was that hours before, or was it weeks ago? How long had she been gone? The thing she was looking at now, from ten feet off the ground, was roughly the same height as she was, but it was hard to find anything else familiar. Maybe her brain had been transplanted into a new body, 
or perhaps she'd been hit with a powerful magical spell. The room's decorations weren't anything a magician would choose, though. She just didn't have enough pieces of the puzzle. Raven found herself gliding downwards toward the body, like being lowered on a rope. She was starting to regain conscious control of herself again. She found she could wiggle her head slightly and tried lifting her right arm gently. She succeeded, but suddenly she was yanked away again, back on the ceiling. As the experiments continued, so did this pattern, drifting down and then getting pulled back up. Jenkins adjusted the various hormone and cognitive parameters that he hoped would correspond with sexual arousal. It wouldn't take long for the parameters to take effect. There was no need to fully detach her conscious mind as he had done during the testing stages. Simple violence, avoidance and submission rules would be enough. If anything went wrong, he could run an emergency stop macro that would halt any undesirable behaviour. The girl had passed all the physical tests with flying colours, but he'd noticed some wear-off effect with the mental parameters. Every five minutes or so, her brain patterns started drifting back toward normal, and he had to keep reapplying the Deserid settings. He made a note to automate the process later. He also saved a copy of the entire parameter set. With any luck, he could convince Myers to let him evaluate the subject, too. Raven blinked and found herself suddenly back in the feline body again. No gentle glide back this time. She also was starting to feel warm and anxious. Her ears pricked, something they had never done before. As she heard a motion in front of her, there was someone outside the door. Before, when the door opened, it had clanged, but with her large new ears, the metal boomed like a cannon as the lock released. She tried to remain calm, but she was starting to hyperventilate. Her arms started pulling at the restraints at her sides, her new claws scratching lightly at the material. She jerked back and forth on the short lengths of chain, glancing around the room at the corners, vents, obstacles, anywhere she could run and hide. Raven heard herself making a weird, low-pitched yowling noise. The wedge of light appeared as it had before, and two linebacker-sized men in suits walked through the door. Raven's body tried to contort into a shape it had never taken, her back trying to arch, and her mouth stretching open impossibly. She heard herself hiss at the men and felt all the fur on her body stand up on end. One of the men's eyebrows twitched slightly upwards, betraying his surprise. Raven was still hyperventilating, but she wasn't feeling light-headed at all. Her mind felt clear and aware of everything in the room at once. She locked onto the man's eyes with an unblinking stare. He whispered into his wrist, but Raven could hear him clearly. The other man moved around behind her where she couldn't see him. You sure she won't bite, kid? he asked. He glanced briefly at the other man as he got the response. He didn't move for a good minute, probably listening for more information, before he crossed the room and approached the side of the gurney. Raven felt a surge of energy as her right arm ripped out of the restraint, shredded from her involuntary scratching. It whipped out farther than she thought possible, heading straight for the man's face. His head jerked back with a surprising lightning-quick reflex, but she still grazed his nose with one claw. A small line of red appeared. The man put on a show of looking calm, but Raven could smell him sweat. She liked the smell. Impressive, Kitty, he said, grinning. The smile didn't look forced. But are you sure you want to kill me? The lab geek informs me that Kitty is coming up on her cycle shortly. Raven swung at the man again, but he was well out of reach. At the same time, she scratched furiously at the other restraint and tried pulling at it, but it suddenly seemed impossibly tough. She felt herself slowing down and began to feel lethargic. Her fur was no longer standing on end and her spine had relaxed. She lowered her arm and continued staring at the man. Raven wasn't sure because of their sunglasses, but she suspected this was the man she'd serviced in the cafeteria. She dwelled on the memory for a moment and found herself admiring his hulking appearance. According to him, the man continued, cats, unlike humans, go into heat periodically at which time they become very... receptive. He unzipped his fly and pulled out his dick. Raven heard him hold his breath, and he took a step closer to the gurney. She tried to swipe at him again, but all she could manage was a lame, clawless flick. He started stroking his cock, 
leaving his pants on, and she watched, enraptured as it grew. Like the rest of him, it was thick and powerful. Rather than waiting for this period to occur naturally, he can induce it on command. Is pussy wet already? Raven knew the answer, of course. Her body was sending out signals and even her brain was beginning to listen. She knew her best chance of escape was right now, while she had an arm free and the man was vulnerable. A simple swipe of her claw and his guts would spill all over the floor. Escape just didn't seem quite so urgent anymore. She stared at his cock, growing by the second and already dripping precum. She wouldn't be able to break out of their control now. Maybe their control would wax and wane as it had before and she could find an opportunity when it was at its weakest. For now it was easier to sub it to the growing Archie between her thighs. She let her legs open as much as the restraints would allow and arched her back. She made a low sound, more like a human moan than the cat sound she'd been making before. The man's head angled down slightly. Now, are you going to be a good kitty? The cat's head nodded, but it was Raven who said, yes. The man smiled wider as he removed his glasses. His eyes were dark, piercing, and knew what they wanted. She heard another zip as the other man undid his own pants behind her. The man put his glasses on one of the movable tables and began to undo his tie. His movements were methodical and unhurried. I know you want to be a good kitty because good kitties get their catnip his dick bouncing slightly when he said it. But even though you're being a very good kitty, we need to get that arm back in the cuff. Raven felt herself meow in complaint. No cuff, no catnip, he said sternly, and nodded to the other man behind her. The other man grabbed her right wrist, but Raven didn't even flinch. His grip felt oddly weak. Or was she stronger now? Her eyes were locked on the first man as he removed his shirt and pants revealing the chiselled physique she'd been hoping for. She barely even noticed as the second man refastened the cuff to her arm, discarding the ripped section. When he was done, he moved around to the front, keeping his hand wrapped around her wrist, and she was able to get a look at him for the first time. She hadn't heard it through the fog of her lust, but he had already stripped completely. He wasn't quite as hulking as the first man and his cock was not quite as thick, but it was long, and Raven enjoyed watching him as he stroked his long cock. Long cock and thick cock, that was the best she could do for names. That made her giggle in spite of some small part of her brain still devoted to logic. It was an exotic, musical sort of laugh. See, said thick cock, she likes being tied up, don't you, kitty? Long cock moved his hand from her wrist up her arm, exploring the sensation of the fur. Moving upwards went against the grain and raised the fur, downwards smoothed it out. A heavenly, silky sensation. Raven's tail started spasming in response. It was really starting to get uncomfortable back there. Hopefully they'd let her turn over eventually. Longcock continued stroking her, petting her, moving his hand over her stomach, feeling the tight, defined muscles under black fur. Thick cock was more up front and cupped her breast forcefully discovering the circular whirl the fur created there. Her nipples were already just visible where the fur thinned at the peaks. Raven groaned and twisted towards his hand, her spine twisting in unexpected ways. Damn, with flexibility like that, I bet she can eat her herself out, remarked Long. The hand on her stomach had moved to her thighs, and Long stared intently at her cunt as his thumb stroked closer and closer to her wet lips. Using his other hand, he started moving her ass toward the edge of the gurney. Thick played with the other breast and started moving his cock towards her face. You're a good kitty, aren't you? asked Thick. You know what'll happen if you do anything bad. Raven didn't understand what he was worried about. She wasn't going to try to escape until at least after he'd gotten her off. Because you got a lot of sharp teeth in there, so you better be careful. Is that a good idea? asked Long, looking up. His fingers didn't miss a beat, rubbing right next to her pussy lips now, and her ass strained for him to put his fingers in her even as her upper body still pushed her breasts against Thick's hand. You know how few women can fit this cock in their mouth? I haven't had a decent blowjob since I was barely a teenager. Thick actually looked serious. Kitty here is gonna have no problem. 
He grasped her head with one hand, flicking her tall ears once or twice. He tapped the end of his dick against Raven's thin black lips, and she opened up, keeping her teeth out of the way. He probably wanted to just jam it in there, but he was being smart about it. She had to open wide, and then wider, her jaw working in that strange way it had when she hissed. She pressed her tongue against him and licked the head of his dick. Oh God, she's even got that sandpaper tongue, groaned Thick. He seemed to get a thought and spoke out loud, presumably to a microphone monitoring the room. I'm assuming you can turn off her gag reflex, kid. A speaker over by the one-way mirror squawked, done and done. Thick held onto her head and pressed forward all the way to the back of her mouth. He was so strong, and she had never eaten a real cock before, but this was a fantastic specimen. She ran her tongue over the pulsing veins that ran up and down his length. He pressed further, and even though she knew she wouldn't choke, she was still amazed as the cock reached the back of her mouth and continued down her throat. He only stopped when her mouth was flush with his groin, her lips against his balls. At that moment, Long pressed his entire tongue against her cunt and licked upward slowly. Electricity shot from her crotch through her nipples and back down again, and Raven groaned. Something started vibrating in her chest and she started purring along with the groan. It was heaven. Jesus, this is heaven, said Thick, echoing her thoughts. She'll make me blow vibrating like that. His face was sweating and he looked like he was concentrating deeply. Long continued to lick her pussy until it and his face were sopping wet. He got up and started positioning his hip so he could fuck her. Have you even been fucked before? he asked. Thick withdrew, still wary of Raven's teeth, and Raven let his cock leave her mouth, a long trail of saliva dripping on the gurney. I've had bigger than yours, she purred, bending the truth. She'd had dildos of increasingly improbable size, but she'd never actually fucked a boy before. The idea of turning her first time over to some scrawny teenager with a hair trigger had always seemed so unappealing and she was never hot enough to get a football player to notice her. This wasn't how she'd imagined her first time, but she could hardly argue with the quality of the meat. Or maybe Kitty wants something that will actually satisfy her, said Thick. Boys, boys sighed Raven, looking from one to the other. You can both have me. Long couldn't hide his surprise. Jesus, she really wants it. It really works, he muttered. Thick, always trying to appear confident. But she could still smell that sweat. Tried to take the lead again. All right, I guess that means you get her ass and... Raven hissed involuntarily. She realised the overwhelming urge to fuck these men's brains out had momentarily decreased. She felt like she did earlier during the experiments when she had drifted down and was starting to get in control of her body again. There would be only a little time before she'd become a complete doofus again, so she had a chance to act. Should she just kill them and leave? No. There were others, who knew how many, behind the glass, and when they caught her, they'd discover why she'd been able to break free from their control. She needed them to think she was totally under or else she'd never have another chance. Assuming Cameron didn't ride to her rescue first, she'd have to bide her time and wait for the right moment. And what would she be doing until then? Probably getting fucked a lot. She began to think maybe she was some sort of experimental sex toy. During this brief moment of clarity though, Raven could do her own experiments. She tried the hiss again, drawing it out a little longer, just enough to get their attention. She tried the hiss for two reasons. First, because the sensation was new and alien, and two, to see what reaction it would get. The inhuman sound definitely provoked a response in the two goons. The froze immediately, probably without realising it. She was talking directly to their lizard brains, not that there was much more to them. Now that she had their attention, though, she could tell it was already too late. Her control was slipping. Nobody gets my ass, she said, and at that moment she felt her libido yanked back up to maximum. She looked from one dick to the other. Neither of them was as big as her favourite dildo, which was a little disappointing. Maybe Thick was onto something. Put them together. 
Raven realised she'd been absently mindedly rubbing herself already and tried stuffing two, then three fingers in her snatch. She reached around with her other hand, pulling against the restraints, and stuffed two more fingers inside, pulling herself open wide. She barely felt the strain. See? You can both have me. Raven thought she heard a pin drop, but it was just a drop of her cum falling on the gurney. Ugh, said Long. She turned on her side, facing Mr Long. Get up here, she said clicking her juice-coated claws on the gurney behind her. Her tail was twitching wildly in anticipation. He was looking unsure. Do it, croaked a new, older man's voice from the speaker against the wall. Whoever was watching on the other side sounded as pent up as Raven was. Long clambered up onto the gurney awkwardly. The poor guy was so nervous his erection had started to droop. Thick had to adjust the restraints so Long could get under her arm. There was so little room that Long was right up against her, his whole body rubbing against her fur. The feeling of her soft coat sliding against him was returning him to full strength in short order. A couple times, her tail hit him in the face, and he'd be right to guess she did it on purpose. Raven locked eyes with Thick, who had moved next to the gurney and was stroking his cock slowly with his strong hands. She moved her ass against Long's length. She grinned at that as it regained its full hardness. He pulled back, grasped his cock and pushed it down to rub it against her pussy. Not willing to wait any longer, Raven twisted her ass impossibly and forced his cock head into her pussy. She kept her eyes on Thick, whose dick was getting to be a purple colour she'd never seen before. She gyrated slowly, working Long's dick into herself. It was hot and alive in a way her dildos never were, and she could feel it move slightly as he breathed and even as his heart beat. But she wanted more. Once Long bottomed out, Raven took a moment to savour the feeling. She didn't feel stretched out hardly at all, but he was deep. Thick grasped the leg of hers that was on top and lifted it up, using his chest to hold her open. He lined himself up to fuck her sideways. Raven wondered briefly if this was such a good idea after all but her hacked brain waved the thought away. She looked again and knew that it was right. Thick pressed this tip of his cock against the top of her pussy, watching Long's dick slide ever so slightly as he felt the contact. He looked up and made brief eye contact with his partner, but they both looked away quickly. Men. Once he found her entrance, he pushed hard and her cunt began to stretch to accommodate him. Oh fuck, said Raven. Oh shit said Long, and he reached around Raven and crossed his arms over her chest, cupping her furry breasts tightly. He buried his head in her back and kneaded her tits, pinching the nipples. Raven thought he might be overcompensating, trying to focus on something other than the sensation of another man's dick against his. Thick let off the pressure, and Raven yowled in complaint. He hadn't even gotten the head in. I'm not sure pussy can take it, he said. Raven's face transformed into a hideous visage of fangs and squinted eyes. You're not trying hard enough, you wimp, she growled. God, even grown men weren't as good as toys. This made Thick properly angry and he found her entrance again, pressing harder and finally really leaned into it. The gurney creaked under the weight. The pressure on Raven's cunt was immense, but she knew it was going to work. She forced herself to relax just a little and suddenly Thick's head slipped in with a squishy pop. All three groaned in response. Long continued kneading her breasts as Thick pushed in, her channel stretching to fit the second cock. It was more full than she'd ever been, than she'd ever imagined possible. Raven was complete in a way she'd never felt before. Thick finally bottomed out, and although Long was longer, Raven wasn't sure something as thick as Thick would fit that far in her. The combination of the two was perfection. There was a moment of stillness broken only by the soft grunts and groans of the two men and the cat girl. Thick was looking down in awe at the cunt stretched lewdly around two dicks and began thrusting in short strokes, his thick cock sliding tightly against her clit and his own partner's cock. The pressure of the two cocks pushed Thick up against the top of Raven's cunt, sending shockwaves through her clit and also deep inside. Raven put her hand over Long's and scratched it just a little bit. You better start fucking me too. Long did as he was told and thrust as best he could on the gurney. 
He moved smoothly with luxurious sliding strokes. Thick, on the other hand, seemed to be imitating a jackhammer, pounding her cunt as hard as he could. Their different rhythms were dissonant and awkward, pulling her ass this way and that on the metal surface. As the men continued fucking, they started to move their cocks in harmony, and they were rewarded as Raven began to purr and moan again. She shut her eyes, relishing the feeling of the two cocks moving in exact opposite directions, giving her pleasure coming and going, rapidly building her orgasm. The men's grunts became more pronounced and the thrusts harder, and soon their strokes were synchronised. Instead of pushing and pulling, they were stabbing Raven's cunt in perfect unison, as if it was one man with one impossibly giant cock fucking her, holding her breasts and holding her thigh at the same time. Maybe fucking Cameron would feel like this. That thought caused her to cry out and tense up, her orgasm almost on top of her. Yes, Cameron's werewolf cock was probably as big as these two combined. She'd seen it in action twice now, and she couldn't pretend it wasn't everything she'd dreamed of. She'd been keeping a professional distance from him while they worked on collecting ingredients for the spell. She could have just said he could fuck her instead of random women, but the jerk needed to earn it. He'd been such an asshole at school after all. But here she was, just about to come, and all she could think of was, it should have been him. No, but Raven didn't have time to dwell on that thought as her orgasm finally hit, and she wailed, seemingly every muscle in her body tensed simultaneously, her hand on long squeezing and drawing blood, her cunt squeezing tightly around the men's cocks over and over. Long groaned, partly in pain from his hand, and squeezed her tits tighter than ever. He came too, his dick spasming against her walls and thick cock. Both Raven and Long gasped in post-orgasmic sensitivity as they realised Thick was still pounding her cunt. He shoved the gurney roughly, and Long's dick slipped out of her, his cum dribbling after it. He extracted himself from under her arm and rolled somewhat gracelessly to the floor, spent. Thick was pounding faster again and seemed dissatisfied with the angle she was in. He put a hand on her thigh and pushed, trying to roll her over. Raven was struck again that the force of his arm seemed weak and tried pushing against him just a bit. It was easy to slow him down, and her tail moved itself into a more comfortable position in case he did it again. Oh, so Kitty thinks she has a choice, he gasped between thrusts. He grunted and seemed to push her leg with all his might. This time she let him win, and she was rolled onto her back with a bang against the gurney. She was positive that if she wanted to, she could knock him to the floor without much effort. Why would they need a sex doll with enough strength to deck a security guard? I'm a thick called down to his buddy who was still recovering. Give me a hand with these restraints. Let's stretch her out nice and wide. Thick pulled out slowly and helped Long take all of the slack out of the restraints at Raven's feet, rotating her lengthwise on the gurney and pulling her ass just to the edge. Then her arms were pulled up and back so she was completely spread eagle. She hadn't realised just how loose they'd left the cuffs before. Come on, let's really hold her open, growled Thick, and he pushed her legs apart so far they fit over the sides of the gurney. Raven mewled, amazed at her flexibility. They heard it as a gasp of pain. Yeah, now she feels it. Tighten her arms a little more. I love what it does to her tits. Raven felt her arms pull even farther behind her head. But still she felt her new body take the punishment in stride. But they wanted to hear her yelp. So she gave a little scream of pain to give them what they wanted. Yeah, that's it. Fuck, she makes me hard. Thick stood at the front of the gurney, his purple cock dripping with anticipation. Raven looked down at her body. Her breasts pulled high from the tension in her arms and her legs wrenched open at 180 degrees. But her joints didn't complain. She bent her wrist and scratched experimentally at the restraint again. She could feel the leather shred easily under her touch. She could escape any time she wanted. She knew that for a fact now. She was faster than them, stronger than them, and heartier than them. But it was important that they feel in control, that she not give them a clue how capable she was, so she would give them a show to make them feel like big men. She meowed and struggled against her bonds, tugging against them. Thick smiled at her with an evil grin. 
kid. I think we need to up her dose a little more. Kitty is losing interest. Seconds later, Raven's thoughts started to be wiped clean as the vision of Thick's cock filled her consciousness. Damn, she had to remember the man with the levers in the back room next time. It was time to start making a good mental list to keep it all straight. All her strength would be worth nothing if... But she lost track of the thought as Thick rammed into her cunt, making her whole again. Maya stared out the one-way mirror at the orgy, which was finally winding down. The lab geek dutifully passed out tissues and emailed in an order to have the furniture cleaned, thoroughly. Most of the people in the control room were studiously avoiding eye contact, still slightly disbelieving what they had experienced, but Myers was unfazed. He was nodding to himself, his unzipped fly ignored. We've proven the effectiveness of our neural controls. Congratulations, Jenkins. Next we need to test her fighting ability. Sir, interjected Jenkins. The subject is still undergoing rapid changes and needs a period of reduced exertion to ensure lack of damage. Meaning what exactly? asked Myers through gritted teeth. She needs to eat and sleep, sir. Myers sighed. Very well. He turned and looked sharply at Lana, who was still reeling from her own self-induced climax minutes ago. She shook her head and tried to focus on his words. Bob, it's time we arranged a get-together with Mr Barnes. Tomorrow morning. Cameron related the story of Raven's capture to Wayne as they raced his motorcycle in the fading light. It was difficult to have a conversation over the noise of the bike, but Wayne seemed to get the picture. Raven was gone, kidnapped by the same people that had tried to kill Cameron. He had to be careful what he told Wayne. His joints still ached from nearly getting pulled out of their sockets by Wayne's steel ropes the same ropes he knew were coiled under Wayne's jacket. Explaining that he was a werewolf was out of the question. Wayne was still getting used to his appearance as Cameron instead of Brandon. He'd had to compound his lies by claiming that the fire was a second assassination attempt against him, not just a freak accident, and Wayne was buying it. He felt bad for lying to Wayne about Benedict's death, but Wayne had come close to strangling him. Nothing could bring Benedict back but they could still rescue Raven. Wayne asked where they were going, and Cameron said they were heading for the not-so-safe house he'd abandoned after being attacked there. Are you mental? Wayne yelled over the din. It's not safe. They already know about it. They could be there right now. Exactly, Cameron said, trying to keep his voice level in the hopes that Wayne would calm down. They don't want Raven, they want me. He paused. Do you hear something ringing? As Cameron pulled over down the street from the house, he could hear what sounded like a cell phone. It's not my ringtone, said Wayne, who pulled out his phone and looked at it anyway. The noise seemed to be coming from the bike, from inside the small storage compartment in the seat. He opened it up and sure enough there was a small, cheap-looking phone inside. The ringing stopped. He looked at Wayne. I thought you didn't have a phone. Wayne said. I don't own a motorcycle either. They must have planted it. They'll call back. Cameron pocketed the phone. I hope. You've got it all worked out, huh? Said Wayne. This is so fucked. They approached the house cautiously, but there was no one around that they could see. They entered through the still broken back door. The smell of garbage was much worse than when Cameron had last been here. They had to hold their noses as they made their way into the kitchen. It looked like nothing had changed since Cameron's encounter with Lana. They walked around collecting the stray knives that were still embedded in various surfaces. Having something to do seemed to help Wayne stay calm. They sat down in the dining room and closed the door to block the stench in the kitchen. As darkness fell outside, Cameron flicked the light switch on, but nothing happened. The power had finally been cut. He knew where to find matches and candles, though, and lit some before it got too dark. So, Cameron, what are you going to do when they call? Wayne asked. See what they want. There's always a demand, right? Wayne nodded. And your theory is they want you for her? Right. Then what? What do you mean, then what? I'll do it. Cameron didn't really care what they wanted. 
It was his fault Raven was in trouble and he doubted they could hold him for long. He could defend himself from them much better than she could. Okay, fine. So let's suppose they have you pass each other on a bridge. A bridge? Never mind. What are you going to do, let them kill you? I can take them, Cameron said. Wayne, not knowing what Cameron was capable of, gave him some major side-eye. Wrong, said Wayne. You did beat one assassin somehow. You think they're gonna send just one again? How about five? How about those guys with guns? I don't care, yelled Cameron, and he smacked one of the candles off the table. Wayne followed where it rolled to the wall and made sure it didn't set the house on fire. You can't take them alone, but, he said, stomping his foot on the small flame in punctuation. We can. What, both of us? Wayne shook his head. No, all three of us. Who? Us and my girlfriend, Sarah. She was being trained by Benedict, too. She can help. Cameron winced. Sarah, the girl he'd fucked in the restaurant the first night he'd turned. Who knew what he looked like as Cameron? Who knew he was a werewolf? If she got involved, it wouldn't be long until he'd find a metal coil wrapped around his neck. Um, I really don't think that's a good idea. Wayne smiled. That's okay, I texted her a few minutes ago. She'll be here soon. She lives close by, actually. What? yelled Cameron. Man, what's your problem? You need all the help you can get. She... I... The lies had piled up too quickly, and Cameron couldn't make up a good excuse fast enough. Cameron took me on a date and it didn't end well, said Sarah, choosing this moment to enter the room. Wayne nearly jumped out of his shoes when she spoke. She looked over at Cameron with a look of pure evil joy. Hello, Cameron. You don't look dead at all. Sarah was dressed for badassery. She had on her leather jacket and jeans that looked so starched. Cameron was surprised she could bend her knees to walk. Her face had adopted a more serious shade since he last saw her. She didn't look like a girl who couldn't stop giggling. You know him? Dead? What are you talking about? Wayne looked back and forth at Cameron and Sarah. You may remember hearing that Cameron Barnes was killed a month ago by a cougar, she said, making big, exaggerated air quotes as she circled slowly around Cameron. Don't you remember, Wayne? Right, the candlelight for Gil. I remember that. That was for him. Wayne started hyperventilating. Nope, said Sarah, and now she chuckled to herself, but it was unsettling. It wasn't for him, it was because of him. Wayne looked blank. You know he's a werewolf, right? No, not like that's an important detail or anything, for fuck's sake, Wayne yelled and stormed out of the room. Sarah glared back at Cameron. You didn't tell him? Cameron shrugged. Sarah groaned. You really are an asshole, Cameron. There isn't any water here. Wayne's voice came from the kitchen. He kicked the door open, letting them all smell the trash Cameron had left rotting in the garbage bags. Can we please get out of this shithole? Oh, sweetie, said Sarah, giving Wayne a big hug. Cameron couldn't help but watch as she squashed her breasts against him. Wayne definitely noticed it too, and visibly relaxed. She had his number, that was for sure. We can go to my house. Daddy's away on business and Mom doesn't mind. You sure? said Wayne, not pushing her away. Sarah released him. I'll tell her we're doing Bible study. That usually works. She'll be zonked out in her bedroom anyway. Come on, let's go. Wayne threw a glance at Cameron. If you say so, Cameron said. They walked the short distance to Sarah's house, Cameron pushing the bike behind the other two. They were deep in cutesy couple whisper mode, and the topic was most definitely him. If he had to guess, it sounded like Wayne was relaying Cameron's tale as he knew it. Finally, Wayne raised his voice a little so he could hear. So you trust him? Wayne asked, jabbing a thumb in Cameron's direction. Not really, she said. Wayne turned and gave Cameron a look up and down. So you're a werewolf? Yup. Which means you eat people? Used to. Uh-huh. And assassins are after you. Why again? 
Maybe I ate someone important? Cameron mumbled. Wayne looked a little sick. It's okay, Cameron continued. I won't eat you. It didn't help. And you went out with my girlfriend? Once. Wayne looked from Cameron to Sarah and back again. Any more I should know about that? Nope. Nope, added Sarah, too forcefully, and quickly changed the subject. You guys wait here, and I'll explain that I'm having friends over for Bible study. If she asks what we're working on, just say, Corinthians. As it happened, Sarah's mother didn't even come to the door. Sarah went upstairs to check on her and reported that she was fine. She explained that Mrs Myers had slipped on an icy patcher the previous year and now spent most evenings relaxing with her prescriptions and reruns of Law and Order, SVU. Her frank explanation silenced any jokes the two boys might have made. She led them to the finished basement, which was kept far less immaculately than the rest of the house. Every piece of slightly broken but still functional furniture that should have been discarded had found its way down there instead. A large L-shaped leather couch, which looked like it had been all white at some point in the distant past, dominated the space and was pointed at a TV on one wall and a dartboard on the other. Sarah explained that normally the basement was absolutely off-limits to her and was reserved for her dad and his drinking buddies to watch football. Cameron sat on one wing of the couch and Wayne and Sarah sat on the other, Wayne's arm wrapped protectively around her. There was an uncomfortable silence. To everyone's relief, the bleeping of the cheap cell phone broke it. Cameron stared at it for a second, then answered, Hello? Mr Barnes, said a voice on the other end, rendered nearly unintelligible with some sort of vocal disguising effect. Cameron listened intently and wrote an address on the dart scoreboard. It's the loading dock for some supermarket. I'm supposed to be there at eight, alone, and they'll bring her. He sat back down and stared at the scoreboard. I'm sorry that I left some things out, but I am getting Raven back with or without you. You're right, they're probably too much for me. This is obviously a trap. Sarah, this is probably way too dangerous for you. You don't deserve to get involved. Wayne, will you help me or not? I can't trust you, Cameron. Wayne glared at him. Cameron looked at him sadly. He had no choice but to convince him magically. Wayne, I didn't want to do this, but... Wayne's eyes went wide as Cameron brought his hand back to smack him in the face. The contact would be enough. Hold him! Sarah yelled and jumped back. Wayne ducked Cameron's swing and made a quick hand motion. The steel cables at his belt whipped into action and wrapped around Cameron's arms, then chest, pulling his whole body backwards onto the couch. Do you always do what she tells you? spat Cameron. Don't touch him! hissed Sarah. Wayne looked like he'd seen enough. Like I said, Cameron, I can't trust you. So no, I won't help you. But if you show some self-control and can be honest for 30 seconds, I will let you help us. It's me they want, dumb fuck. I have to go. Go and do what? Sarah said, moving closer to her boyfriend. Turn into a werewolf and claw people to death? You'll get shot before you even get close. Cameron stewed and tested his bonds trying not to cry out when the metal strands pinched his skin. Wayne studied him. Sarah, what happened just now? If he touches you, you'll do whatever he says. And how do you know that? Wayne asked. She fumbled for a moment and realised it was too late to make up a story. I thought so. Sarah, you used to be scared to death of the cougar, and now you invite him into your house. You know who he is. You know his real name. He turned back to Cameron. And what is this you don't deserve crap? You know what I think? I think you two... Returning Wayne's gaze, she pointed at Cameron. Oh, you think I'm cheating with him? Yes, Wayne spat. And you, she said, turning to Cameron. Think I'll get hurt if I try to help. And you think he'll flake out, right? Pretty much, he said. I really wish I didn't have to be a mommy to you little boys, but we have to get this shit out of the way if we're going to help Raven and get those motherfuckers who killed Benedict. Cameron and I went out one time, isn't that right? Yes. Once, he said. 
sounding maybe a little too emphatic, even though it was true. And we've never seen each other since then, right? Yes, right. She looked back at Wayne. Cameron and I did have sex, but... She held his gaze steady. It's not going to happen again, okay? Can you believe me? So there. And you're not worried he's going to eat you for dinner? Cameron sighed, knowing he should answer. My werewolfism came from a bad potion, but I found a way I don't have to hunt. Wayne waited for him to finish the thought. If I get hungry, I just have to get laid. Then I'm fine. Wayne rolled his eyes. So are you hungry? He looked back at Sara. What if he tells you to... Did he tell you to? He never told me to, said Sara, choosing her words carefully. He wasn't a werewolf yet, and I... Wanted it at the time. But Cameron's a little stupid. Wayne couldn't help cracking a smile. That's saying something. She returned an infectious grin of her own. Cameron, you wonder how I can help, right? He nodded. Well, old Ben has been teaching. Had been teaching. Me the art of projection and illusion. Mostly as it relates to personal appearance. For taking better selfies? Cameron snorted. Sarah didn't take the bait. Wayne says you've seen these guys who look like FBI. Sunglasses and suits. You know how easy that would be to copy. I could blend right in, keep an eye on you, and with Wayne's rope tricks we could handle anybody. Are you any good? Cameron challenged. Wayne couldn't resist boasting for his girlfriend. She hasn't worn actual clothing for a week. Sarah smacked him playfully. Wayne! Cameron stared at her, now barely able to discern an odd shimmer in the shine of her jacket and realising why her jeans looked so stiff. But if he hadn't looked for it, he never would have seen it. Don't you get cold? he asked. Sarah scoffed. That's easy stuff. You should ask me how I do voices. Stop staring. You're worse than Wayne. Cameron forced himself to look at her eyes. Okay, that's pretty good. Bro, you have no idea, added Wayne, earning himself another smack. Sarah looked at them with not quite as much disapproval as she wanted to convey. So, Cameron said finally, what's the plan? Sarah began. I think I have an idea. These guys have guns, and tough guys, but they have no idea what we have. If you boys can restrain yourselves for just a moment. Wayne, very funny. If we can keep calm and cautious. She paused, deep in thought. Hold on, was old Ben just running magic hookup service? I was a long time before the laughter died down and they got back to business. Lana watched the loading dock through her binoculars from the roof of the shuttered grocery store. She'd gotten there an hour early, just in case Mr Barnes tried to set up anything funny. There were no neighbouring stores, no one around. The only sign of use was skid marks from kids doing donuts in the huge empty lot. Just before eight, she heard a distant buzzing and saw a motorcycle approaching. She clicked her walkie. Check in, boys, here he comes. Bob one in position. Bob two in position. There was a pause. Bob three? She asked. Bob three in position, sir. Sorry, sir. Get your shit together, Bob three. Over. Lana saw the boy dismount by a dumpster, leaning the bike roughly against it. She missed that bike and couldn't wait to have it back. He looked around nervously. Send in the van, she radioed. A large unmarked black van approached the loading dock, keeping well away from Mr Barnes. The side door slid open and two bobs were visible, holding the arms of a girl with a bag over her head. Lana wondered who they'd gotten for the role. She had the right build. Cameron took a step back, then approached the van slowly. The bobs helped the girl down onto the ground and then pushed her forward, yelling something. She stumbled a few steps and then fell roughly onto her knees, hunched over. She was pretty good. Cameron approached her cautiously and knelt down, reaching to lift the bag. Quick as lightning, the girl brought her hands around, not tied at all. She jabbed him in the back with two auto-injectors. He yelped and underwent a rapid transformation. 
claws extending from his fingers, tearing the girl's throat to ribbons in an explosion of blood, then grabbing at his back trying to remove syringes that weren't there. His movements slowed even as his transformation completed and he collapsed. Thank God they got the dosage right. The bobs dragged him to the van, tied him thoroughly and rolled him in. They also collected the girl's remains and did a quick bleach job on the blood. Shame about that, but she'd accomplished her mission. They piled in the van and drove casually off. Good work, boys, Lana said. Beer's on me. Raven was conscious again, once again not remembering when she'd fallen asleep. Her tongue went to her teeth, hoping not to find the sharp predator's points. But she had not awoken from her living nightmare. Her tongue found a bit of food from earlier, triggering her memory. After her tryst with the men in black, she'd been rewarded with a large meal. The creepy, quiet men in lab coats laid out a range of options, unsure what this creature would want to eat. Well done hamburger, raw meat on the bone, a nicely prepared vegetable dish, even cat kibble. Even though she'd been vegetarian since her last birthday, her cat-like instincts drove her straight for the meat. She had ripped most of the raw meat off the bone before her human side stopped herself, disgusted. After failing to convince herself to eat salad, she reached a compromise on the burger. She played the good kitty, not hissing or scratching at all. She must have fallen asleep in a food coma soon afterwards, or more likely they'd drugged her. Now she was awake again, her eyes as wide as they would go, staring at the door where she'd heard the slightest noise. Sure enough, the door was opening again. Whoever was entering probably wasn't supposed to be here. Their movements were delicate and surreptitious. Maybe this was the chance for escape she'd been hoping for. The dim red light came on and Raven could see the wide frame of one of the men in black. It was thick. Back for more, maybe? Kitty is awake, he said in a low voice. Raven felt a hiss rising in her throat and beat it down. She needed to be a good cat until the last possible second. My partner is pretty good with the computers, and he knows which buttons to press. I've never wanted to fuck again so soon after coming in my life. Raven recoiled involuntarily, pulling against her restraints. The man just smiled patiently. And then Raven felt a shiver deep inside and a powerful wallop of need that caused a moan to escape her lips unbidden. Whoever was working the controls had none of the gradual experimental subtlety the kid had. This was getting turned on like a dildo set to earthquake. Now she tugged at her restraints in the other direction, reaching for the man whose pre-cum she could smell through his clothes. Thick wasted no time freeing himself and Raven squirmed around in an impossible position to get his dick in her mouth. She reached for him but the restraints kept her hands too tight. Past Thick. Raven could see Long enter the room as well, shedding his clothes methodically. Raven paused briefly. She realised she was getting that feeling again, that she was drifting back down into her body, slowly regaining control of herself. She waited, expecting to get Yanked out of herself again, but it didn't happen. A minute per said as she focused on giving Thick a good blow as Long approached the gurney and tested her wet pussy with his fingers. She was still in control. The kid must have forgotten to tell them something. Something about the control effect wearing off and needing to be reinforced. She pulled her mouth off of Thick's cock and deftly slashed one of her cuffs. The men were far too distracted to notice. She gave Thick a big, wide smile, full of sharp teeth. The soft tones of his alarm woke Jenkins up seemingly as soon as his head hit the pillow. But the clock read 4 a.m. as it should. It had been like trying to go to bed on Christmas Eve, too much excitement to fall asleep properly. Part of his excitement was because of the incredible success of the subject's transformation and subsequent performance, of course, and the other part was eagerness at what he'd done for himself once he was off duty. He glanced at the injectors on his nightstand, one empty, one still full. The empty one because he finally trusted his nanotech enough to inject himself last night, the full one because it was always good to have a fallback plan. He hadn't done anything drastic, nothing like the full rewrite the subject had gotten. Just a near total fat to muscle conversion, a boost to the obvious part of his anatomy and a few other tweaks. 
He reached under the covers down to his crotch and gripped his new cock. The mass of coiled flesh definitely felt like success. And given the early alarm, he had at least an hour to go to the lab and give it a test drive. With top system administrator access, sneaking around the base was easy. His new, taller body didn't steer quite right and he bumped into more than a couple door frames. Jenkins didn't even bother to cover his tracks. The person who'd be checking for unauthorised accesses was him. He walked through the dark hallways to the lab knowing all the turns from memory. The door to the control booth beeped and opened smoothly. He slowed down when he noticed the glow of light from the control workstation. He was sure he'd turned it off last night. Jenkins quickly looked around for any other disturbances. His chair was shoved aside instead of tucked in neatly under the desk. Someone had been in here. He sat down carefully, his new bulk overfilling the seat, and looked at the screen, not wanting to touch anything. Two windows were up. One was a command window, the type he'd used to activate the various modes and settings in the subject. The other was a command history showing everything he'd typed in over the past day. He looked back at the command window, at the last command someone else had typed in. He reached over to the wall and pressed the button that switched the one-way mirror from opaque to transparent. Jenkins felt his stomach drop as the dim light illuminated a scene of horror rendered in bright slashes of blood. Trying to breathe deeply and not think about exactly what he was looking at, he was pretty sure there were only two bodies in the room, both of them bobs. There was nothing to be done for them. He dropped the lights back down and flipped the window off. He eyed the emergency alarm button on the wall but hesitated. He could call in the cavalry and let the bobs save the day, and maybe he'd be commended for raising the alarm. But what if he stopped the subject himself? It would still be at least an hour before the base woke up and the lights came on. If he could bring her in before that, the old man would see how valuable he was. He'd probably get a raise. Nah, forget that. He'd ask for his own cat girl. The taste of blood was energising, electrifying, edifying, appetising. She shook her head, unable to think clearly. Part of her was horrified by what she'd done, but she was overwhelmed by something deeper that was revelling, ecstatic at realising the peak of millions of years of evolution. A hunter incarnate, a killer instinct unleashed. Slinking through the hallways, sniffing the air for the scent of fresh meat, ears pricked for the slightest sound. It was too easy, though. These men were so noisy, so smelly, and so slow. When she pounced from around a corner, she'd already ripped out a throat before its owner realised anything was amiss. She crouched in the hallway afterward, reflexively using her tongue to clean a streak of blood that had splashed on her. Even if the prey here were dumb, it was no good to allow oneself to become dirtied by them. Yes, they were dumb, but that doesn't mean they couldn't be fun. She twisted around, checking to see that she was spotless again. Next time she'd play a little with her food first. Jenkins looked at his phone. The tracking app he used was still a prototype, a planned part of a much later stage of testing. It could only give him a direction to the subject, no distance information yet. All he had to do was get close enough and then the other prototype app would activate. The indicator was fluctuating rapidly, but not randomly. Given his superior technical ability, he was confident it was working correctly. The movement was a product of the subject wandering the halls aimlessly. He rounded a corner and tripped, catching himself before he fell. He was getting used to his new size. He looked back at another bob, a pool of blood soaking into the cheap carpet. It was still early, and most personnel would be asleep for a little longer. But if the girl kept killing the third shift, someone else was liable to set off the alarm before Jenkins could get her. He increased his pace. Eventually the indicator calmed down and Jenkins had a good idea where he was headed. He rounded a corner and saw the closed double doors to the cafeteria. The arrow pointed dead ahead. And since the cafeteria was in the corner of the building, the subject was definitely in there. He just hoped his phone had enough Rangi to see her on the other side of the door. Jenkins carefully approached the door and was rewarded with a soft vibration from his phone. His second prototype app, the remote control, had a lock. Everything he'd worked so hard for was about to pay off. He pushed the bodily control button and waited for the app to confirm receipt of the command. It pinged, 
and he pushed the doors open. It took Jenkins a minute to locate the subject in the dim light. It was slumped in a corner, the black fur of its body making the shadows around it somehow deeper. Without looking away, he tapped one light switch in the row and waited as a few of the overheats flicked on. She. It was difficult to maintain objectivity when presented with those compact but undeniable curves. Was mesmerising, like a dancer in peak condition. Her coat was spotless and glistened slightly. Her limbs were still, but her eyes were scared and alert, and she was breathing rapidly. Jenkins brought up the mental control panel on his phone and dialed her terror slowly down. Her breathing slowed. He watched the levels carefully, and could see how they slowly drifted back toward baseline. He showed the phone to her. Those morons thought they could just turn you on and have fun, he explained. You kept getting stronger against it until you were able to break away. A blood-chilling growl emerged from the creature's throat. Jenkins smiled. But I know better. He tapped a button and watched the values spring back to their previous control levels. Ten seconds later, it pinged again automatically. See? Ten second boosts means no more feeding time for Kitty. He tapped a few more buttons and disabled the growling noise. He dialed her docility up and reduced the hold on her limbs a bit. He checked the time once more. Mission accomplished, and enough for a quickie too. Well, nothing you'll sink your teeth into anyway. He increased her sex drive, not pushing it as far into overdrive as he'd done the previous night. She began to shift and squirm, still not able to move fully. He allowed her to vocalise again, and was rewarded with a desperate mewling. As he unbuckled his belt, the cat girl's eyes widened in anticipation. Dale Myers admired himself in the mirror, uniform crisp and not a drop of sweat on him, despite the hour-long workout in his quarters. There was lots to do today, but that was no excuse to skip the routine. He strode into the hallway just as the daytime lights turned on. Perfection, as usual. He went directly to the lab to check on his subject, to admire his handiwork up close. He hadn't had the opportunity yet. Greeted with the eviscerated corpses of his two top men, Myers clenched his jaw and prepared to execute the correct procedure for this circumstance. First, he walked into the booth and hit the alarm. Second, he radioed the retrieval party and notified them to double-time it back to base. Third, he radioed Jenkins, who was supposed to be there. The voice that answered sounded out of breath. Yes, uh, sir. Jenkins, we have a situation. Get your ass back to the lab. The subject has escaped and we have two men down. Why the fuck aren't you here? Sir, oh, I'm in the process of locating the subject and have the means to, ah, ah, ooh, subdue her, it. Jenkins, don't freelance. State your location. Yes, sir, I'm at... And the transmission cut out. Jenkins, repeat, did not copy. Gosh, I don't know what's wrong, sir, ah, uh, repeating currently. And again the voice cut off. Myers threw the radio against the wall, smashing it to pieces. He had a backup radio in his pocket for just such an occasion. Sarah tried to keep her breathing deep to match the posture of the other agents in the van. Projecting as a larger man was strenuous, not quite the cakewalk she'd said made it sound like the night before. If she should slip the slightest amount, she had no doubt they would shoot her without a second thought. Sarah also tried to ignore the body bag at her feet containing the girl who had given her life just to help kidnap Cameron. I am Bob Three, she thought, and tried to believe it. The Bobs were trying to look stoic, but they kept stealing glances at the wolf man tied with high-strength cabling, teeth bared behind the muzzle they'd put on him. When he'd awoken, he'd thrashed against his bonds, muscles bulging until the cable cut his skin and started to draw blood, but it held firm. The bob in charge, a woman, was probably the Lana assassin that Cameron had told them about. She was looking studiously relaxed. It looked like a posture she'd learned to affect. If everything had gone smoothly, Wayne would be following them from a ways back in his hand-me-down beater of a car. Her phone was running a mapping app, and so as long as they didn't lose signal, he'd know where they were going. There was a burst of static in Sarah's ear as the radio came to life. She wasn't used to decoding the static-filled sounds, so she could barely understand the words. Breach subject! 
Escape. All personnel. Double time. Years out. Had Raven escaped? Sarah prayed she would be all right. And what was that bit at the end? The other bobs sat up straighter and started fidgeting with their weapons. Sarah didn't need to double check. If there's one thing her crazy ex-military dad had taught her from an early age, it was proper weapon discipline. The driver gassed it. Fifteen minutes later, the van came to a halt and the bobs poured out of the back. A peek out the window revealed a bland office complex. For some reason, Sarah felt like she'd been there before. She tried to look useful by training her weapon on the wolfman while he was escorted out of the back. He was moving awkwardly since he was in leg irons and was hunched over. He practically had to roll out the back, and the bobs were all too happy to give him a kick to help him move. Two others casually hefted the body bag into a nearby dumpster, and Sarah tried not to flinch at the wet thump it made when it hit the bottom. The radio crackled again. Bobs 1 and 2, watch the perimeter. Bobs 3 and 4, you're on Myers. We need everyone else in the complex searching for the subject. The blood drained from Sarah's face and she froze. Did they know she had infiltrated? Was she supposed to sniff herself out? Hey, Bob 3, called one of the tough guys at the door to the complex. Sarah was afraid to react. He motioned at her. Come on, the old bastard's waiting. In a daze, she followed him in the door. She took a position behind the other Bob as he led her down narrow corridors. Narrow corridors with cheap carpeting and bad lighting. It was all so generic, but she knew where she was now. This was one of her dad's real estate holdings, a place he had dragged her to years ago because it was cheaper than finding a sitter. She was hyperventilating now. Myers on the radio must have meant her father. What did it mean that she was on him? That sounded like a protection command. Was he a Bob? No, then he'd have been Bob. So he must be highly ranked. But how high? They turned one last corner and Bob 4 opened an unmarked door. Inside was some sort of observation room, and at the back of the room stood her father. He looked comfortable in a way she wasn't used to seeing. He had the same ramrod posture, but the uniform he was wearing completed the image. There was no doubt in her mind that he was in charge here, which meant her daddy was in charge of the bobs and what they did. Her daddy had sent them on a mission to capture Cameron. Her daddy had sent some poor girl to her death. Her daddy had kidnapped Raven. Sarah used all her magical training and willpower to focus on maintaining her projection. It was like a mantra, and it was all that was holding her together. Her crazy, abusive Faither had tried to have them all killed, and she was supposed to make sure nobody killed him. About fucking time, Bobs, he barked. Escort me to Lana and the wolf boy, we have to start cleaning up this shit show. Yes, sir said both Bobs, and they went back into the halls. What the fuck is going on? asked Lana when they got back. Sarah kept her position near Myers, trying not to think. Everything has exceeded my expectations except the quality of the fucking security around here, Myers yelled, pacing back and forth. The subject escaped at roughly 0330 hours and has been on the loose mauling personnel. So far it's eliminated six, Fucking disaster, breathed Lana. Disaster my ass, cried Myers, and Sarah realised her dad wasn't scared, or angry, he was excited. It's offed four highly trained ex-military, and they didn't even draw their weapons. This is what I've been working for my whole career. Like all children, the subject just needs some direction. Once the kid gets it under control, we can set up a proper demonstration for our funders and get rich. I finally did it. Lana's jaw worked up and down a couple times before she changed the subject. And what about Wolfie over here? Sarah's father made a dismissive gesture. What do we need him for? Shoot him. We've already proven the subject's capabilities. Lana couldn't seem to help herself. At the cost of six lives. Myers scoffed. The subject is a handful. These fucking kids. At least I can say I finally met a girl more a fucking pain in the ass than my slut of a daughter. Sarah's father waved at her vaguely. Bob 3, 
Hurry up and shoot Teen Wolf over here and don't be a dumbass, make sure you use the silver bullets. Sarah's world crashed in on itself. She felt herself unholster the weapon, flicking the safety off just like dear old dad had taught her at the range. She looked up, trying to attain the full situational awareness he'd always talked about. How could she get away without killing Cameron? How could she let her father get away with this? She looked back down at her hand wrapped around the grip, the hunk of metal heavy in her hand, and noticed a loose piece of wire blowing in the wind. But not blowing, exactly. More like... snaking. Sarah Myers looked up, raised her weapon, and fired a round between Daddy's eyes. There was a crimson explosion, and Dale Myers's body crumpled in slow motion. The other bobs were raising their weapons, but at that moment, Wayne's metal rope snapped at all of them, a perfect symphony of gashed hands, dropping weapons, and then choking gasps as more wires wrapped around their necks. Sarah finally lost her mantra, and her disguise fell completely, revealing her body as she also fell to the ground, sobbing. Sarah! yelled Wayne as he ran from where he'd been hiding. He rushed to her, holding her tight as she curled into a shaking ball. He ignored the moaning noises from the men on the ground. Oh my God, Sarah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry it was him. He rocked with her. There was a sharp choking noise behind him, and Wayne turned to see Lana, somewhat bug-eyed, pointing at her mouth. Wayne reluctantly loosened the rope around her neck. She tried to suppress a gasp, but failed. I know y'all won't believe me, but thank you. Wayne glared at her. Okay. But if you want to save your friend in there, we gotta move. Why should we trust you? Don't. She threw her gun away. But I know my way round in there, and the kid just said he located the subject, your friend, in the cafeteria. You won't find her without me. Cameron, what do you think? The trust beast on the ground grunted and shrugged. Sarah slowly got up, her regular clothing reforming around her. She turned away from the thing on the ground that was once her father and looked at Lana. She's right, she said, wiping her eyes. We need her. You can start by untying Cameron, he won't bite. Lana grimaced and slowly moved to untie the wolf. Cameron growled just to fuck with her. And Wayne, you need to finish the job with them. She flicked a hand at the still gurgling bobs. Girl, are you sure you're... Raven needs us. You do it or I will. Wayne closed his eyes and metal scraped as the ropes tightened. There was a series of cracking noises, then silence, and he pulled the strands back to him. Lana strode confidently through the corridors to the cafeteria with Cameron, Sarah and Wayne following behind. Sarah had resumed projecting her bob costume, but they hadn't had time to dress Wayne up beyond looting a jacket and sunglasses from one of the dead men. Wayne had wrapped a short length of steel rope around Cameron's wrists, but it wasn't even tied. The other bobs they encountered shrank at the sight of the beast, and didn't even think to look more closely. Lana told them to hold their positions and await further instructions. They hoped they could pick up Raven and carry her out, telling the others that Myers had given them rendezvous coordinates. How long would it be until people noticed Myers was missing? What did you mean, subject? rumbled Cameron as they passed through an empty hall. Lana didn't turn to look at him. They've been experimenting on her. Like how? Kinda like what happened to you, actually. Finally, they approached the double doors of the cafeteria. Four other bobs were already there, waiting. Sit, Rep, prompted Lana. Jesus, fuck, that thing is big, breathed one of Bob's his face turning white seeing Cameron for the first time. Focus, Bob, yelled Lana. The Bob swallowed, then turned his attention away from Cameron. Jenkins says he has the situation under control, but refuses to allow anyone else to enter. What's that sound? Jenkins appears to be exerting himself. Somehow, we are not. Lana sighed. Oh, for fuck's sake. We four are going in, you'll maintain position. We're under strict orders. The towering beast let out a low, steady growl, and the bob shut up. Lana pulled the door open quietly and gave Cameron a shove. 
The interior of the windowless cafeteria was dim, with only a few of the ceiling fixtures illuminated. The smells of sweat and sex hit Cameron's keen nose immediately. The ruse forgotten, he threw the rope aside and bounded into the cafeteria, vaulting over tables and knocking chairs aside. Lana let out a curse. She hurried Sarah and Wayne into the room and then closed the door in the faces of the confused bobs. Cameron quickly found the man who must be Jenkins in the back of the large room, a hulking, roided-out exaggeration of a man butt-naked next to a table, his hips thrusting rapidly. A pair of jet-black furred legs hung limply off the edge of the table, rocking with his thrusts. Hearing the commotion, Jenkins tilted his head up, his beet-red face screwed up in concentration. I said I needed absolute privacy, he bellowed as he tried to get himself off. Cameron let out a roar. He grabbed Jenkins by the armpits and threw him aside, the man's penis lolling comically as he flew through the air. He landed with a crash on a neighbouring table, the combination of his bulk and airtime breaking the table in half. Something small and glowing flew even farther, crashing into a wall and making a cracking noise before clattering to the ground. Cameron turned back to the table as the rest of the group caught up to him. Wayne secured the door, Sarah was saying, but they called for backup. Oh my God, is that her? She joined Cameron at his side and put her arm around his back at least as far as she could reach. They both looked down at the creature on the table, the graceful feline body twisting gently as soft moans escaped its throat. Her legs were still spread lewdly and her nipples were visible poking through the soft walls on her breasts. She was fingering herself, still trying to reach climax now that the dick she'd been taking had been removed. Lana glanced at the creature and looked away. Yeah, that's her. Lana gave them the short version of Myers' dream of developing a super soldier using animal traits. Sarah and Cameron had trouble seeing anything of their friend in the creature before them. There was a groan from near the broken table, and Wayne gestured quickly, ropes whipping out and quickly trussing Jenkins up. And I guess that's Jenkins, though he was scrawnier last time I saw him. Ow! said the lump of muscles as the metal ropes tightened around him. I'm not the one you ought to be worried about. You idiots broke my phone. In about 15 seconds, that thing is going to go back to being a bloodthirsty killing machine. Cameron leapt onto the broken table, straddling the tech. He grabbed his neck, claw points digging in just a little. She's not the only one. Oh, you don't want to do that. I'm the only one that can cure her. Cameron's eyes narrowed. Talk, he growled. First you gotta tie her up. Her stats are going to revert to normal and normal has been ripping out throats all morning. Cameron nodded to Wayne. Wayne nodded back. Lucky I got rope for days, he said, and started guiding the ropes around the cat girl's wrists and ankles. Not too roughly, pulling her into a spread eagle position on the table. She mewled when the rope pulled her hand away from her snatch, her ass lifting in the air in search of stimulation. Oh man, that's hot, whispered Jenkins, and Cameron squeezed tighter, drawing a faint trickle of blood. Ow, 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 okay, sorry Jesus. I'm telling you, the process is reversible. How? roared Cameron. I tell you and you let me go. Do we have a deal? He choked out. I should rip off your dick for raping my girlfriend. Look, I was just beta testing and, and I got carried away, he stammered. Sarah exploded. What kind of fucking beta test? There was a slamming noisy from the cafeteria doors. Shit, said Lana. Kiddos, we are running out of time, we got her to go. The wolfman sighed, a subterranean rumble Jenkins felt in his gut. The tech gulped. Cameron let go and nodded to Wayne again. Okay, deal. How? Jenkins gasped for air and felt the small wounds on his neck. He coughed a few times. Fuck. Roll back serum. In my pants over there. You inject it, the nanobots perform a massive undo operation and roll back everything they did. We can only do it at all because I thought to store all of the changes in a distributed blockchain. There was another slam this time from the table where Raven was tied. She suddenly hissed, 
and then started making a whining yowl that got increasingly louder as she started to pull at her restraints. Wayne grunted from exertion. Shit, guys, she is really strong. I don't know how long I can hold this. Lana fished the injector out of Jenkins' discarded pants. Cameron eyed Jenkins. How do we know it won't kill her? Sarah looked at the injector in Lana's hand. What if we use some of it on him first? Lana waved the injector at Jenkins. Does she need all of this? Jenkins shook his head. It's just a set of encoded instructions. With less, it'll be slower to propagate, but it'll work. Anywhere works, but the neck is good. He helpfully tilted his head to the side. Lana and Sara briefly conferred and figured out how to dial the dose down. There was another slam at the cafeteria doors as one of the hinges started to give way. Raven had stopped struggling against her bonds, but was still emitting a pathetic yowl. And then you let me go, right? added Jenkins. Ya, 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 prick, said Lana, and she jabbed him with the injector right in the balls. Oh, fuck, you bitch, a key, groan it, Jenkins. They all stood around nervously waiting, hoping something would happen before the doors burst open. After a minute, Sarah emitted a short giggle squeak. Herm? inquired Cameron. Um, guys, said Wayne. His dick just got smaller. It works. Lana chuckled and approached the yowling cat girl. She injected her in the side, deciding that the neck was much too close to those razor-sharp teeth. The yellow-eyed feline hissed anew, and Lana backed quickly away. The look in her eyes was pure cornered predator. Wayne piped up again. Hey people, I've been looking and, uh... There was another slam, and one of the hinges gave way. What? Hun? asked Lana. Wayne gulped. That's the only door out of here. How are we going to take care of an entire troop of goons? Cameron thought back to the mall and made a woofing sound. Sarah cocked her head. Was that a laugh? The wolfman grinned widely, showing his teeth. I have a way to distract people. Sarah groaned. Cameron, are you thinking with your dick again? That would distract us too. And they'll do what I say, the wolfman shrugged. Lana looked at them nervously. That ain't gonna work. All the bobs got boosted with dampeners. I know how to really push it now. I bet I could overload the bots. Satin. And who are all those beefy men gonna distract themselves with, huh? Asked Sarah. Mray! Groaned the cat girl from the table. Lana leaned over the table and Raven looked at her with pleading eyes. There was a glint that hadn't been there a moment before. Give them all to Mia Ow, she breathed, a smile from ear to ear. Oh, Han, you're not yourself. Raven was breathing rapidly. Maybe, but all I can think about is all that dick. The control is wearing off and I still don't care. Sarah was looking pale. Or I just got an awful idea. Yeah? urged Wayne. I could project as my dad. These people are fanatics. Even if they just saw him get shot, they'll believe their eyes. And tell them what? Jews tell them the good guys won, said Lana. They stand down and we walk out of here. Fingers crossed. Wayne put his hand on Sarah's shoulder. We're out of time. Sarah, you can do it. Okay, I just need to concentrate. Sarah took Wayne's arm. Also, baby, what you've been doing today has been a total turn-on. Wayne could only spit out a what, as Lana broke in. Okay, places, y'all, we got to put on a lil show in the next 30 seconds. There were a few more loud slams and the door finally broke. Three bobs entered the cafeteria, guns raised, searching right and left for the intruders. The tableau that greeted them was entirely unexpected. At the back of the cafeteria, a space had been cleared around a single table. On it, the experimental subject had been tied, spread eagle. The lithe creature strained against her bonds, jet black fur glinting reflected light as if wet. The lead bob mentally chastised himself for the microsecond he paused, taking in the sight. To the side of the table, 
the hulking mass of the werewolf was perched precariously on a small cafeteria chair. Its arms were tied behind its back and its legs crossed awkwardly underneath it. The creature struggled against its bonds, the metal ropes clicking and creaking. Lana stood behind it with her hand on its shoulder as if she could restrain it. Standing in front of both of the fantastical creatures was none other than Dale Myers, looking no worse for wear. Sir? You're damn right, the man bellowed. Get your asses in here and stand down. The situation is totally under control. Lower those weapons, damn it. Some bobs complied, others hesitated. But I thought... I don't pay you to think, dumbass. I pay you to follow orders, and right now I don't think I'm getting what I pay for. Lana snorted. Laying it on a little thick, sir, she said under her breath. Bullpucky, Myers yelled at her. He gestured to the men. Get everyone else in here, stat. Pronto, you have a job to do. Come on, get in here. Gather round. Anyone missing? We need everyone here. In moments, nearly 20 men had formed rings around the table at the back of the cafeteria. They muttered at each other, confused. Silence, yelled Sarah as Dale. The situation has been neutralised, men. It's over. We've captured the interlopers and we have control of the subject. Stand down and look happy, idiots. There was a pause, and then in the back, someone let out a breath that sounded like it had been held all morning. There was some murmuring and chuckling, and a couple high fives from the less stoic bobs. The bob in front narrowed his eyes. Sir, what's today's one-time password? Dale Meyer's mouth hung open just a little too long. The bob raised his weapon and pointed it at the image of his commanding officer. There was a gasp. Someone hissed. Bob, what the fuck are you doing? Two other bobs raised their weapons and pointed them at the lead bob. In his mind, Cameron visualised his pet wolf and the pendant around its neck that kept his magical attraction reined in. He reached around its head and removed the pendant. He pushed. Dale Myers let out a grunt. Sara didn't have any protection against Cameron's spell. The bob's expression didn't change. Cameron exchanged a glance with Lana, but she shook her head. Myers smiled, his eyes glassy. Are you questioning my command, son? Sir, I will shoot you dead if you can't recite the password. Those are your standing orders. Cameron closed his eyes. He gave his pet dog a mental pat on the head and broadcast his infectious sexual arousal through the room as hard as he could. It felt like pushing against a flexible membrane. He could feel the resistance from the nanobots in the bobs in the room. Then all at once he felt it pop, and his power crashed over them like a wave. There was a sound like everyone catching their breath at the same time. Cameron's cock immediately pulsed to life, and he felt suddenly compelled to glance around the room for something to fuck. Lana let out a gasp and visibly swooned. A bead of sweat broke out on the lead Bob's face. Sara clenched hard to maintain her projection, and looked at the men she was commanding. They were trying to keep their composure, but several had their hands jammed in their pockets, making room for their dicks to harden. She found this idea irresistible, and caught herself checking out whose tent was biggest. If she didn't end this now, she'd drop her illusion and jump on the nearest dick. The figure of Dale Myers walked right up to the bob, letting the barrel of the weapon push into his chest. Shoot me and you'll die in a hail of bullets before I hit the floor. Or you can march over to that table and fuck the sexiest creature the earth has ever seen. Mmm, that goes for all of you, moaned Raven from the table. The bob's eyes flickered to the table behind Sara and she knew she'd won. The... Password. He mumbled. But he was already moving toward the table. Sara pushed the barrel down and took the weapon from the man's docile hands. Around the room, guns lowered and cocks raised. She stepped aside and let the lead bob past. She watched as the men ignored their leader, their gaze now solidly locked onto the twisting form of the cat girl on the table. Any remaining confusion in the room had made way for unbridled lust. Not a second later, Sara ran to where Wayne was standing out of the light. 
She let the image of her father flicker out and pulled Wayne into a deep kiss, tears running down her face. You okay? He asked. Shut up and fuck me, she said, and was relieved to find when she clawed at his pants that he was as hard as she was wet. The lead bob approached the table, cock out. The cat girl arched her back, her small tits pushing at the air, seeking to be licked, touched, grabbed, smacked. Her pussy was positively sopping and a pool of liquid had formed at the front of the table. Other brave men soon joined him. None of them had bothered to remove their jackets. The onset of desire had been too sudden. They surrounded the table, hands reaching out to stroke the fur of the sensuous beast before them. They felt her arms, squeezed her tits. One even pet her under the chin. He was rewarded with a motoring purr. The lucky man at the front of the table wasted no more time and reached under the creature's ass to pull her to the edge of the table. He stroked the head of his dick up and down her slit a few times. Pleased at the amount of lubrication, he leaned into her with one easy stroker. The men were rewarded with more purring. Oh, fuck, said the one playing with her tits. Her whole body vibrates when she does that. One of the bobs, a skinny man with a surprisingly large dick, climbed on the table and kneeled about the cat girl's snout. She opened her mouth wide, making a show of holding her lips over her teeth. Good kitty, he said, and aimed his cock down her throat. Back at the front of the table, the first man groaned, letting loose deep in the creature's cunt. He held onto her ass tightly, then relaxed. He pulled his dick out, still hard, and a small amount of cum oozed out after. The next bob stood behind him, stroking his dick and ready for sloppy seconds. He unceremoniously shoved the first bob out of the way, and rammed his dick into Raven's cunt right up to the hilt. Cameron was painfully hard. Lana just stood there mesmerised as Raven got fucked. Her hand was squeezing his shoulder. Cameron emitted a low growl, and Lana finally looked over at him. With her standing and him sitting down, they were the same height. She shook her head. Kid, I don't know if it's just your talent talking, but I do declare I've missed that dick. She reached over and gave his shaft as much of a squeeze as she could with one hand. She couldn't even reach all the way around. Tied up as he was, there wasn't anything Cameron could do but try not to come yet. His own head was buzzing, overloaded with lust. Lana knelt in front of him, admiring the veined, spear-like shape of his length. She tilted her head between his knees and opened wide, taking one of the large furry balls in her mouth. Exhaling, she ran the whole of her tongue up his entire length, groaning with satisfaction the whole way. Cameron let out a pathetic whine. Lana couldn't help but laugh. You're right, she said, hands working fast at her belt. I'm being a tease. She finished stripping off her pants and spun around. She inhaled sharply as she lined herself up with the tip the spear. Wayne grunted and pumped cum into Sarah, who moaned appreciatively. He thought maybe it was too soon but as he pulled out, he was still hard and still wanted to fuck. He glanced over his shoulder at the crowd of thugs. He didn't think they had noticed that their leader had turned into a high school girl, or that their lab tech was bound and gagged in a dark corner. They were thoroughly ignoring everything except the insatiable creature in front of them. He grabbed his still hard dick and looked back to Sara. She nodded, her eyes pleading. Yes! And, oh, she exclaimed as he got right back into it. And, he asked, pausing, and do you have any more rope? Wayne grinned. Raven was pretty sure she could feel something. Well, given that she had one cock in each hand, a rather small one down her throat, and one spasming in her pussy, she could definitely feel a lot of things. And she could feel the cum oozing out of her and onto the table, as well as dripping on her tits, face and everywhere, but she was pretty sure she felt a tingling, pins and needless sensation along with that. An agent who had never removed his sunglasses lined himself up and plunged into her completely sloppy pussy, cum squirting out the sides from her already full cunt. Raven was sure she'd had one round from this guy already. Two had collapsed on the floor, fucked right into unconsciousness. She beamed with pride at this. She hoped the pins and needles meant the serum had worked and she was returning to normal. 
Ah, normal. What would that even be like after this? She felt the sunglasses man spasm inside her again and put thoughts of after aside for now. For now, the dick in her throat had been removed and the one that replaced it looked like much more of a challenge. She silently thanked Jenkins for the lack of gag reflex in this body, smacked her lips and opened wide. Cameron sat still and let Lana do all the work. She was sitting on his lap, leaning back on him with all her weight, but he barely felt a thing. She was trying to bounce her ass on his entire length, but she couldn't get that much extension with her legs. Cameron wanted to reach around and squeeze her tits, but he was still tied up. He would have to have a word with Wayne about how much realism had been necessary for their ruse. He tested the bonds. My goodness, y'all ought to be in my stomach. She inhaled as she lowered herself down. But here I am. She looked down at his balls, jammed right up against her lips. Just one of my charms, growled Cameron. She ground back and forth against him, feeling him rigid inside her. One of the veins on his cock was right against her clit, and it was perfect. Lana sighed. Wolfie, you can take me any day of the week. Something tripped inside Cameron that gave him the strength he needed to rip his bonds apart. His left arm snapped out wide and wrapped around Lana's body, holding her tight. Oh! she cried. She grabbed at the furred arm suddenly around her body but was unable to move it. The werewolf stood up to his full height with Lana still on his dick, then flipped himself and his mate forward and down on his knees and his free hand, careful not to break her in the process. The beast pressed his weight down, surrounding Lana completely and giving her no place to go. A bob not ten feet away felt the floor shake from the impact, but he was focused on the way the cat girl could twist herself around to suck a dick while still getting fucked. What... what are your... The werewolf nuzzled her neck. He moved his snout right up to her ear and breathed hotly on it to get her to be quiet. She got the message. Are you saying you want to be mine? He rumbled. He flexed his dick, still buried in her. The woman was shaking with fear, but the wolf's nose knew there was something else there that was stronger. She nodded quickly. You know you can't be my alpha, he said. She nodded again. Say it. Lana gulped and then reached up to move her hair aside, exposing her neck. Make me your bitch, she said. The werewolf roared deafeningly in her ear. He withdrew his cock until only the head was inside her pussy and then opened his jaws wide. He clamped down on her neck, just hard enough to draw blood. Lana held her breath. The werewolf rammed forward with one stroke, instantly triggering her orgasm and his own. As Lana cried out, Cameron held fast to her neck and felt a completely new sensation. It was like he was getting hard again, even though he was already rock solid and just at the base of his dick. He released Lana's neck and woofed a laugh or two as he realised what was happening. Jesus fuck, what is that? Lana gasped. I can't move. Cameron allowed himself to drool on his bitch's back, watching the spit puddle there. We're going to be here for a while. I just gave you my first knot. Wayne kept stealing glances at the rest of the cafeteria as he worked. Baby, how many times do I have to tell you my tits are down there? Sarah nodded downward, unable to do much more than that since he'd trussed her up, her arms behind her back and her ankles tied to her wrists. And Wayne refocused his attention where it belonged and wiggled a pinky. The rope system adjusted, some lengths tightening and others loosening. The complex movements caused Sarah's tits to jut out even more and manoeuvre her left nipple directly against his waiting tongue. He licked upward, eliciting a moan of approval. Practice really did make perfect. Sorry, baby, I just... He caught her look and stopped talking. He concentrated again, and the rope system lowered Sarah down to a more fuckable altitude. Wayne grasped his cock, rubbed it on her slit to get it wet, and gave her just the tip. Ow! Oh! She gasped. Wayne wrapped his arms fully around her, burying his face between her wonderful tits, slick with sweat from exertion and stress. He worked his cock in slowly, getting it slick and fucking her more deeply. He tilted his head slightly, 
and the rope system adjusted the position again. Much better. Oh, ah, God, Wayne, yes, that's the spot, oh God, babbled Sara. Wayne came up for air and looked into Sara's eyes, hesitating. Would you... is it... would it be offensive if... Sara smiled. You want me to project during sex, you little perv? She giggled, taking the sting out of the words. Like only if... Man up Wayne and ask me. Wayne thrust into his girlfriend's pussy and felt it get wetter, which made him even harder. Make them titties even bigger. I want to drown in there. Baby, one day we'll get you to be more creative. And she laughed. But it was getting hard to hear her because of the tit flesh pressing into his ears. Cameron, still locked inside Lana, surveyed the devastation. Half of the bobs had passed out, and the rest were looking worse for wear. Raven was still going strong with the few who were left standing. She took each cock with joy and received each new burst of cum with as much enthusiasm as the first. Her fur was matted and dripping from all of it. Turning to Wayne and Sara, he did a double take as he saw Wayne eagerly thrusting into a trussed up familiar looking redhead with huge tits and an old fashioned hairdo. Is that. he started. <clears throat> Lana craned her neck, forcing a drop of blood out of the small wound. Ha ha, it sure is, she laughed. Guess that's one way of keeping it fresh. Cameron felt a shift and the pressure in his dick eased. He slid out slightly. Ah. There it goes, sighed Lana. I was just getting used to that. Cameron grunted and licked her neck to clean up the dots of blood. There are still three bobs left to drop, bitch, he said, savouring the word. Uh... Oh, sighed Lana, and Cameron began to stroke leisurely in and out of her battered pussy. Raven surfaced into consciousness on the first soft mattress she'd felt in. How long? And itching like hell. She rubbed her arms, blinked, and looked at her hands. Human hands. Her first thought was it was such a sickly, pale colour. Her fingers had come away from itching her arms with clumps of black fur. She shook her hands to get rid of the stuff, disgusted, and peeled the sheet off of her. There was cat fur everywhere, all over her and under and around and clinging to the sheets. Some of it was loose, having fallen out without anywhere to go, but some clumps remained attached to her. She poked at these, simultaneously grossed out and completely fascinated. It came out easily. She brushed off as much as she could and threw it all on the floor. It didn't make much of a dent in the mess. As the itching subsided, Raven was surprised how good she felt otherwise. Shouldn't she be incredibly sore after? She felt a little embarrassed. She was crossing gangbang off her bucket list much sooner than she expected. It had been everything she'd hoped it could be, even if the memory was so close to. She looked at her hands, remembering the claws that had been there and what they had done. She didn't want to think about that quite yet. Then She looked over herself, checking to see if she was all back. Her face felt fine, what she could see looked fine, and she didn't have a tail anymore. Then again, she didn't used to be able to twist completely around to look at her own ass. She was now quite the contortionist. Raven heard feet bounding down a staircase and Cameron burst into view. Raven, you're up, he said with heart-melting relief and excitement. Uh, yeah, she mumbled, her voice sounding like herself again. You slept a full day, he said. Where am I? This is the house I've been crashing in for a while. We've been trying to clean up a bit. We? Sarah and Wayne, and Lana too. Cameron saw her reaction. Don't worry, she's cool now. Are you... okay? How much do you remember? Raven sighed. I'm okay, I guess. I don't want to think about it all, not just yet. Oh yeah, sure, cool. Do you want some clothes or something? She looked down at herself. Who cares, nothing you haven't seen. And I see you're still a hunk, she said. Uh, thanks. I'm also still a werewolf too, and will be. Ben is... was wrong about stuff. Are you like... stuck? Like that? Wasn't it getting worse? 
I'll be all right as long as I don't feed. So yeah, just stuck. Something he said clicked. What do you mean, was? She asked. Cameron's face fell. The store burned, the whole building. And Ben... He stopped, and there was no need for him to finish. Raven felt shitty at her failure to keep the conversation out the recent past. Cameron seemed to remember something. I do have something he gave me, though, a little book. He said something like how we could keep progressing. What's in it? I don't know, I didn't even look at it yet. Cameron reached in his jeans and pulled out the small notebook. The cover was bent, but it looked intact. He opened to the middle and squinted. I think it's an address book. There's some names and phone numbers, and then there's some names and weird symbols. Raven's mind raced. Ben's personal address book. Are those other wizards? Looks like it. There's like a hundred names in here at least. So there's more out there. Raven stared into space, imagining a world of secretive wizards and spells and possibilities. We knew there had to be, right? Well, maybe one of them can help you, dummy. Right, sure, nodded Cameron. If you want, she added. Of course. Who'd want to be stuck this way? He chuckled nervously. Getting hungry all the time, Raven continued. Right, so hungry. You just have to fuck someone every once in a while. What a pain. Raven tilted her head to the side. Had you forgotten about trying to find a cure? He shrugged. Well, I was thinking, why bother? It's been all upside. Raven punched him weakly in the arm. All upside your face. Who will you go after, more joggers? Nah, he said, trying to be casual. Like I said, Lana is cool now. This revelation brought Raven up short. She suddenly realised she was jealous. Just her? She asked. Like, I hope she never has a headache and you have to eat a hobo. Cameron looked dumbly thoughtful. Okay, maybe then I might go back to the park. But it could be easier, Raven said, but couldn't say the words. What? Oh, Cam, do you really not want me to? She screwed up her mouth. Cameron's mouth hung open, then snapped it shut. Yes, I do. But I thought you hated me. I dragged you into this and got you kidnapped. Raven sobbed once, then stopped herself. That's not your fault. And you shouldn't have tried to rescue me. It was a stupid idea. You got out pretty far on your own, Cameron added. Raven choked out a laugh and didn't let it turn into another sob. But Wayne and Sara came with you, even though you're a dumbass so maybe you're not so bad. And right now, what I want more than anything is not to think about the past couple days and just... But she was interrupted by Cameron kissing her, and she let the tears roll down her face for a moment. Do that? He asked softly. Raven wiped her face, getting more loose fur all over herself. She shook her head. No, I was going to say I want to just... Get fucked by the huge werewolf dick I've been denying I want. Not just because it's the distraction I need right now. Cameron turned red. But kissing is okay too, she added, and they did, again. Cameron broke away after a time. Uh, one thing. Not bragging, but part of my magic is that, uh, I always fit, even if it normally wouldn't. But you're immune to my charm, right? It could be kind of uncomfortable or worse. Raven smiled and opened her legs wide, even wider with her new flexibility. Cam, have I ever told you about my desire, I mean need, for fucking gigantic fucking dicks? His pants were off in seconds, and Raven leaned back as Cameron transformed as quickly as possible. The pale girl's eyes widened at the sight of the thick pink cock. It must have been twice the size of the last dildo she'd used. That one had been nice, but still not enough. As she tried to wrap her hands around her new toy's girth, she thought maybe this one would be able to satisfy her. The werewolf rumbled and pre dripped out of the tip. She lay back in her bed on the sheets she knew would need to be washed very soon, if only to get all the cat hair out. She gripped the cock with both hands, placing it at her entrance. 
It touched her folds and she felt an electric spark. It was so wide. Too wide, maybe. <clears throat> she rubbed the cock up and down on her slit, getting it wet. Cameron stood there passively, letting her lead, breathing deeply. Her nipples were stiff points in the cool basement air. Her eyes closed and her head tipped back, knowing that a beast owning this huge cock was ready to ravage her. Her jaw slackened and she let out a low moan. The girl pulled and the werewolf followed her lead, pushing into her. There was an intense stretching sensation as the head of the cock, slick with their juices, began to spread her lips wide. As he pushed the feeling only intensified, as if she would be stretched apart forever, as if it might tear her in half. And just as she thought the cock couldn't possibly fit, she would have to stop and pull it out. The head slipped in and her pussy lips clamped around it, trapping it inside. Her mouth formed something like a smile, but the constant buzz of pleasure from the giant cockhead in her cunt took control. She was already close. After a moment, the werewolf continued pushing its dick into her pussy and she felt as it pushed her from within. After every little bit, the beast pulled back out to the head and slid it back in again, fucking her slowly, pushing it deeper and deeper each time. But she didn't come yet. But she got wetter, slickening the cock even more, and now he could slide it in and out of her pussy, fucking her with long strokes. The strokes became shorter and faster, until the beast was pounding into her cunt, and she felt it fill her up, feeling every inch of it stretching her. The girl opened her eyes and saw herself with the giant cock pounding into her, seeing the creature that was attached to such a cock, how strong it was, and now she came, and so did he. She just let the feeling wash over her as her body shook and she let out a scream. He felt the cock spasming on and on, pulsing through her, the furry beast against her, jerking around as they both twitched and thrashed. And then it was over and the pulses faded, and he gently removed the cock from her pussy, straining to get the head out from her lips' grasp. Cum flowed out of her pussy. She breathed deeply, enjoying the afterglow. As even that subsided, she was joined in her bed by the massive, beautiful creature that loved her and whose thick pink dick was dripping with her cum.